friendly. I do not know why. Perhaps because they do not speak English very well. Yeah, more specs. Don't like anything that's different. <laughs> no, three deaths in one night aren't going to set very well with them either, I'm afraid. I'll say it won't. They'll be buzzing like a hat full of bees by morning. Coffee make you feel better, Carmel? Mm, queer. I do feel like sleeping. Sleepy, eh? Captain, where is this room? Clear at the back. Right down to the end of the hall. And I'll show you. Ready, Carmel? Well, all right. Good night, Andres. Uh, you wait here, Andres. We'll get your cousin settled and be right back. See, si, I will wait. Good night, Carmel. We brought all your personal effects from your uncles. You'll find them in the room. You're all so good. Is this it, Captain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Here you are, Miss Ruiz. Please don't call me Miss Ruiz. I prefer Carmel. <laughs> all right. Carmel it is. And I think the room's beautiful. Hey, look. Come into the window. See how close the ocean is? Looks friendly, doesn't it? Hello? What's that? What is it, Captain? Tugboats pulling into the wharf. You can see the searchlight. Is that unusual? Yeah. Never heard of it before. Not at 11 o'clock at night. Oh, probably some citizen of Holman anxious to get back home from San Francisco tonight. No, no. Holman residents don't go to the city. Oh, perhaps a delivery boat with supplies for the store. Mm. This time of night? Oh, well, we're keeping Carmel up. When you're ready, knock on the door and crawl into bed. Then I'll come in and give you something to make you sleep. Don't want you tossing and fretting. Thank you, Dr. Croft. Good night, Carmel. Good night, Captain. Now, Doctor, I have a notion to go down to the wharf. Everything seems to be taking on a sinister hue for you tonight. Yeah. Why shouldn't it? Well, what is it now? Something else? Uh, nothing at all, Andres. The captain saw a tugboat landing down at the wharf, and he's just wondering about it. There are too many coincidences taking place tonight. Hardly call them coincidences, Captain. I never saw a more unrelated set of circumstances. Uh, of course they're related. Really? Well, I can't see it myself. Now, what relation is there between Doc Sims falling dead on the beach and Andrew Walters hanging himself in his home? The two rich men of Holman dead on the same night. That's enough for me. But what's the relationship between them and the village half-wit we found in the morgue shot through the heart? The mere fact that there hasn't been a death in Holman for 20 years, and then suddenly there are three deaths. It smells like plenty of trouble. Yes, I suppose it does. But where does the skeleton in the moonlight, seen by Andres here in Carmel, enter the picture? And what has all this to do with Dr. Sim's body wandering about after we've definitely locked him up in the morgue? Not so fast, Doctor. Let's take them one at a time. Carmel is calling. All right, you may come in, Dr. Croft. Uh, you'll excuse me, please. I just put a drop of sedative in the child's coffee, but I want to give her one more tablet to be certain she sleeps. Okay, go right ahead, Doctor. Andres, tell me something about your uncle. How was he acting before you left the house today? My, my, what a nice lot of hair. Didn't let you cut it in the convent, I see. No, Doctor. Mm hmm. Now, I'm going to open this window. The salt air will make you sleep like a top. The sound of the waves will lull you. Ah, uh, seems to be stuck. Ah, ah, there it is. There. Doesn't that sound good? Oh, yeah. Now then. Now sit up and take this tablet. And here's a glass of water. Just enough to get the tablet down. Uh, it's down. Good girl. Now then lie down. You going to be warm enough? Oh, yes. Well, that's all right then. I'm going to make the captain give me the room right next to you. There's a door in between. Now leave the transom open. Now, if you want anything, just call. Thank you. That way I won't feel so, so frightened. <laughs> no, of course not. There's nothing to be frightened of, child. Good night, now. I'll snap out the light as I leave. Good night. Well, that seems to settle that pretty well. Andres. I assure you, Captain Friday, it is everything I know about my uncle. Yeah? Well, I'd say there were a lot of things you haven't found out yet. Oh. Got your patient settled, Doctor? Yes. Carmel will sleep. <laughs> Seems to me I promised you a restful weekend. I intended having you lie down all day Saturday and Sunday just listening to the ocean. Wait. What was that? <laughs> oh, I see, Captain. You do have the jumps. Didn't you hear it? Something on the porch. Could it be the walking body? Oh, come now. There. 
There. Didn't you hear it? Rather. What do you suppose? Quiet. Well, if it's old Doc Sims' body, it hasn't forgot its manners. Manners? Yes, open the door and let the corpse walk in. In the weekend cottage of Captain Friday in the isolated village of Holman, the girl Carmel has been given a sedative and put to bed by Dr. Croft. The three men, Croft, Captain Friday, and the girl's cousin, Andres Ruiz, were discussing the three deaths of the evening when there came a knock on the door. A midnight visitor. Is it Dr. Sims' body? Has the decency to rap before entering anywhere. I will hold my gun on the door. Oh, nonsense. Just the same. Keep it handy, Andres. For certainty. Shall I do the honors, Captain? I'll answer it. You keep back out of the way. Well... Oh, please. Have you a room where we could stay tonight? A room? Well, this isn't a hotel. I told you how it would be. Come on, Gail. Oh, I say, Captain. How about having them in for a few moments anyway? What's going on here tonight anyway? Okay, come on in. Follow the doctor into the front room. Of course, if we're not wanted. Oh, it's okay. Come on in. Oh, uh, drop your bags there in the corner. Right in here. Well, where did you two drop from? Both of you look badly done up. We are. But may I introduce myself? I'm Gail Stanley, and this is my brother, Martin. Delighted. Uh, and I am Dr. Jamie Croft, and this is Captain Bart Friday, who's your host. And uh, here is Mr. Andres Ruiz, the guest. How, How do, do you do? do? Where did you two say you came from? From the south. You see, when we heard that our uncle had died here in Holman... What's that? Well, he did die, didn't he? Who? Well, our uncle. Isn't Dr. Sims dead? Well, uh, well yes, but my Mister. dear child... Who sent you word that Dr. Sims was dead? Well, it was just signed a friend. When did you get it? The messenger boy got me out of bed at 3 o'clock this morning. Said Dr. Sims had died suddenly and we should come immediately. Funny you should get the message this morning when he didn't die until sometime this evening. What? Oh, how horrible. Got the telegram with you? You have, haven't you, Martin? Yes, of course. Just a minute. Uh, uh, yeah, here it is. Hmm. Yeah, it's authentic, all right. You two came over on that tug we saw a few minutes ago, I suppose. Why, yes. We came just as fast as we could. You see, the message said for us to hurry. Uh -huh. We thought there'd be a hotel or some place we could stay tonight, but there wasn't a single light in the whole town except in this house. Yes, that's the reason we came here. And quite properly, too. Well, how about it, Captain? You enough beds? Mm, I suppose so. There are two bedrooms with twin beds and the lounge in Carmel's room. Now, just a minute. I want to get this straight. Dr. Sims is dead, isn't he? Well, what's wrong? He is, isn't he? Say, Gail, there's something queer here. You don't know the half of it, brother. Well, why don't you tell us? Is he dead or isn't he? Yes. Yes, he's dead, all right. Well, then? Yes, he's dead. But he doesn't seem to know it. What do you mean? Now, see here. I think the best thing to do is for us all to get a good night's rest and then tomorrow thrash this whole business out. But if there's something we should know about... Nothing that won't keep until the morning. Now, then... Captain Friday permitting, I'm going to assign sleeping quarters. Go right ahead, Doctor. Then I suggest that Miss Stanley take the couch in Carmel's room. Oh, I wouldn't disturb oh, anyone. Oh, no, no, you won't disturb anyone. The girl who's a cousin of Mr. Ruiz here is already asleep. Now then, I'll take the next room so that I'll be close by in case Carmel grows restless. Is she ill? No, but she's had a most distressing evening. Andres, supposing you occupy the second bed in my room. With pleasure. That will put you, Mr. Stanley, with Captain Friday in the bedroom on the other side of the hall. If it isn't an imposition. Well, how about it, Captain? As good as any. I'll get extra bedding for the couch. Well, please, if you'll just give me the bedding, I'll make it up. Okay, Miss Stanley. I'll leave everything just outside the door. Uh, please, I too have had a hard day. Uh, you would excuse me if I should retire? Run along, Andres. <laughs> please, then. Good night. Good night. Uh, second door to the right, you know. Now... How about you, Mr. Stanley? I'm dog-tired, all right, but I would like to know something about this business of my uncle. Please, Mr. Stanley, in the morning. Right. Uh, where's the room I'm to share with Captain Friday? Uh, right down the hallway, son. I'll show you the room. I'll be right back, Miss Stanley. Night, sis. Queer business all around, all this bother. No bother in the least. Right in here. I think you'll find it comfortable. Thank you. Uh, not at all. Good night. Good night. 
Oh, uh, here you are, Captain. You have Miss Stanley in tow, I see. Oh, we're making so much trouble. Oh, forget it. Wait until you see the sort of hotcakes I turn out for breakfast. Now then, here's plenty of covers. Oh, yes, plenty. Well, I, I guess that's everything. Will the light bother the other girl? Oh, not in the least. She won't awaken. Then good night. If you need anything, just call out. Well, I'm certain I won't. Good night. Oh, it'll be good to get out of these clothes. One slipper. And two slippers. Oh, dear, another runner. <laughs> Quaint old-fashioned room. Perfectly darling. Just imagine sleeping on the edge of the ocean. Hello. Who are you? Oh, I've wakened you. I'm sorry. No, I've been awake. Really? I'm afraid you're just being kind. You're a friend of Captain Friday. No, we're total strangers. I'm Gail Stanley. Captain Friday was good enough to put Martin and me up for the night. Martin? Yes, he's my little brother. Little? Well, he's 22. Oh. Uh, I'm Carmel Ruiz. You're sleepy, child. I'll turn out the light. Oh, no, you're not finished undressing. Well, I can easily finish in the dark. I'm glad you're here. I mean, sleeping in here with me. That's awfully generous. Not really. I feel a lot safer now. Safer? Well, what's there to be afraid of? Then, then you don't know? There, you're getting yourself wide awake. I'm going to turn out the light and crawl in. I need sleep terribly. Honey, I feel awfully drowsy in spite of everything. There. Oh, my, but a bed feels good. Mm. Imagine going to sleep to the sound of waves. Isn't very dark, is it? The moon coming in. Mm. It's simply enchanting. What? Well, that's strange. What? That shadow. Didn't you see it cross the room? Why, why no. Huh. Queer. Oh, I guess it was my imagination. Well, good night. Good night, Gail. Mm, I can just feel myself unwind. Uh-oh. Huh. Who's there? What, what is it? Shh. There's someone at the window. Oh, please. Go, Captain Friday. Don't let it get in. Be quiet. Wait. We mustn't. We mustn't, I tell you. Listen. Listen. Yes, of course. What, what is it? it? Sounds like bones rattling. It's what it is. Bones rattling. It's a skeleton. It's after me. It's after me. Skeleton? Oh, that's silly. It's probably the wind blowing the shutters. Of course there's some explanation. Oh, no. No. Carmel, you're just nervous. Look, supposing I come and get in bed with you. Would that help? But you said yourself there was some... Well, I shouldn't have. It was just that I heard the noise and... I was startled for a minute. Mm -hmm. well, would you come and sleep with me? Of course. <laughs> that big bed looks absolutely luxurious. I feel kind of lost in it. It's so big. Our grandmother slept in beds like this. Oh, marvelous. Old-fashioned feather bed. You... You don't think it was the skeleton? Say, what in the world are you talking about, Carmel? What skeleton? The, the one that followed Andres and me on the beach tonight. Why, I never heard of such a thing. I never did either until I came to Holman. But it did. You mean just a bare skeleton? No, it was wearing a cloak. A long black cloak. It had a huge black hat pulled down over its face. But if it was covered... Well, how do you know it Because was... the wind blew the cloak back, and, and there it was. And you think it's come here now? It's what I thought. Hmm. Do these people, I mean Captain Friday and Dr. Croft, know about it? Yes. What did they say? They didn't say anything. But I know they think we were mistaken. Oh, of course you were. Skeletons don't walk around. You're old enough to know that. <gasps> Hush. Listen. It isn't the shutter at all. 
you can tell it is. Well, if it's a skeleton, he's certainly giving himself a good shaking. Miss Stanley, get back in bed. What are you going to do? I'm going to see what's outside the window. Please. Please don't go near the window. Please. Nonsense. You mustn't. Three people have already been murdered what? and... What did you say? It's true. Please keep away from the window. Did you say three persons were murdered? I, I don't know. But they died. <laughs> there it is again. You stay in bed. I'm going to have a look. Please. Please. I'll only be a minute. Come back. Please come back. Oh, no! <laughs> Let go of her throat! Captain Friday! Andres! He's dragging her out of the window! He's dragging her out of the window! <laughs> So already the new arrivals, Gail and Martin Stanley, have been dragged into the evil which is afoot in Holman. Three dead. Andrew Walters, rich man, hanged. Doc Sims, mayor, coroner, and second rich man, dead of natural causes. And third, the half-wit boy shot through the heart. One of the bodies on the prowl, and the skeleton of still another keeping a close and menacing guard over Captain Friday's cottage. Listen next week to Chapter 3 of Dead Men Prowl, which is entitled, The Dead Do Walk at Night. You are listening to Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents Dead Men Prowl, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Three men have been killed in the tiny isolated village of Holman, across the bay from San Francisco. Three killed and a corpse on the prowl. The corpse of one of the dead men. For at least two people have seen Doc Sims prowling about the street after his body was carried to the morgue. Dr. Jamie Croft had gone to Holman as a weekend guest of Captain Friday. On the beach, they had found Holman's mayor coroner, Doc Sims, dead. At the morgue, they found the village half-wit, Rich Hartley, on the marble slab, shot through the heart. And finally, Andres and Carmel Ruiz, cousins, had found their uncle, Andrew Walters, hanged in his home. Doc Sims and Walters were the two rich men of Holman. Captain Friday, you take up the story here. Holman had not had a death for 20 years, and three sudden deaths roused my interest. With Dr. Croft, I took Andres and Carmel to my beach cottage. In the middle of the night, a launch docked at the village and two more people entered the picture. They were Gail Stanley and her brother, Martin, niece and nephew of Doc Sims. They'd been called from their home in Santa Barbara by a telegram announcing Doc Sims' death. But the telegram had been sent while Sims was still alive. There were three bedrooms in Captain Friday's cottage. The two girls were put in one, and suddenly, under their open window, came the strange, terrifying rattling of bones. Carmel thought it was the skeleton. Against the younger girl's warning, Gail Stanley went to the window. Please, oh, please don't go near the window. Please. But Gail refused to heed Carmel. She leaned out. Let go of her throat! Andres! Captain Friday! He's pulling her out of the window! <laughs> Oh, 
Carmel! Carmel, my cousin, have you gone mad? Oh, Andres, the skeleton's gone. It, it came to my window. Son of perdition, where is everyone? I don't know. Outside the window. Oh, well, Mike, who was that screaming? <laughs> Dr. Croft, Captain Friday, the skeleton's got Gale. Got Gale stabbed me? And dragged her out of the window. Had her by the neck. My word. Come with me, Doctor. You got a gun? I'll get along very nicely. Andres, watch after your cousin. See, si, senor. Uh, here we are. Uh, Gail Stanley's gone, all right. He pulled her out of the window. Captain, let's go through the window. He or it can't get very far carrying a 110-pound girl. Uh, yeah, the moon's still good. Should be able to follow. Easy now. I'm down, Captain. Come on. Stand to one side. Uh, there. You see anything, Dr. Croft? Not a soul in sight. Now be careful where you step, Doctor. There'll be footprints. Right. I don't see any. Oh, yeah, yeah, here they are. Which way? Seem to lead around the house and up on the grass, out of the sand. I see. Hmm. You have a match, Captain? Yeah, better than that. A flashlight. Right. Hmm. You notice anything about these footprints, Captain? Hmm. I'll be a son of a gun. Nobody carrying a girl in his arms would make that sort of a track. Not likely. But what did he do with her? Might have dumped her in the ocean. Well, in that case, the tracks would lead to the edge of the surf. Well, let's have a look. He could have strangled her and thrown her in. And that would be the end of Gail Stanley. Mm, the tide's right, too, to carry her out to sea. No tracks going down to the ocean. Just a minute, Captain. Girl kidnapped from my own house and murdered. A fine reputation I'll have. Captain. Captain Friday. Hmm? Here. Here, right under the window. Get down and dig. Dig sand like you've never dug before. You've gone nuts. <clears throat> Captain, if you value a human life... What's that? You mean the girl's buried here? Oh, no, faster, man, Faster. She can't be buried very deep. Yeah. Couldn't have had much time. Ah, diabolical. Here. Here she is. I've uncovered her feet. Oh, keep at it. Her head's where you're digging. Yeah. Yeah, give me a hand. Ghastly. Oh, the poor child. Don't stop to sympathize. Get the sand off her body. right -o. Is she dead? Well, I don't know yet. There. I think we can pull her out. Yeah. Easy, easy. Careful now. Careful. There. Now, now, lay her down. I want to see about her heart. What's the verdict? Oh, splendid. Her heart's still beating strong. Her respiration's weak. Buried her alive. Of all the terror. Now, I'm going to give her a few artificial respiration measures to force the air out of her lungs. Watch closely how I do it so that you can believe me if it takes longer than I think. Now, one, two... One, two, one, two. See, Captain Friday? Press, release. Press, release. Forces the air out. The lungs automatically refill with fresh air. It's a crude first aid method, but it's working. Lucky we found it when we did. Another 10 minutes, it would have been too late. Wet sand, packed around her face. Well, that's one up for you, Doctor. I can't figure out yet how you knew she was buried there. The fact that the man didn't carry her away was the first tip. And I noticed that wet, pyramid-like stain against the side of the house. <clears throat> Evidently, this amateur grave digger threw the sand against the house. Yeah, I missed it altogether. <laughs> Fine detective I turned out to be. What next? Then I noticed the sand had been disturbed. We can be thankful the sand was wet. Well, that's smart work, Doctor. i got to hand it to you. How's the girl? Doing well. It's going to be all right. Look here. Look here. Have you got my sister out there? Is that you, Stanley? Yes. Where are you? Leaning out of the window right above you. Is that Gail? Yeah, what about it? What's the matter with her? What are you doing to her? Supposing you climb out the window and find out. No. You can do better than that. Go and tell Carmel and Andres to put a, cup, a pot of coffee on. She'll need something hot. But see here, what's the matter? Do as you're told, fella. But first, toss a blanket out of the window. We're bringing her in now. Here, Stanley, we want a blanket. I heard. And do what you're told and hurry. Well, you don't need to snap my head off. She's breathing regularly now. It's going to be all right. Here's the blanket. Catch her. All right. Now go tell Carmel and Andres. Hadn't I better help? Say, listen here, Stanley. Oh, all right, all right. Kind of a dump this is. Spread the blanket out and help me lift the girl onto it. Okay. How's that? Good. Take her legs. Well, there's plenty of hot water, I suppose. Yeah. 
Well, we'll, we'll want to get Aunt Bax on her. She's thoroughly chilled, poor child. There. That'll do. Now, can we carry her together? I can carry her along. Up with it. We'll go around and come in the front door. Well, have it your own way. I'll go ahead with the flash. Okay, you lead the way. Yeah, that poor kid. Well, keep away from those footprints, Doctor. I want to give him a closer look in the morning. Good idea, Captain. Look here. I think we'd better reassign rooms for the rest of the night. Neither of the girls will be willing to go back to their room. Well, don't blame them. Well, naturally. Supposing, then, you and I take the girls' room. We'll let Andres and young Stanley get along as best they can, and we'll put Carmel and Gail in my room. The windows are high and small. No one likely to get in them unnoticed. We can lock the door into the hallway, and the door opening between the two bedrooms will be an added protection for them in case of emergency. Oh, that's okay. Can you get in the door with her? Yeah. Get in sideways. All right. Easy. There you are. Good. They've got the fire built up. Here, here. Uh, lay her on the lounge. Uh, there. Yeah, everyone must be out in the kitchen. Andres! Carmel! Yes, Miss Friday! Come here, quick! Quick! What now? Stay with the girl, Doctor. All right. I'll kill you! I'll kill you! Here, here, here. What's going on? Captain, make them stop fighting! Make them stop! Stop fighting! Stop fighting. Here, you two! What's this about? Help the Diablo, I will kill this person! Oh, you will, will you? Well, that black eye is just a tiger. Ah, take it easy, Stanley. As if we didn't have enough trouble without There's all... a reason for all this rumpus. There is reason plenty. It's me. Oh, you, huh? <laughs> Please, Captain Friday, it's not funny. Well, but see here, Carmel. Male attention is meat and drink to most girls. See, but Captain, this Stanley person insult my cousin. Insult, huh? What are you up to, Stanley? Is it an insult to admire a girl? Yeah, but with the look you give her. Hands off, Stanley. But you're admiring from a distance. Matter of fact, you might be showing a little more concern about your sister. You said she was all right. Go on in the front room. I'll bring the hot water. Dr. Croft is with your sister. Please, Captain Friday, may I wait for you? Well, if you like. You two go on in and give the doctor a hand. Yeah, okay, have it your own way. Please, Captain Friday. Well? What did you mean about... about men being meat and drink to most girls? Out of the convent and into the fire. What? See here, Carmel... You've got to expect a certain amount of attention. You've been shut off from the world. Now you're out in it. One of these days, you'll want to marry. Won't you? Why, yes. Hmm? Of course. Well, you've got to have men around you. Otherwise, how are you to know which man you'll want to marry? Oh. Yeah. And if you're a wise child, you'll be amused by the attention. You'll be very diplomatic. Appease all of them. Keep the friendship of all of them until you discover which is the one you want. But but how does the girl tell which one she wants? <laughs> Don't worry, you'll know. It's automatic. But um, take my advice and see if you can't keep those two young Romeos from each other's throats. Try it. I've got a hunch you have a knack for diplomacy. Well, I'll try. Now let's go into the other room. Mind now. Run into any trouble, you come to me. Hi, Stanley. Call Captain Friday. Your sister's coming too. Oh, coming too, huh? All right, Doctor, we'll take care of her. It took you a long time to get that hot water, Captain. <laughs> Had to settle an international dispute. Uh, see here, Miss Stanley's pajamas are wet from the sand. She must have something dry. Carmel, get some fresh pajamas out of her bag. Oh, uh, Andres. See, si. You go along with her. Hurry now. Assuredly. Come, my cousin. Captain... Will you wring out a cloth in this hot water, please? Bathe her face and arms. The pulse is good. And respiration's normal. Is she going to be okay, Doctor? Oh, no doubt about it. You see how the color's coming into her face? It's better if we can get her into dry things before she comes to. We found another pair of pajamas in the bathrobe. Will they do? Nicely. Now then, Captain, you and the two young men clear out for a few minutes. Uh, Carmel, you stay here. Yes, sir. Stanley... Oh, we're going to have Miss Stanley back with us any moment now. Doctor, will, will she cry? Cry? Oh, I don't think so. But she'll be very ill. She's had a terrible experience. <laughs> Gail never cries about anything. 
She was very near the brink of death. Persons returning from so near the edge are apt to be filled with a terrible horror. Oh, Go away. Oh, look. Look, the expression on her face. Oh, she is terribly afraid. What's the matter with her, Doctor? You said my sister'd be all right. You said she'd be all right. What's the matter with her? What have you done to her? Easy, Stanley. What have you done to my sister? What have you done to her? Gail Stanley is alive, but she's a very sick young woman, choked and dragged out of her bedroom window by the skeleton and left lying on the wet sand for dead is an experience out of a nightmare. When she began to come to, her mental horror was so terrifying, she frightened her brother almost to the point of hysteria. Something's happened to her. Gail never cries. What have you done to her? You think something is wrong with her, eh? You know she was dragged from her bedroom window by some creature and was buried alive in the wet sand. And you stand there asking, is something wrong with her? Is, is she insane? Insane. What kind of a guy are you, Stanley? Well, I never saw my sister act like that before. You don't seem to understand. It is terrible to approach death, but not one half so terrible as to return to life after you have once looked on the other side. You, you mean she'll know what dying's like when she comes to? Perhaps. Don't you see all the delicate machinery of her body came almost to a standstill? It was a terrible strain on her system, getting it started again. No, no, don't choke me anymore. Don't choke me anymore. Captain Friday, can you carry her again? Sure, Doctor, why? Well, bring her back to the room she's to occupy. Now, uh, you two men, gather up all the extra blankets you can find and heat them one at a time before the fire and bring them to me. Most okay, assured, right away. See. Uh, Carmel, see if you can't find a hot water bottle. Fill it and bring it. Yes, sir. Now then, Captain, bring her along. There now. Easy there. There we are. Oh. Say, my sister must be pretty sick. Is that as bad as you feel? Oh, let me alone. Look here, Andres. Uh, I'll hunt around for blankets, and you warm them and take them into the doctor. Here's one. No, very well, if you wish. Andres, I... There I... is a hot water bag in the bathroom. It hangs behind the door. I saw it. Oh, do you think it's safe for me? Come to... on, I'll go with you to get No. I think she's safer alone. Oh, you do, do you? Well, I... I... <laughs> Don't be so dramatic, Andres. Of course Mr. Stanley will look out for me. Please do come. You want me to come? Of course. But, Carmel, I... Please, let's hurry. Dr. Croft wants the bag right away. How am I doing, Cousin Andres? Here it is. I'll have to get hot water in the kitchen. Okay. You'd better look for more blankets, Mr. Stanley. I won't be afraid in the kitchen. I... Oh, please. Ah, don't act like that. But you're hurting me. So tight. Don't... <laughs> you are pretty. If I thought you weren't a gentleman, I... Say, you asked me to come along, didn't you? Because I was afraid. You know, I could call for help. Why don't you? Because I'd feel sorry for what would happen to you. Oh. Haven't you that much consideration for me? You're growing up in a hurry. You don't sound like the frightened baby I tried to kiss out in the kitchen less than an hour ago. If you'll take your hands off of me. Thank you. Now go and find more blankets. Well, I'll be doggone. <laughs> All right, you win. You're sure you're not afraid to go back alone? Please, you'll wait here until I get down the hall? All right. I'll watch until you're safe. Oh, there you are. Yes. I was just getting ready to come and look for you. That would have been foolish, Andres. Oh, I see you had the hot water bottle. Uh, shall I go to the kitchen with you? If you keep talking, I won't be afraid. See. Si. Uh, I've taken two blankets into the doctor. Miss Stanley, she stopped crying now. And the doctor, he give her something. She's talking with them. Do you hear me, Carmel? Yes. Please keep talking. Huh? Well, the doctor is giving her medicine to make her sleep. He says uh, these hot blankets will make her drowsy. The... Oh. Oh, you have it filled already, huh? Good. Well, I have another blanket ready. We will go together, eh? I wish you would come with me, Andres. Carmel, did this Stanley fellow, did he bother you? Why, what a silly question. Because if he did... Please, don't bother your head about it. Then he did. Mr. Stanley was a gentleman, Andres. Uh, well, then it was an accident. 
Here, they have put Miss Stanley in here. Oh, yes, I'd forgotten. And as I leaned out of the window, two strong hands grabbed me around the throat. Well, didn't you see the face? Just for a second. It sort of swam before my eyes. I was being choked and... I... Anybody you ever saw before? No. No, I couldn't tell. It wasn't like a normal face. It was all puffed out. Almost round. And the eyes. The eyes were dead. Oh, yeah, yeah, Miss Stanley. Take another sip of this. It will help you to forget. Dead eyes, bloated face. Nobody in Holman of that description. No one answering the description of the skeleton Carmel and Andres saw either, is there? Kelly. Is there anything else you saw, Miss Stanley? Yes. Something so... so awful, I can't believe I saw it. Yeah? There was a rope around his neck. It was tied around his neck and hanging down in front of him. My uncle! My uncle! Carmel, don't you dare faint. You slapped me. You're much better off slapped than in a faint. Please, Carmel, you sit down. See? No, 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 no. You stand up. Walk about. Keep moving. You'll be all right in a moment. Bloated face, dead eyes, a rope around his neck. Andrew Walters was found hanged tonight. Look here, Doctor, that can't be true. What can't be true? I'll swear Walters was dead when we found him. I know he was. And what's he doing walking around? We saw Doc Sims walking around. Oh, I must be going nuts. And one dead man has as much right to walk around as another. Do you know what you're talking about? No. Do you? I know one thing. I'm going over to the morgue right now. If Walters has been walking around... <laughs> oh, come, Captain. You don't really believe... Well, if Miss Stanley... Hey, look here, Miss Stanley. Are you... Sir... Oh. Sleep. Yes. I gave her a pretty severe sleeping potion. She'll sleep until morning. Well, I'm going over to the morgue. You want to come along? No, I think I'd best stay here. It's only about a block. No. Now, you take Andres. Where's young Stanley? Yeah, where's that guy? Either of you seen him? Why, well, I left him gathering up blankets about ten minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, just a minute. What's he up to? Carmel? Yes, sir. Carmel. As soon as the captain is gone, I want you to get into this other bed. Oh, but I couldn't sleep. I couldn't. Yes, yes, yes. You'll sleep all right. I'll see to that. Supposing... Supposing someone should... Should get in while we're asleep. No one will get in. We lock all the doors, and one of the boys will be here with me. We'll keep a lookout. Oh, yeah? Maybe you were, and maybe you weren't. Go on in here. Don't try to manhandle me. I don't care who you are. Here, here. You're not so loud, Stanley. Can't you see your sister sleeping? I was in my room getting a blanket, and this fellow jumped on me and began pushing me around. Getting a blanket, huh? Didn't think I saw you stick this revolver down under the covers, did you? That's my gun. Yeah, sure. That's what I'm telling you. What you doing with it? Just got it out of my grip for protection. Yeah? And why did you hide it when I came in? A person ought to be able to protect himself without letting the whole world in on it. Yeah? Give it back to me. Okay, baby. I'd be mighty careful what I did with it. Now then, doctor, I'm going over to the morgue. Andres will go with me. If you wish. All right, then, Stanley. You stay here with me. Come along, Andres. Get your hat. Uh, Dr. Croft, you... You will look after my little cousin. Oh, don't worry. She'll be safe and sound asleep when you return. Ready, Andres? Uh, I am coming, see. Si. Good night, Carmen Mia. Be careful, Andres. Be careful, please. Oh, you must not worry for me. Good night. All right, let's step on it. Still moonlight. See, it does not seem possible this is the same night we first met. So much has happened. <laughs> Doesn't it that? Look here, Andres. There's something I've been wanting to ask you. Here we can take this path across the lot. It's shorter. See. Well, what is it you wish to ask? You were, as far as we know, the last to see your Uncle Andrew alive. I do not know that. I was with him just before I left to meet Carmel at the train. Yeah, that's what I mean. Andres, what frame of mind was he in when you left? Oh, very much interest in uh, what Carmel would be like. We talked for almost an hour, making plans. Yeah. It's not a suicidal frame of mind. Oh, no, no, senor. I am sure he did not contemplate suicide. No, it was not possible. Yet who would murder a man by hanging him? And what man would stand around and let himself be hanged? Hmm? If he were unconscious before... Captain Friday, look. A body. 
Is someone else dead? There's only one way of finding out. See, he is sprawled out. It's Doc Sims' body. El Diablo? The dead man, who is he? Still wrapped up in his sheet. Here, Andres, help me turn him on his back. Is his heart go? <sighs> no. But we see him walking. Well, you can tell by looking at his face that he's dead. Oh, this is most horrible thing. Well, come on, there's nothing to do but take him back to the morgue. Senor, you wish Only me a couple to... of steps, but... Yeah. Grab a hold of his legs. Oh, I do not like these. Yeah, maybe you think I do. Yeah, grab hold. Yeah. Ready? Mm -hmm. See. All right, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Put him in the morgue. Here, hang on, don't let him slip. I have not let him slip. Well, he moved. Uh, we'll put him in the morgue and have Doc Croft come down and give him another an examination. Not much use, though. I know a dead man when I see one. Oh, this is bad thing. Yeah, this is the place. Lower him to the porch while I unlock the door. See? Well, I'll be. The door's unlocked. And I locked it sure as I'm a foot high. Senor, you think someone else has been here? The door didn't unlock itself. Come on, let's carry him in. Where will we take him? Right straight through to the inner room where the other bodies are. Oh, please. Please, I would rather not look at him if you do not mind. Okay, look the other way. But you'll have to help me get Doc Sims in. Well, if it is necessary. Yeah. You're right in here. See. Careful. And now then, lay him on the floor while I turn on the lights. Oh, before you turn on the lights, I will go out. Wait for me outside the door. For sure, senor. Well, I'll be a son of a gun. You call, Captain? Andres. Andres, the half-wit boy's body is gone. It was here on the slab. Senor. Senor, you think maybe he is walking? Look. Look at your uncle's shoes, Andres. Wet sand on them. The rope around his neck. Fellow, I'm beginning to think dead men do walk. of the village half-wit boy is gone, and the shoes on the corpse of Andrew Walters covered with wet sand. Here is evidence that the dead may rise and go about their morbid duties. You will hear the fourth episode of Dead Men Prowl, entitled Conversation with the Walking Dead, next week at this same hour. You are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... Dead Men Prowl, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. What strange thing is this which has enveloped the seacoast village of Holman? Skeletons abroad. Dead men on the prowl. Three men have died in Holman. One naturally and two others violently. And since the three have been placed in a tiny village morgue, all three have shown terrifying activity. Old Doc Sims' body was seen hurrying from the morgue. The thing that dragged Gail Stanley from her bedroom window and buried her alive in the sand had the bloated face and staring eyes of a strangled man. And there had been a rope around his neck. This description fitted Andrew Walters, who had been found hanged. 
Had he risen from his resting place in the morgue and committed the crime? Captain Friday had raced to the morgue to see. Yes, I raced to the morgue. Walter's body was there, but the shoes were damp and covered with wet sand. And now the third body was gone. The body of Rich Hartley's half-wit son, who had been shot through the heart. What mischief would this prowling dead creature bestir? All through the night, Captain Friday and his companion, Andres Ruiz, searched but in vain. Back in the captain's summer home, Gail Stanley and Carmel Ruiz slept in a barricaded room, while Dr. Jamie Croft and Martin Stanley, Gail's brother, patrolled the house. Morning dawned, and with the light, Captain Friday and Andres returned. Outside the house, the captain paused. Yeah, look here, Andres. Huh. These footprints? Uh-huh. These are the footprints left by whoever buried Miss Stanley alive. Santa Maria. Uh-huh. Yeah, these are the ones, all right. What is this you say? I said those are Andrew Walter's footprints, all right. Couldn't miss. Look at the impression of the heel. Uh, measure's right, too. You, you think that... I'm not thinking anything. I'm just stating a fact. But come on in the house. I need coffee. Oh, senor, I think what I need most is sleep. Uh, no sleep for me. I'll knock some of that sand off your feet. See? Everybody must be asleep. Somebody will be around. Hello. That you, Captain Friday? Oh, hello, Dr. Croft. You think we were lost? Oh, you two must be about dead. I have some hot coffee for you. Come out in the kitchen. Oh, good. Now, where's young Stanley? Oh, I let him go to bed a couple of hours ago. No use all of us being dead on our feet. Should have gotten a couple of hours yourself. Oh, no. A man of my profession's used to this sort of thing. Well, how about frying a couple of eggs and some bacon for each of you? Hmm? No, no, no. Coffee's all I want now. How about you, Andres? Uh, no, nothing but coffee. Thank you, Dr. Croft. Well, I'm going to duck my head under the cold faucet. <sighs> Dead on my feet. What kept you so long? What did you find? <sighs> I found plenty. I'll give you the whole dope. Later on. <sighs> yeah. Oh, feels good. Yeah. Want to try it, Andres? Uh, please, I, I abominate cold water. Yeah, <laughs> clear out your head. Here, Captain, I'll pour the coffee. Draw up a chair, Andres. See. Si. Well, in the first place, Doctor, I want to tell you it's a doggone shame that you're not getting the rest you expected. <laughs> Forget it, Captain. When I asked you over here, well, I said... As a matter of fact, old chap, you didn't ask me. If I remember correctly, I practically begged you to bring me. I insisted. I wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> yeah, but I know you wanted to come. You needed the rest. Oh, well, this excitement will probably do me more good than the rest. Come now. What did you find at the morgue? Hmm? Uh, doctor, I don't know what to think. Andrew Walter's body was gone then? No, it wasn't. No? Well, it was there all right, but... But there was wet sand on his shoes. Mm -hmm. But my uncle, he is dead. I saw him myself. Well, nevertheless, the tracks out there in the sand were made by Andy Walter's shoes. No doubt, I suppose. Not a bit. Old oh, boy got up, pulled off his little stunt, and returned to his resting place in the morgue. Oh, that's silly. Yes, it does sound far-fetched. No, things like this do not happen where I come from. <laughs> well, I can assure you, my young friend, they don't happen here in California very often. But uh, see here, Captain, what was it that kept you out until dawn? Now the body of Rich Hartley's half-wit boy is gone. What? Yeah. Swell, huh? You, you don't suppose he got up and walked off, do you? No, I don't. That isn't all of our story either, Doctor. Still more? Yeah. On our way to the morgue, we found the body of Doc Sims. Oh, see here now. In what condition? That's queer. We found him lying in the same position as we picked him up on the beach. Sort of sprawled, you know, on his face. Mm-hmm. Oh, gives me the shivers. What did you do with him? Well, he was dead, so we carried him back to the morgue. Well, naturally. Say, so, Doctor, I think it'd be a good idea for you to go over sometime this morning and have a look at him. Yes, I think so, too, but aren't you rather optimistic? Well, what do you mean? Well, he means if he walk away once, what is to prevent him from doing it again, huh? Exactly. Well, maybe we should have him handcuffed to the slab. What kind of a case is this, anyway? I'm used to having a dead body stay where I put it. Well, I'll run over. I doubt if even the hardiest dead body will have the audacity to go prowling about in daylight. Well, I hope you're amused. <laughs> Quite. Hey, listen, Doctor... Did you ever hear of anything like this mess before? You mean dead men walking? Yeah. Why, 
Yes, I have, Captain. There are a number of records. Records of dead men walking? I cannot believe it. I personally know of a case. Uh Uh-oh. One of the girls must be awake. I heard a movement in the back of the house. Have they slept all night? Soundly. Drink your coffee. I'll be right back. Oh, Senor Friday. It is great relief that it is daylight. I tell you what, Andres. When you finish your coffee, go in and catch three or four hours sleep. The doctor and I will keep Carmel under our eyes all the time. Oh, please. How can I ever thank you? Oh, forget it. You know, this cousin of mine, she is more dear to me. Both than... girls are awake. Miss Stanley insisted she's able to get up. Uh, that's something. I was afraid we were going to have a sick girl on our hands. Miss Stanley has a marvelous stamina. By the way, I should, uh, I should advise making light of her experience. Okay, doctor. But see here, you started to tell us of a personal experience. Oh, yes, yeah. Well, there was a chap over in San Francisco who was pronounced dead. He was attended through his illness by a reputable physician and uh, seemed no doubt at all. The body was sent to an undertaking parlor and all funeral arrangements were made when... when uh, he suddenly got up and started wandering around the place. Sacrament! Frightened the attendants. The matter, of course, was hushed up. You mean he went on living? No, no. He never actually knew what happened. His mind was dazed. He died naturally a few hours later. Uh, what you doctors don't get mixed up with. Then, then there's the hypnotic state, which is practiced in India. You've read of mystics being hypnotized and allowing themselves to be buried alive. When they're in that state, all bodily functions are suspended. No physician in the world could be certain whether they are living or dead. Yeah, yeah, I've seen some of that in French Indochina. The human body is a curious instrument and is capable of playing strange and gruesome pranks on its own. Doctor, what you say makes me wish never to die. Yeah, but look here, Doctor. Natural death is one thing, violent death quite another. You don't mean to say anything like this could happen to a person who'd been hanged or shot. You're quite right, Captain. From a medical standpoint, it's quite impossible for such a thing to happen. And yet... And this skeleton which Carmel and I have seen... I don't understand that at all, Andres. Skeletons, after all, are something used to frighten children. There's no sense in even considering your skeleton. But we have seen it. I don't doubt your word. You say you saw it, and I believe you did. At least you saw something you took for a skeleton. Well, we've got to take it into consideration, Doctor. It fits into this puzzle somewhere. Now, first, Carmel and Andres see the skeleton on the beach. And then we find Doc Sims dead on the beach. Then we find Rich Hartley's boy murdered in the morgue. After that, Andrew Walter's hanged. It's unnatural. They're all hooked up together somehow. But uh, see here, Captain. Do you think there's anything to this idea? Doc Sims and Andrew Walters were enemies. They were the two rich men in the village. Oh, you mean somebody bumped off the two rich men out of spite? Yes, but where does Rich Hartley's half-wit son come in? Uh, maybe there's an excuse for two rich men, but... Why drag in a poor, foolish half-wit? Haven't the slightest idea. And then there's this business of enticing Gail and Martin Stanley here. Summoned to the funeral of their uncle, Doc Sims, before he was dead. Now, who did that? And that's another queer angle, Captain. How does it happen that each of the two rich men have two ears on the scene at the time or shortly after their deaths? Uh Uh-huh. Andrew Walters' heirs being Andres here and his cousin Carmel. And Gail and Martin Stanley representing Doc Sims. Shh, here come the girls. Oh, Carmel, I'm perfectly all right. You still must be careful. Oh, well, good morning. Are you feeling tip-top, Miss Stanley? Almost. A little shaky, but otherwise... Here, you better sit down. A strong cup of coffee would put you into shape. And you, Carmel? Oh, I'm just glad it's morning. I had the most horrible dreams. Where's Martin? Oh, your brother is still sleeping, Miss Stanley. And rather a difficult night. Andres, you'd better run along. You need rest. Why haven't you been to bed at all? Please, Carmel, you are all right? Yes, really, I am. Why haven't you been to bed? Well, I have been with Captain Friday. We have only just come in. Just come in? Well, where in the world have you been? Oh, just looking the situation over. Come, come. Now, you children, sit down and drink your coffee while I fry you some bacon and eggs. How do you like them? Oh, over? Couldn't I do it? I am the doctor. Do as I say. Well... I like mine over. Straight up, please, and not too hard. Uh, go along, Andres. Uh, please, if you will excuse me. Of course, Andres. Uh, if you will call me in a couple of hours. We'll route you out, and we want you on the job. <laughs> Very well. Uh, please do not forget now. Oh. 
Sounds like visitors already this morning. Not surprising after the night we've given this village. You go and see to your visitor, Captain, while I feed the ladies. I have a hunch it's Rich Hartley. Oh, well, the father of the murdered boy, eh? Yeah. I'm not going to like this. It sounds like he meant business. What would you be doing if you had a son lying in the morgue this morning? While Dr. Croft and the two girls are in the kitchen of Captain Friday's beach cottage preparing breakfast, the captain is on the front steps interviewing a delegation of Holman citizens. Dr. Croft is acting as chief cook and bottle washer and isn't making any too good a job of it. Well, there goes the eggs into the frying pan. There's one. There's two. Do a piece, hmm? Oh, Doctor, your toast is burning. Oh, my eyes. Oh, and look at the bacon. Oh, my joke. Oh, I say, Tom, I'll lend a hand with that toast. <laughs> May I help, too? No, you sit quiet. You're our invalid for the morning. Oh, dear. Well, how's the toast? I can scrape it. Well, the bacon will do. Eggs are coming along nicely. Here, Tom, I'll hand me the eggs. I'll hold them while you take up the bacon and eggs. That's an idea. There. That's probably well good. <laughs> <laughs> now, these are for Miss Stanley, and this is for you. Mm, just the smell makes me feel like a new person. <laughs> All right. Now, you two sit there and eat and answer some questions. Answer them? Why, well, I'm full of questions myself. No, it's important that we get a few details straight at once, if you don't mind. Of course not. Mm-hmm. Now, Miss Stanley, why do you think that you and your brother were called to Holman? Well, because of Doc Sim's death. But uh, why you two specifically? Saying for the moment that everything concerning Doc Sim's death is normal, why should you two young people be the ones called? Well, it's been understood right along that when Doc Sims died, we would be his heirs. But uh, why not your father and mother, Doc Sims's sister and brother-in-law? Well, mother and dad are very old. Neither is well. I see. It seemed very certain that our uncle, Doc Sims, would outlive both of them, and so he made his will directly to Martin and me. Yes. Uh, no other relatives? No. Mm -hmm. So, by Doc Sims' death, you and your brother come into valuable property. Uh, have you always had money? Well, only what we were able to earn, but Mother and Dad have enough laid aside to make them comfortable. That telegram you received notifying you of Doc Sims' death, you have no idea who might have sent it? I don't even know who could have been interested. But what about Doc Sims' attorney? I'd never heard that he had one. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway... Had it been he, he certainly would have signed it. Yes. Dr. Croft, you keep hinting at something strange about my uncle's death. Last night you said it, and just now you said something about taking for granted that his death is normal. What is it? What's the matter? See here, Miss Stanley, you're bound to know. It's like this. When you arrived last night, Dr. Sims was prowling about at large. He, he what? You see, Captain Friday and I had taken him to the morgue and... Well, he got up and left. Oh, how terrible. Yes, it was highly embarrassing. But, well, where is he now? Well, this morning he's back in the morgue. Well, is he dead? So Captain Friday believes. A little later, I'm going to investigate. And Carmel, did you know about... What about this? Yes, Oh, you poor child. No wonder you didn't want me to go near the window last night. You can see now that there is something very peculiar going on in home. Yes. And still more peculiar, Miss Stanley, are certain other facts. For instance, Andrew Walters, uh, the uncle of uh, Carmel and Andres, died a violent death last night. Oh. Yes. Did Carmel tell you that she too only arrived yesterday evening, uh, two or three hours before you and your brother? Why, no. Two tragedies in one night. There was a third. Why, I didn't know. Oh, no. You were in no condition to be told last night. Well, who was it? A poor village half-wit who was shot to death. Oh, who did it? We don't know. Was it... Was it the same person who tried to kill me? Mm, no. I think not, Miss Stanley. Well, here's Captain Friday back. Hello, coroner. What's that? Mm -hmm, it's a fact. The town council met out in my front yard, and I gave them an earful. Yes? Mm -hmm. 
At my suggestion, they elected me special officer in charge of this case with the official title of constable. Oh, I say, they have more gumption than I suspected. Mm. And at my further suggestion, they elected you coroner for this special case. Jove, now, how the honors do fall. Coroner Jamie Croft. Look here, I suppose they'll be wanting an inquest next. Set for tomorrow. But, uh, see here, I've got yeah, to... You better let them do as they like. When they get an idea, there's no changing them. Uh, how about the father of the half-wit? Oh, Rich Hartley? Yes, I saw him. He's pretty badly upset. Could he give any explanation? No, not a bit. The boy had a habit of roaming at night. They couldn't keep him in. Didn't try very hard, as there seemed very little danger. Mm -hmm, too bad. I suppose the whole village is bursting with excitement. Never anything like it in Holman before. They're holding a town meeting. A what? Mm -hmm, town meeting. Couldn't even wait for breakfast. Everybody's there. But see here, what's the object? Oh, blow off a little steam, I guess. <laughs> they probably send a written protest to the president against the new crime wave. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, and say, uh, while they're occupied, I think it'd be a swell time for us to take a look through Doc Sims' place. Walter's house, too, if we have time. We'll have a crowd trailing us everywhere if we don't give them the slip. Oh, quite, yes. Well, this will be a good time to look in at the morgue and see about Doc Sims. I don't know about you girls, though. But uh, don't you think they should stay here? You agree with me, don't you, Captain, that there's no danger? Yeah, not in the daytime. Still, there should be at least one man stay here with the girls. Well, I'm, I'm really not the least bit afraid. Please, you... You won't leave us all alone. Come out. We'll leave your cousin Andres and Martin here. Oh, no, you won't. Why, Martin? Awake, huh? Yes, and I heard you planning to go through my uncle's house without either Gail or me present. Nothing doing. Yeah? Exactly. Why, Martin, what's gotten into you? You're not yourself. Listen, Gail, there's something darn funny going on here. You and I plump ourselves down into a mess that we don't know anything but about. Martin, dear, we've got to trust someone. Surely you don't disbelieve Captain Friday and Dr. Croft. I don't know what I believe. Just the same, I'm not taking anybody on faith. If they're going over to Doc Sims' house, I'm going along. You're not sticking your neck out, are you, Stanley? I don't care. I know which side my bread's butted on. Or I'm going to find out. Well, you want to leave your sister here alone? Remember, just a few hours ago, someone tried to bury her alive. Let her come along. Impossible. She isn't strong enough. She must remain quiet. What's the danger in plain daylight, anyway? Well, probably isn't any. We're simply not taking any chances, that's all. Then one of you stay here, and I'll go with the other. Look, fella, just who do you think is running this show? I'm going if either you or Dr. Croft go, and that's final. Please, isn't it all right if we stay here with Andres? If anything frightens us, we can call him. As a matter of fact, Captain, I'd be glad to remain, except that I feel I should have a look at uh, Sims. Yes, I want you to, Doctor. Under the circumstances, I think I want young Stanley where I can keep an eye on him. Oh, you do? Yes, I do. You're going along right now. I haven't had breakfast yet. Well, you'll have to get it when we come back. We can't wait. The town meeting will be over if we don't hurry. Oh, all right. Well, then, let's get started. You got a key to my uncle's house? And, uh, Carmel, be certain to awaken Andres if there is the least sign of trouble. Oh, yes, I promise. All right, doctor, let's go. Coming. Uh, remember, both of you, no chances. Don't worry about us, Dr. Croft. We'll be back shortly. The doctor... You want to stop at the morgue before we go to Doc Sims' house? Why not let me drop in at the morgue, and then I'll join you at the house? It's only a step. Okay. Here's the morgue key. Oh, come on, we can cut across the lot, save a lot of time. Place is certainly deserted. Where is the town hall? That white frame building over there. Uh-huh. Which is my uncle's house? Oh, the big dark one right up ahead. That other two-story one, about half a block up the street on the other side, is Andrew Walter's place. Hmm. Who's he? Stanley, haven't you got this straight yet? Andrew Walters is Carmel and Andre's uncle. He was found hanged last night. Oh. Uh, who did it? That uh, Spanish chap, Andres? Who? What made you say that? Just wondered. Yeah? Well, let me ask you something. Did you have anything to do with the death of your uncle? What are you talking about? My question's just as good as yours. Well, here's where I turn for the morgue. Join you in a few minutes. Okay, doctor. Come along, Stanley. Ever been in Holman before? No. Well, we'll go into your uncle's place the back way and leave the door open for Dr. Croft. Some house. <laughs> Old Doc Sims had his own ideas about house construction. All right. 
in this way. Oh, careful. It's gloomy and the floors are bare. No windows at all on the first floor. Yes, well, that was his idea for protection against thieves. No windows on the first floor and only a front and back door, both of which could be barred from the inside. What did he have that needed all that protection? Well, you should know that better than I. You're one of his heirs. As far as I know, most of his estates and property. Now, let's begin by examining the room where he spent most of his time. Cross between a study and a medical laboratory. Right down this hallway. Rotten, musty smell. Oh, wait a minute. There's a push button to light the hallway somewhere along here. You seem to know this place pretty well. Oh, Doc Sims and I weren't on such bad terms. Oh, there it is. Now I'll lead off, and I know the way. All right, what are you looking for? As a matter of fact, I'm looking for two things. First, I want to find out if Sims left anything behind indicating that he anticipated his death. Oh. And second, I want to see his will. What's that got to do with you? Oh. Yep, here's the room. I said, what's my uncle's will got to do with you? Better stand still till I find the lights. Oh, here they are. There, there. Hog's nest. The room in which your uncle spent a good three-fourths of his life, Stanley. Smells foul. Dirt, no ventilation. Eh, never mind. Say, look here, Stanley. Have you a copy of Sim's will? No. Is your sister? No. Do you know whether there's a copy in this house? Why... Oh, there is one here, huh? Where? I didn't say there was. I'll just take it for granted there is. Where is it? The will belongs to Gail and me. Not when there's murder concerned. Under the circumstances, the police get first look at the will. What do you want it for? Now, sometimes a man writes something into his will that... Oh, hello. What's the matter? Look there on the floor. Woman's handkerchief. Yeah, a woman's... Why, that belongs... See, look here, Stanley. We fooled long enough. Someone else has been here ahead of us. What for? Well, what do you think? Looking for your uncle's will, of course. If you know where it is, you'd better tell me. Whoever gets it first. My uncle wrote that there was a small safe behind the third panel on the east wall. The third panel on the... Oh, that's right here. Oh, how are we going to get behind that panel? Run your thumbnail down the crease at the left edge of the panel. Oh. Know the combination of the safe? Uh-oh. Here they go. Yep. Here's the safe. Now what? Combinations three, eight, six, nine. Beginning at zero and reversing the spin... Oh. Oh, look. Look. There he is. There he is. Go away. Hey. Who turned out the lights? Stanley. Stanley! Doc Sims. Doc Sims, is that you, Doc? What are you doing here? Aren't you dead? Well, don't just stand there. Can't you speak, Doc? How is it I can see you in the dark? Don't come near. Don't. Stand back. I'm going to shoot. Oh. oh. Hi, Captain. Captain Friday, where are you? <coughs> Captain, Doc Sims' body is gone from the morgue. That's queer. They couldn't have left the house already. Uh, Captain! Hello? Oh, here's the door open. Well, there should be a light somewhere. Jove! Both of them out! Captain! Captain Friday! What's this? A gilt handkerchief? Why? That belongs to Carmel Ruiz. The bodies of Captain Friday and Martin Stanley lying together on the floor. And beside them, the handkerchief of Carmel Ruiz. And who was it who so quietly opened Doc Sim safe after the attack on Captain Friday? Next week, at this same hour, comes the fifth episode of Dead Men Prowl, entitled The Walking Dead Captured. You are listening to Adventures by Morse.
Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... Dead Men Prowl, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. If there is a terror more deadly than fear of the unseen, the unknown, it is that of facing a horror your senses tell cannot exist and yet which you can very plainly see. And that's what is happening in the coast village of Holman, where twice the dead body of Doc Sims was seen to prowl and two other bodies had risen from their resting places in the little morgue to carry on strange and sinister antics. It was on the second occasion of Doc Sims prowling that there occurred an incident deadly in its intent, weirdly desperate. On the morning following the first night of mystery and terror, Captain Friday had taken Martin Stanley and Dr. Jamie Croft with him to Doc Sims' house in search of clues. He left Gail Stanley, Carmel Ruiz, and her cousin Andres at his cottage. Dr. Croft had gone to the morgue to check on the bodies, and the captain and Stanley had proceeded to the Sims' house. They went to Doc Sims' study to examine his private papers and look for his will. But instead, they found a handkerchief belonging to the girl Carmel. Evidently, she had been there before them. They discovered a wall safe and were in the act of opening it when, for the third time, the body of Doc Sims appeared. It entered the study, shot Martin Stanley, and attacked Captain Friday. When Dr. Croft arrived from the morgue, he found two inert figures huddled on the floor. Uh, uh, Captain. Captain Friday. Uh, break your neck, Doc Sims. Here. Let go my throat. Get hold of the self, Captain. Come out of it, man. We'll bang me over the head. Oh, are you, Dr. Croft? Dr. Croft, did you see him? Did you see him? See whom? Doc Sims. At least his body. Why? Why, no. I did. Shot young Stanley and then got me. How's Stanley? Is he dead? Don't worry about Stanley. The bullet just grazed his head. But see here, Captain. Do you mean to tell me you saw Doc Sims walking again? I did, and there's no argument this time. Hmm. His body was gone from the morgue, all right. Oh, what a head I've got. Dr. Croft, looked. Look at the safe. It's been opened. I see it has. I don't get it. Opening his own safe and stealing his own will. I wish Doc Sims would make up his mind whether he's dead or not. Captain Friday, are you certain it was Doc Sims? Well, if it wasn't, it was his dental quill. Why? I picked up this handkerchief when I came into the room. It belongs to Carmel Ruiz, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was here when we came in. Which indicates that she has been here. That looks bad for Carmel. Oh, nuts. But this is a handkerchief. Well, I can't help it. A kid like her couldn't get mixed up in this. She's just out of a convent. Doesn't know what it's all about. Oh, I know all about that, but... It doesn't get rid of the fact that someone dropped Carmel's handkerchief here. Yeah. Uh, see here, how about Andres? He's in love with his cousin. Might have been carrying a handkerchief. Uh-oh. Stanley's coming around. Close call, my boy. Better look after him, Doctor. I'm going to have a look at the safe. You better wait. Your knees will buckle if you get to your feet too quickly. Uh, couldn't feel any worse. Here, give me a hand. Oh, my head. Uh, I told you. The guy must have swung from the floor. Yeah, there. Head's clearing up a little. Righto. Uh, I'll see about Stanley. And Doc Sims sure made a mess of his papers. Looks like a whirlwind hit the safe. Queer. A dead man should suddenly desire to rifle his own safe. Yeah, especially when his rightful heir was about to put his hands on the will. Mm, it's a queer business all around. <sighs> No. Now, now, now. Stanley, my boy, now, now, take it easy. So far as I've been able to find, there's no indication around the house that Doc Sims anticipated either a natural or violent death last night. Captain, day. Captain, can you give me a hand here? Uh, Stanley's being difficult. Yeah, okay, Doc. Now, now, here, 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 Stanley, Stanley. Grab his legs, Captain. Putting up a battle, huh? All right. Juicy, they're belligerent. Now, take it easy, fella. If we can hold him down for a few moments, he'll come out of it all right. I've got his leg. Let go of me. You let go of me. I don't care if you are my uncle. Oh, you can hold him long enough for me to get a glass of water. That should bring him out of it. Here, we'll go to it. I've got him. All right, but watch out. Won't take for the moment. No, easy now, Stanley. You're going to no, be all right. Go. Hi there, doctor. Step on it. I've got him, but that's about all. All right now. Hold him. 
I'll give him a dash of cold water in the face. There. That'll take care of him. You can let go now. Uh, I don't mind informing you that most of that water went down my neck. <laughs> I'm sorry. The regular tiger. Look at the scratches on my face. Mm -hmm. Little Ardeen will take care of it. You'll have to handle your patient yourself from now on, Doctor. I'm going to finish looking through these papers in the safe. Uh, I doubt if you'll find the will. I don't expect to, but you never can tell, though. Hello, Stanley. Mm, feeling pretty rotten, eh? Uh, rotten. Coming to all right, has he? Mm, he'll do. Should be taken back to the cottage. Yeah. Hello. Here's something. Say, look at this, Doctor. A duplicate of a letter from Doc Sims to Andrew Walters. What's that? A letter? And what a letter. Anything to do with this situation? Has it. Just listen. Andrew Walters, this is to inform you that I, Dr. C.N. Sims, have discovered your real identity as well as enough of your background and history to make your presence in this community undesirable. Unless you are willing to come to such terms as I see fit to impose, I shall at once reveal your identity and turn you over to the proper authorities, which, of course, you realize means nothing less than the gallows. Phew. My word, is... Does that mean that my uncle had something on Andrew Walters? Had something? <laughs> looks to me like he had everything. This looks like the key to the whole situation. Who do you suppose Andrew Walters was, anyway? Mm, nothing less than a hunted murderer, sounds like. wonder if this note drove Walters to hang himself. I wonder. Do you think a man would hang himself to keep himself from being hanged by the state? Yes, but he didn't have to hang. Doc Sims offered him a way out. Agree to his terms, and he'd keep his mouth shut. Must have been pretty bad. Anyway, Walters preferred to die instead of coming to terms. Uh, maybe. Anyway, we've got a clue to this business. Right now, I want to get Walters' fingerprints and shoot them over to the city for a check with the police criminal files. How will you get them to the city? I'll get the grocery supply boat to take them over. It'll be in at noon. We've got to work fast now. I want to run over the rest of Doc Sims' house, and then I want to go through Walters' place. I'd like to find this original letter. Uh, see here, Stanley. Uh, think you can make it back to Captain Friday's cottage alone? How do you feel? Nauseated. Mm, naturally. Now, the question is, would you rather drag yourself over to my place or lie down on the lounge here while Dr. Croft and I finish looking around? Me stay in this place along with a corpse sneaking around with a gun? Okay, you run along back to the cottage then. Take it easy, fella. You'll feel better out in the fresh air. All right, but... But what? Well, just remember, if you find that well, it belongs to Gail and May. Now, listen, Stanley. No one's trying to beat you out of your estate. At least not in this crowd. You'll get the will if we find it. Now run along. Oh, I feel rotten. Oh, uh, by the way, Stanley, tell Andres that we're going to search his uncle's place in about ten minutes, and if he wants to be in on it, tell him to wait for us out in front. I'll tell him. Oh, and don't mention this letter. You don't need to worry. That clip on the side of the head took a lot of belligerence out of our young friend. Yeah, that in the sight of his dead uncle. Yeah, come along, Doctor. There's nothing more in here. Take a look upstairs and then shoot over to Andrew Walters' place. Dr. Sims must have been a queer sort of codger. Yeah, shut off from everyone. Sometimes he wouldn't be seen for days at a time. Oh, here's the stairway. Beastly dark. There's a light here somewhere. Oh, here it is. Oh, hold it, Doctor. Do you see what I see? My word. Again? Yeah. It's Doc Sims again. But see here, Captain. He's stone dead. Sprawled out on his face, just as we found him twice before. But Captain Friday, this man's dead. He's been dead for a good many hours now. It couldn't have been he who attacked Oh, him. yeah? Well, I'm telling you, Doctor, dead or not, I recognize those clothes and that face. And they're the same. Now, let's turn him on his back. All right. <clears throat> you can see quite, quite plainly that this body couldn't walk. Yeah, I can see plenty. <gasps> Hello. Now what? Look here. Papers stuffed in his coat pocket. Nonsense. Well, here they are. Here's the copy of the will, and here's a sealed envelope. Sealed envelope? Yeah. Says, to whom it may concern in case of my death. Oh, oh see here, Captain. Uh, it looks like our dead friend here walked in, knocked us out, and raided the safe hall. Right? Got this far in making a getaway and collapsed. Oh, rubbish, man. Okay, Doctor, then you explain it. I, I don't pretend to. What are you going to do with that will and the letter? Hang on to them until we get back to the cottage. I have a hunch that everybody's going to be interested in them. Mm, undoubtedly. So look here. I've got more than I expected already out of this place. I'll leave the rest until later. Anxious to get over to Walter's house, hmm? As a matter of fact, I am. Let's go. Oh, what about Doc Sims' body here? We'll put him on the lounge in the study and lock him in. 
Aren't you afraid he'd walk off again? I think I can take care of that. <laughs> oh. We'll not only lock him in, but we'll tie him down. That ought to hold him. <laughs> now, come on. Come on, give me a hand. You ready? Mm. All right. Up we go. All right. <sighs> it's the third time I've had to play ambulance for this bird. It's going to be the last. Uh, uh, this way you want him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're down now. Yeah. yeah. I saw a piece of cord around his... Oh, here it is. Tie his feet together and round underneath the lounge. Uh, grab the other end, Doctor. Jove, Captain. You're not serious. You think not? Put a half hitch on the leg of the lounge. But see here, my dear chap, you're losing your perspective. Yeah. I suppose you're politely telling me that I'll get the royal raspberries from the gang in the Hall of Justice over in the city if they saw me hog-tying a dead body. Well, right? it is rather ridiculous. Not in this case, it isn't. Doc Sims is dead, and he's simply got to quit prowling around. I'm constable of Holman now. And I say it's against the law of what's right and decent for a dead man to go gallivanting around. Have fun and hold earnest, eh? <laughs> Something like that, Doctor. Yeah, yeah. How's that? I've never seen a more thorough job of trussing. Okay, then let's get going. Is there a key in the door? Yes. Good. Well, we're through here. Go ahead, I'll lock up. The villagers ever got wind of this prowling of the dead business? There'd be one swell hullabaloo. Yeah, but what about the father of the murdered half-wit boy? Didn't you tell him that this that his son's body had disappeared from the morgue? No. I intimated that he'd feel a lot better if he didn't go to the morgue until it was necessary, and he took the hint. I see. There's another thing. We don't find the Hartley boy's body before the inquest tomorrow morning. It's going to be very embarrassing. Mm -hmm. In that case, it seems to me we'll have to give them the whole story. Yeah, which is what I don't want to do. Unless the village knows about what's going on, the easier it's going to be to work. Go ahead, Doctor. Let's get outside. Whew. My word, what a musty hole. Didn't realize it until we got out in the fresh air. Uh, just a minute while I lock up. Yeah, there. Now, Andrew Walter's place. Mm, it will be interesting. Man? Why? Mm. Isn't it said that a man who hangs himself leaves his phantom self behind to stalk the death chamber? <laughs> Captain Friday and Dr. Croft have tied the wandering body of Doc Sims to a lounge in the old Sims house. After the dead body apparently had made a murder attempt on both the captain and the boy Stanley. Just now the two have locked up the house and with certain private papers from the Sims safe in his pocket, Captain Friday is leading the way to the second murder house, Andrew Walter's house, where last night he had hanged himself. I have a hunch we'll find plenty of answers to our questions in Walter's papers. Watch it, Captain. We seem to have Andres with us. Ah, senors. I thought he'd be along. Please, senors, if you go to my Uncle Andrew Walter's home, I wish to go with you, huh? All right, come along, Andres. Feeling better after your catnap, huh? Oh, see, si. I am very much refreshed. The street's still empty. Mass meeting must still be in session. See, si. I go by town hall. Everybody, very much excitement. Talk, talk. Very bad. Bad? See, si, everybody mm. very much mad. I think it'd be very bad for a guilty man if they find him. Yeah? <laughs> so you don't mean those old mossbacks have gotten themselves worked up for mob action? I do not know, senor. It make me afraid to hear them. Oh, what do you know about that, doctor? <laughs> As coroner and constable, looks like we'll have our hands full. Mm. Andres, are you sure you're not overstating matters? Oh, no, doctor. No, it is as I say. Uh, here's Andrew Waller's place. Shouldn't have to spend much time here. Let's take a quick look, see, and then go back to the cottage and look over the spoils. Spoils? Yeah, the papers. All right, step in. Oh, uh, uh, by the way, Andres, young Stanley's all right, I suppose. No, no, he feels very bad. Carmel and Mr. Stanley's sister, they put him to bed on the lounge in the front room. Mm, he'll be well taken care of. Two solicitors, young women? <laughs> there is no need for Carmel to bathe his head, I do not think. <laughs> Bathing his head, eh? That irks you. Hi, Andres. Come here. Uh, see, si, Senor Capitan. Now look here. You say you held a long conversation with Andrew Wallace last night, just before you left to meet Carmel at the train. See, si, this is correct. Where were you? 
Here in this living room? Uh, this is it. What did you talk about? Well, he tell me how very happy he was to have Caramel and me with him. Mm. He said how he had been very lonely in ten years he had been in this place by himself. Yeah? I was glad, huh? Didn't seem depressed or despondent? Oh, no, no, senor. Very happy. When I left, he said, Well, bless you, my son. He said this, and then he said, If Carmel, she is as agreeable as you, we will be very happy household. Mm. Those were his last words to you, hmm? See. Si. And then, when you'd left, he went upstairs and hanged himself. What do you make of that, Dr. Croft? Well, doesn't make sense, Captain. Something's goofy, all right. So look here, Andres. Where does your uncle keep his private papers? Uh, in this desk here. He have a small iron-bound box. Yeah. I know all about it, huh? Well, when I come, he show me his will. And then I see him open up this uh, bottom drawer where he keep the box. Mm. Mm. You've uh, seen his will, then? Oh, for certain, man. What did it say? According to his will, he have give half of everything he have to Carmel, and the other half he have give to me. Did he say how much? Mm, maybe two, three hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Besides all this property, of which there is maybe one thousand acres. Two or three hundred thousand dollars in the bank? You mean cash? Si, senor capitan. Uh, he tell me he's afraid of investments. Mm. Well, we'll see if we can find that will. You say it's the bottom drawer? See. Si. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's the iron box, all right. Mm -hmm. It will lift right out, you see. Uh, yeah. It's got a combination lock on it. See, si. uh, there is a little black book in the top drawer. The little drawer there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the combination is in it. It is, huh? Mm. Yeah, just a lot of junk in here. Oh, wait a minute. This might be it. Dr. Croft, will you try the lock as I read the numbers off? Yes. Begin at seven. Seven. And then to three. Mm. Three. Back to nine. Nine. All right, now. Clear back to one. And that's it. Yes, that's it. It's open. Mm. Not much in it. Oh, there. There it is in that heavy envelope. Yeah? Yes, yes. Here's the will. <laughs> I'm getting quite a collection of papers. Oh, but, senor, this will... Well, this will, it belongs to Carmel and me. Yeah, there's plenty of time to talk about that one. <gasps> Listen. What you say? Shh. Somebody coming into the house. Jove. They say a murderer always returns to the scene of his crime. Why do you think it's the killer? But who else? At least we can surprise them. Nobody knows we're here. Captain Friday! Captain Friday, are you in here? Oh, it's Gail Stanley. What's she doing here? Yeah, you two wait here. Miss Stanley, we're in here. My cousin Carmel is with her. Wait, stay here. Hey, what's going on? Come on in here. Now, you too, Stanley. Captain Friday, we had to leave. The whole village is down at your cottage. Oh, it's a trouble. Oh, please, please do something. Carmel, what is it? I tell you, Captain, they would have hanged us. Oh, you should have hey, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute now. My word, it can't be that bad. Oh, but it is, it is. Now, wait a minute. Stanley, you do the talk and the rest of you keep quiet. Well, it was horrible. The first we knew, 20 or 30 people were in front of the cottage. They were yelling and throwing things. What's that? Throwing things at my house? Yes, and when I went to the door, somebody threw something and hit me in the face. Well, I slammed the door as quickly as I could. And By Jove. An old-fashioned mob, eh? Oh, and they called us names and kept yelling to bring out Andres. What? They called for me? Oh, I'm a son of a gun. Yes, and then we ran to the back of the house and crawled out the bedroom window and got away without them seeing mm, us. Jolly little party. Uh, Martin thought you'd be over here, and that's why we came. What do they want Andres for? Maybe... Maybe they think I kill all these people. Uh, just like those old mossbacks. They get screwy ideas sometimes. <laughs> well, Captain... What are you going to do about it? Remember, you had yourself elected constable this morning. Yeah, and I'm going to do plenty. Oh, crazy nitwits. I knew things would be popping, but I didn't expect anything like this. Mm. <laughs> Looks like they got themselves pretty well steamed up at their own town meeting. Yeah, a couple of big mouths probably got up and gave them fire and brimstone. White. Oh, see here, what are you up to? I'm going to go out and clean them up. Buckle my gun out in plain sight. That'll bring them down to earth. Like company? Okay, if you want to come along. Enjoy it immensely. Now, come on, then. The rest of you stay here till we get back. Please, do you think it's safe? There's nothing to worry about. Now, Stanley, you and Andres take care of the girls. Oh, Andres. Everything's so awful. Oh, please. Please, you must not be frightened. 
If there is danger, I will not let it hurt you. Martin, lie down, please. You're so sick. Looks like we came to Holman for our own funerals instead of putting Dr. Sims in the ground. Oh, please, Martin, don't be so morbid. Fine business getting shot at by my own uncle. Dead uncle at that. Oh, it's the most terrible thing I ever heard of. You... You don't think Captain Friday and Dr. Croft let anything happen to us, do you? What can they do? Didn't the thing that shot at me knock out Captain Friday? Well, me, I think the Capitan will do plenty. Rod, he's in the same boat with the rest of us. But they have the whole village turned against us. We're not only fighting something we don't know about, but the village, too. But they're so brave. They'll fix everything. Oh, please, my cousin, you do not worry. Huh? Huh. Personally, I'm going to keep my eyes on those fellas. You know what they're planning to do, Gail? Martin, you shouldn't talk that way about them. Yeah, well, they're looking for Dr. Sims' will. Captain Friday said he was going to hang on to it, too, if he found it. Well, he has my uncle's will, too. I do not think he will do anything bad with it. Well, you got a lot more faith in him than I have. Martin, what in the world are you talking about? Captain Friday's an old-timer here. He's got the lay of the ground. We haven't. But I don't see... There's a lot of money involved in this thing. What's to keep him from grabbing it off? I tell you, he's slick. Oh, don't be absurd. How could he? And even if there were no wills, the Lord would see that we got what was ours. Yeah? How do you know what angles he may have? Well, I do not think so. I don't care what you think. Mighty funny the way he and this Croft guy took us in, keeping us where they have an eye on us. Only telling us what they want us to know. You mustn't say that about Dr. Croft. I like him. Oh, I'd like to know something about him myself. Well, if Captain Friday say he is all right, that is all I care. Bunk. Oh, I don't know what to do. Besides, it seems to me if you wish to not stay at the senor's home, you do not need to. Why you don't go about your own business? Go out and get torn to pieces by that fool mob? Well, then, it seems to me if you accept the Captain's protection, you should not say this sort of thing about him. Preaching, huh? If you wish to call it that. Ah, you make me sick. You stop talking about Andres like that. Ah, pipe down, kid. Martin. This is enough. I do not care if you are hurt. You'll say one more little thing like this to my cousin. Oh, for the love of mine. And if you wish to speak with me in future, you please to change the tone in your voice. I think you deserve that, Martin. Oh, please, we mustn't quarrel. Everything will be all right if we just keep... All right, here we are. The war's over. They, they didn't hurt you. <laughs> do I look hurt? But where's Dr. Croft? I sent him over to Doc Sims' house to check on things. What right does he have over there? Uh-oh. What's the matter with you, Stanley? Uh, he's always irritable when he isn't feeling well. Oh, cut it out, Gail. I want to know what business Dr. Croft has in my uncle's house alone. Well, if you must know, we found Doc Sims' body sprawled on the stairs over there. Oh, Doc Sims. Oh, no. Yeah. And we locked it in the study. I asked him to drop in and see that it was all right before coming back. The, the body of my uncle? That's what I said. Was he dead? You never saw a deader body. But, but I saw him. I saw him. I saw him raise the gun and shoot me. Yeah, well, you haven't got anything on me. Just the same, we found him stone dead. Please, things like that can happen in the convent. They taught yes, us that Yes, yes, you... I know. But see here, the moment we're in Andrew Walter's house, you're all to come upstairs. We'll take a look at the room where he hanged himself. Please, do I have to go? I'm afraid so, Carmel. Oh, no. Uh, just for a moment. Just to point out the place where you first saw the body. Uh, please, senor. I could do that. It'll be necessary for both of you to go. But not Martin and me. No, if you two would rather wait in here alone. Oh, yes, please. Okay. Dr. Croft will be over any minute now. Found the body of that half-wit Hartley boy yet? Please, why did you have to say that? Just wondered. Oh, cut it out, Stanley. You know Carmel's uneasy about visiting that room upstairs. Well, come on, let's get it over. Please close the door when you go out. The last time I was on these stairs... Oh, please, Colonel, you do not think about it. Just hang on to me, huh? But they're so dark. You coming? Uh, si, senor. We're almost behind you. I'd rather not go in. No, you will be brave for Andres, huh? All right, right in here. Mm, plenty of daylight in this room. Just the stairway in the halls that are dark. Please take me away from here. Now then, the body was lying on the cot, was it, Andres? Uh, si, senor. Uh -huh. uh, but where is the cot? Oh, we used it to carry the body to the morgue. Just where was the cot sitting when you saw it? Uh, over there against the wall, just to the left of this window. All right, Carmel? Yes. Yes, let's go away. Look out, Captain! Look out! Andres! I'm racing a shot. I've got him, Captain. I've got him. Hang on, Dr. Croft. I'm coming. Where are you, Dr. Croft? At the bottom of the stairs. I'm coming. Rolled down. Rolled all the way down the stairs with him. Get a light, man. 
Lying still. Uh, Must be knocked out. Here's my flash. Look here, Doctor. It's Rich Hartley's half-wit boy. Captain, you mean I roll down those stairs with a dead man in my arms? <laughs> The entire population of the Holman City Morgue, for some unaccountable reason, appears to be rising up in arms against the living. First, old Doc Sims, dead of natural causes. Then, an attack by Andrew Waters, dead by hanging. And now, finally, the Hartley boy, shot through the heart, has invaded the haunts of living people, apparently in a direct attempt to commit murder. This is the weird and wonderful story of Dead Men Prowl. Chapter 6, entitled Life History of Prowlers, will come to you next week at this same hour. You are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents Dead Men Prowl, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Three men died violent deaths in Holman. Doc Sims, Andrew Waters, and Rich Hartley's half-wit son. These tragedies brought four young people to the village across the bay from San Francisco. First to arrive were Carmel and Andres Ruiz, cousins. They were niece and nephew of Andrew Waters. Then came Gail Stanley and her brother Martin, niece and nephew of Doc Sims. Captain Friday, who had a summer home in Holman, took the four under his wing. And with the aid of his weekend guest, Dr. Jamie Croft, endeavored to untangle the mystery behind the three murders. But let Captain Friday tell it. Each of the three bodies in the village morgue has taken it upon itself to prowl around or disappear altogether from time to time. When Dr. Croft, young Martin Stanley, and I searched Doc Sims' house, two of the bodies were missing. That of Doc Sims and that of the half-wit Hartley boy. Doc Sims' body was found after an attempt was made to murder Stanley. I tied Doc Sims' body on a sleeping cot and locked it in a room. Next, we searched Andy Walter's house. Along with Carmel and Andres Ruiz, I was upstairs in the room where Andrew Walters died. Gail and Martin Stanley were waiting downstairs. Dr. Croft had left the house to examine Doc Sims' body. Suddenly, there was a warning cry, the sound of a shot and two figures hurtled and rolled down the full length of the stairway. A few minutes later, Captain Friday had gathered the entire group in the living room of his summer cottage. Now, look here. I want everyone to stick close to my cottage from now on. No one's to go near Doc Sims or Andy Walter's house without my permission. Is that clear? See, si, Senor Friday. Uh, but please, could we not have more fire? See how my cousin Carmel, she is shake. No, I'm not cold. Just that I can't forget that you might have been killed, Andre. Oh, Oh, it is nothing. It did not hit me. And see here, Captain, I suggest we stir up the fire and all gather around and talk this thing out. I'll admit I'm pretty badly shaking myself, rolling down those stairs with a murdered man in my arms. Boo. Okay, come on, Andres. We'll go out and bring in a couple of big chunks of rootwood. I thought we'd get sunshine today, but the fog seems to be hanging on. It's almost like night. It's so foggy. See here, Miss Stanley, what's wrong with you? You haven't said a word since we left Andrew Walter's house and returned here. White as a ghost. What is it? Well, it's... It's all pretty terrible, isn't it? Terrible? Of course, it's bad, but you're making entirely too much of it. Well, I didn't realize what we were up against, Dr. Croft, until... Until I saw the stark, dead body of that murdered Hartley boy lying there. Oh, it was bad. I didn't realize until I saw his dead body and... And knew that somehow it had come alive. That that dead body had held a gun and... Tried to kill one of us. Well, now you know how I felt, sis, when Doc Sims, my own uncle, took a shot at me. Yes, I know, Martin. I'm getting sick of it. 
There's no use of us standing around and getting our head shot off. Let's go back to the city and hire a lawyer to clear up this mess. But, Martin, we haven't any money to hire a lawyer. We could borrow on Doc Sims' estate, I'll bet. After all, it's ours. I'm afraid you won't be able to leave Holman without Captain Friday's permission. Nuts to Captain Friday. Well, I suggest you talk to him. Here he comes now. Can we get through the door with it? Attaboy, Andres. Oh, this is fine, big stump of wood. All right. Got a good hold? See? Now let's toss it in the fireplace. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. <sighs> Yeah. yeah, there she goes. Yeah. There's your fire, Dr. Croft. Now then, is everybody settled for a talk? Before we begin, Captain, I think young Stanley here has a question. Yeah? Gail and I are going back to San Francisco and get a lawyer to take care of this. No, you're not, Stanley. Who's going to stop us? I am. I happen to be Constable of Holman now, and I'm holding all of you until we can get this thing cleared up. You haven't any right. We'll all be killed. Somebody's tried twice now. Now, look here, Stanley. This goes all for the rest of you. I suggest you forget about pulling out for a while and sit and listen. I've been looking over these papers we picked up at Doc Sims and Walter's houses. But first, I want to ask some questions. What questions? Before this last attack, let's just review where each of us was. Now, Dr. Croft here dropped in at Doc Sims' house down the street to see how the trussed-up body was doing. You see it, Doctor? It was just as we left it, Captain, still tied to the cot. Right. Now... Miss Stanley here and her brother were in Andrew Walter's study. You asked to be allowed to stay there while the rest of us went up to examine the death room. Yes, that's right. Stayed downstairs at your own request. Well, you remember I told you I couldn't bear the side of the room where a man was hanged. Yes, I remember. Well, you two were in the study on the first floor. Carmel and Andres here and I went up to the second floor. We just started to examine the room when we heard Dr. Croft yell... What was it you yelled, Doctor? I... I think I said, uh, look out, Captain, look out. Yeah, the next minute there was a shot. See, so close to me I feel the air. It caught my face like sharp knife. Close one, all right, Andres. And then the next thing we knew, Dr. Croft and a second person were rolling down the dark stairway together. I rushed down, and there was the doctor hanging onto the body of the murdered halfwit, the Hartley boy. I'd never go in that house again for anything. But look here, Doctor... How did you happen to take that tumble downstairs? What happened? I don't know. As soon as I'd seen that Doc Sim's body was safe, I locked up and I came right over to join you at the Walters house. I let myself in, and everything was quiet on the first floor. Yes, we had the door to the study closed. We were just sitting there waiting. Yes, I heard voices upstairs and I started up. It was quite dark, and suddenly I saw a figure between me and the doorway. All, all I could see was his outline. And I started to speak when it crouched. It, it was alive? Yes, and I saw the glitter of a gun. I couldn't see into the room, but he was tense. He was about to fire at someone. Uh, that's when I yelled and I rushed up the stairs at him. Yeah. Did he attack you, Doctor? No, no, I don't think so. He just seemed to, uh, to give way in my hands. You, you see, it all happened so quickly. I grabbed him and... We tumbled downstairs together. And when I opened the study door and saw what was lying at the foot of the stairs... Yes, yes, I know. Any opinions, Doctor? Well, frankly, Captain, I never had such a shock in my life. I don't understand it. There he was in the doorway, apparently alive. And by the time we reached the bottom of the steps, it was the stiff, cold corpse of the murdered Hartley boy. Dr. Croft, if you and I hadn't been friends for the last couple of yes, years... Yes, I know, Captain. I'd say the same. There's something strange in that house. Mm. Well, stranger than what happened in Doc Sims' house. The corpse walks in, takes a shot at Stanley here, and clubs me over the head, walks out under his own power, and then once out of our sight, he collapses into nothing more than a corpse. Did you find Doc Sims' will? Yes, I have it here. Where was it? In the coat pocket of the corpse. But how He'd did... evidently come alive long enough to take it away from us, and then he fell dead on his way to hide it. I don't believe it. Well, I don't either. What else are you going to believe? Captain, in all the history of medicine, this situation has no precedent. Bodies simply do not repossess themselves of life once they become dead flesh. Uh -huh. That's what I thought, too. Captain, now, since you have in your possession the wills of Sims and Walters, it appears to me that if they contain any information concerning this business... Now is the time to bring them out. There's plenty in them, all right. Plenty to give everybody a joke. There, 
There is something bad? I'll let you decide that for yourself. Before I read the wills, though, I'm going to read a copy of a letter that Doc Sim sent to Andrew Walters shortly before Walters hanged himself. How long before, we don't know. Uh, Dr. Croft and Martin Stanley have already heard it. Let's see, um... <clears throat> Andrew Walters, this is to inform you that I, Dr. C.N. Sims have discovered your real identity as well as enough of your background and history to make your presence in this community undesirable. Unless you are willing to come to such terms as I see fit to impose, I shall at once reveal your identity and turn you over to the proper authorities, which, of course, you realize means nothing less than the gas chamber. It is not true. My uncle Andrew Walters is a good man. This letter is big lie. Now, hang on to yourself, Andres. If this Doc Sims man was alive, I would make him eat these words. Yeah, well, maybe you would, but sit down and hear the rest. Oh, why would they want to execute our uncle? Sounds like murder. Oh, he wouldn't. He didn't. Well, I didn't know that Doc Sims and Mr. Waters were enemies. So, uh, looks like we inherit some kind of a fight. Well, you would be borrowing trouble, Stanley. Please. We aren't going to be enemies. Oh, of course not, Carmel. The fight ended with our uncle's death. Maybe it did and maybe it didn't. Let's wait until we hear the whole story. First, I'm going to read Doc Sims' will. Short. All it says is, Believing that I shall outlive my only sister, Gail Sims Stanley, I hereby do on this day bequeath all my personal and business property in equal parts to my niece, Gail Stanley, and my nephew, Martin Stanley. That's all except for the date. Well, that's something like it. Nothing hard to understand about that. Well, that's not the whole story. Wait until you hear what Andrew Walters has to say in his will. Okay, but what's that got to do with Gail and May? Plenty. See here, Captain. Is all that his will? That's right. <laughs> Thought he was writing a book. It's his personal history. You read it? Mm-hmm. Then why not tell us the gist of it? We can each read the details at our leisure. That's a good idea. That suits you, Carmel? Oh, yes, of course. How about it, Andres? Please, you do what you wish. Okay. Well, this is how it is. Andy Waters and Doc Sims were brothers. Brothers? Oh, <laughs> then you mean to say we four are cousins? That's right. But they do not see how it is say, possible. Say, how do you get that way? How could a guy named Sims and one named Walters be brothers? Because Andrew Walters is an assumed name. I don't believe it. You will when I finish. <laughs> Sounds like a most engaging tale. Yeah. You see, according to Walters' story, there was quite a big family of Sims originally. There were three sisters. First, Bonnie Sims. See, my mother... That was her maiden name. Yes. And then came Gail, for whom you were named as Stanley, and Joyce, Carmel's mother. But what about the brothers, Captain? Well, here's the angle. Doc Sims was the eldest. Then came his brother, Andy Walters. His right name was Vance Sims. But uh, see here, Captain, why did Vance Sims change his name to Andrew Walters? Now, just a moment, Doctor. That concerns another member of the family. Another, eh? Mm-hmm. Another boy... Franklin Sims. Oh, three boys and three girls. Well, what happened to him? He was murdered Mur 20 years ago. Another murder in the family? Santa Maria! Is the whole family to be wiped out? <laughs> On the barren coast of Marin County in the village of Holman... Under a blanket of fog sits Captain Friday's summer cottage. In the cottage is being unfolded the story of the Sims family. A story beginning generations ago and today having its tragic effect on the living members. Captain Friday has just revealed that the two rich men of Holman, Doc Sims and Andrew Waters, were brothers. And therefore, Gail and Martin Stanley and Andres and Carmel Ruiz are cousins. Yes, there was still another member of the family, another brother named Franklin Sims. Three brothers and three sisters. Oh, well, what happened to him? He was murdered 20 years ago. Oh, well, who did it? Remember that letter I read to you at the beginning from Doc Sims to Walters? Something about, I shall reveal your true identity and turn you over to the proper authorities. Andrew, oh, please. Oh, Our Uncle Andrew did not kill his own brother. Well, it happened in a peculiar way. You see, the three boys were on a sort of vacation together someplace in the Near East. Doc Sims was about 37 at the time. Walter's around 35, and Franklin was only about, oh, 22 or 3. Quite a difference in ages, Captain. Yes, well, there were the three girls in between, you know. Yes. Anyway, the three of them were in this little corner of the world when they got word that their father was dying, and he'd left the bulk of his fortune to Franklin. Why, how unfair. 
Well, Franklin was the fair-haired child. Anyway, according to the story in Andrew Walter's will here, he and Doc Sims went out and got thoroughly drunk. When he came to the next morning, he was in a filthy jail charged with the murder of his brother, Franklin Sims. Oh, but this is the most horrible thing to happen. The next day, the father died. Sort of left things pretty neat for Doc Sims. One brother dead, and the other, Andrew Walters, had held for murder. But didn't Doc Sims help his brother? No, no, he turned against him. Left him to his fate. He came back to the United States and got himself appointed administrator for the entire estate. A ah, charming fellow. Well, I don't blame him. A fellow that would murder his own brother. But uh, what became of Mr. Mr. Walters? He broke jail and became a fugitive. Oh, Andres, I guess we haven't a very nice family after all. You know what I think? I think these Doc Seams' hands are not very clean. What do you mean by that? Well, I think maybe he knows more about Franklin's death. You than would not... think of that. But, but how did he happen to come back here? Didn't Doc Sims recognize him? Well, remember, that was 20 years ago. Walter says in his will that he made his way to Australia and under his assumed name went into the mining country. He made several rich strikes and finally, after about 10 years, came out a rich man. A rich man, eh? Mm-hmm. Plenty of money, but old and broken down. Nobody would have recognized him for the fugitive, Vance Sims. Well, then he came back unrecognized. Huh? Yes. He worked a, a slick trick. The slickest I've heard in a long time. He wrote a deathbed testimonial under his own name of Vance Sims. He declared that during the ten years he'd spent in the mines, he and his own alias, Andrew Walters, had been partners. And now that he was about to die, he desired that Walters should inherit everything that had been his. You see, this included his portion of the original Sims estate, which, through his office as administrator, Doc Sims was milking for himself. In other words, Vance Sims left everything to himself, as Andrew Walters. Oh, now I begin to understand why Doc Sims was so unfriendly to us. He was cheating Mother out of her third of the estate. Uh, she was supposed to have a third after Franklin was killed, wasn't she? Yes, she was. Doc Sims tricked her out of it. Why, the you low... You don't think much of him now, do you, Stanley? Hmm? Uh, leave me alone. But see here, Captain. What did Van Sims do then? After he willed his property to Andrew Walters, his uh, other self. He grabbed a ship for San Francisco and came over here to Holman with the documents and stuck him in Doc Sims' face. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> yes. Doc Sims almost frothed. He was mad and scared. His conscience was bothering him about the way he'd been administrating the estate. Besides, he couldn't forget that he'd beaten his sister out of her third. <laughs> he was in a bad spot, wasn't he? Walters had him, and there wasn't anything for him to do but turn over Vance Sims' portion without a squawk. <laughs> but no wonder they were enemies. Yeah. Wonder they lived in the same neighborhood ten years without the lid blowing off. Well, still, I don't understand. What made Doc Sims write that note threatening to turn Mr. Walters over to the police? And after all these years? Oh, that's easy. Doc Sims was burned up about the whole business. He suspected there was something smelly about the affair, so he kept nosing around, writing letters to Australia, and keeping his eyes and ears open. And finally, he got the straight dope on Walters. Mm, discovered he was really his brother, eh? Mm-hmm. And wanted for murder. And then Doc Sims wrote that note threatening Andrew Walters, the one you read to us. That's right. You think then, Captain, that upon receiving the note from Doc Sims, Walters went to his room and hanged himself? That's what it looks like. Trapped after all these years of safety, you know how you'd feel. Settle down to spend the rest of your life in peace and quiet, and then suddenly find yourself facing the gas chamber. Please, I can't bear to think of it. Oh, it is deplorable. The thing I can't figure out is, if Walters hanged himself, who cut him down? Well, somebody else was in on this thing. You don't suppose Doc Sims cut him down before going out on the beach to oh, die, do you? Could have done it, but why? Please, please... I have a confession. Andres, you didn't... Conscience bothering, huh? All right, Andres, out with it. Please, you will try to understand why I have not told this before. I... Well, what's on your mind? Did you kill Andy Walters? No, 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 no I did not do that. Well, you've got something on your conscience. No, no, I will explain. When Carmel and I left you on the beach, we come to the house. My uncle was not in the study, so I leave Carmel alone, and I go upstairs to find him. Yeah, and then what? There... There I see my uncle hanging... Oh, that's it, huh? See, I am very much disturbed. I think maybe I can save him. I cut him down quick and... And then I see he is dead. And then what'd you do? Well, then... Then I remember that I am his heir. And, and maybe somebody will think... Will think maybe I... Yeah, afraid of being I... held for murder, so you kept your mouth shut. Please, if I have been very wrong, I am sorry. What do you think, Dr. Croft? 
Mm, obviously, the lad's telling the truth, Captain. Oh, please, and you're my gratitude. Okay, Andres, we'll take your word for it. For now, anyway. Oh, thank you, Captain Friday. Yeah, well, there you are. You four are cousins, Doc Sims and Andrew Walters' brothers. Walters hanged himself in despair. That much is cleared up, anyway. Yeah, but what's that got to do with Doc Sims' dead body taking a pot shot at me? And the prowling body of the village halfwit trying to kill Andres? Now, now, wait a minute. I didn't say I had a complete solution. Well, we don't even know who killed the halfwit, nor why the body of Andrew Walters, alias Vance Sims, came over here and tried to bury Gale alive. Oh, please. All I can see right now is that it looks like all the dead bodies in the neighborhood have conspired to get rid of you for. Oh, please don't talk like that. At the convent, they always told us there was something sacred about... about being dead. You're quite right, Carmel. You mustn't judge normal living and dying by what is taking place here in Holman. But, senor, you have told us only the history of Andrew Walters. Now, does he not will his property to anyone? Yeah, yeah I'll read that part. It's short. Uh, let's see. What... Oh, here it is. Appreciating the fact that my two sisters were unjustly cut off from the family by their marriages... I should like to recompense them if they are still alive or their heirs if they are not by equally dividing my entire estate between them. Oh, my cousin, do you hear? Carmel, you are rich. Lands, money. Oh, you will have everything oh, you Oh, wait wish. a minute, Andres. There's a little more. Now listen. I wittingly leave the Stanley branch of the family out of my will, not from any antagonism, but because I know that Doc Sims is leaving everything to them to soothe his conscience for having robbed Gail of her third of the original estate. Fine bunch of dog robbers in our family. Oh, if it'd only end here. Dr. Croft, you realize we don't know yet whether Doc Sims died naturally or whether he was murdered? True. The body... Yes, has... yes, I know. The body hasn't stayed in one place long enough for us to perform an autopsy. Well, the fact is, I'm not certain I'd be justified in performing an autopsy on anything as much alive. Oh. Well, look here, it's at... Well, it's after one o'clock. Aren't you folks ready for lunch? Well, I'm afraid I'm not. Well, I am. Sure, sure. Everybody will be when they smell food. And, Miss Stanley, how about you and Carmel poking around the groceries and knocking together a hot lunch? Feel up to it? Oh, yes. Let's do something. It'll help us forget the bad things. That's the idea. Well, all right. Where will we find things? Well, everything's in the cooler or on the shelves. Just help yourselves. But, Captain Friday, are you going out? Oh, the doctor and I have a little job to attend to. Andres... You and Stanley stick by the house. Don't leave, you understand? See, si, I know. And don't let the girls out of your sight. If you think there's danger... Lay off that stuff, Stanley. If I thought there was any danger, I wouldn't leave you out here on guard. It's daylight, isn't it? But it's so foggy, it's almost like evening. Are you afraid? No. Not if you say it's all right. Oh, sure it's all right. Anybody else afraid? Well, how long will you be gone? Oh, we'll be back by the time you get lunch ready. You're mighty mysterious. Uh, never mind, Stanley. Come on, Doctor. Mine, no. None of you leave the cottage. I say, Captain, I was much mystified as the rest. Yeah? Well, we're going over and get Doc Sims' body and have an examination. Makes a lot of difference whether he died a natural death or was murdered. Well, if he was murdered, it was by poison. I can tell you that much. I want to be certain, Doctor. Besides that... I want to get all these bodies back in the morgue. We've got an inquest tomorrow morning, and I don't intend to chase the coroner's jury all over the country looking for bodies. Oh, quite. We'll take Doc Sims to the morgue first. He's closest. You know, there's a refrigeration chamber in the cellar below ground. Is there really? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to bind all three bodies and stick them down there for tonight. There's no windows, and you can bar the one door from the outside. If that doesn't hold them, nothing will. <laughs> refrigeration, eh? They'll put in a pretty cold night, don't you think, Captain? Yeah. Oh, hold it. Well, here's Doc Sims' place. Why, so it is. You know, the fog's so thick, it's changed the whole appearance of the vicinity. Mm. Oh, come on in, Doctor. Oh, you've still got the key to the study, haven't you? Yes. Blasted dark in this hallway. Wait until I switch on the lights. Yeah, there. Now, I'll just... Dr. Croft... Look at this. What's happened? Look, door's busted open, splintered to pieces. Door smashed? Yeah, from the inside. Door smashed open from the inside? What about Doc Sims' body? Oh, wait till I get the light. Look. Look at that. See here, Captain. 
This thing's superhuman. It's it's not possible. Body's gone. Look at those ropes. Broken, snapped in two. No human thing could have broken those ropes, Captain. Yeah, but they're broken just the same. Look at those frazzled ends. The corpse appears to have broken them with with his hands, as though they'd been twine. Notice, not a knot untied. A fair chance of us finding Rich Hartley's half-wit boy where we left him if this sort of thing is happening. Shall we go over to the Walters' place and see? I yeah, suppose so. Nothing we can do here. Are you taking those ropes with you? Uh-huh. I want to examine them. Come on. Captain... You know, there was a time when people believed that devils could enter a dead body at will. And of course you know that these unearthly beings were endowed with unlimited strength. I guess i better lock up. Although locks don't seem to mean much around here. Uh, you're interested in this devil theory. I'm not, Doctor. I'll bet money that when we get to the bottom of this, there'll be some doggone simple explanation that'll make me blush to think I overlooked it. Uh, undoubtedly, you're right. Say, Captain... Doc Sim's house was locked up just as I left it. Well? Oh, do you suppose we should have searched for the body? You know, it may still be there. Well, it hasn't escaped before now. It's because it hasn't wanted to. Yes, I suppose so. We'll take a look when we go back. Well, Andrew Walter's front door is still intact. The half-wit's broken out of this house. It wasn't by this door. Go ahead, Doctor. Oh, we should have stopped in at the mall and bought a stretch of the lawn. Snap on the light, will you? Ah, oh, nothing's disturbed. Mm. Closet door still locked, all right. Just a minute till I get the right key here. Now, if I remember rightly, you use that long, plain one. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, I'll be a son of a gun. There's a body just as we left. <laughs> Getting to be that ordinary events are more surprising. C- Captain, the body moved. It moved, didn't you see it? What's that? Careful, careful. Don't bend over it like yes, that. Yes, I'm watching. Captain... Captain, behind you, behind you! Hey, what's going on here? As Dr. Croft and Captain Friday bent over the corpse of the half-wit body, the diabolical force loose in the village of Holman crept up stealthily from behind. But what is that force? Who is it who animates the dead and strikes with such deadly effect? Episode 7 of Dead Men Prowl, entitled Four Go to Join the Prowling Dead, will come to you next week at this same hour. You are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... Dead Men Prowl, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. The terror which has been spread over the village of Holman by the apparent uprising of three dead men has reached a new climax. The corpse of old Doc Sims has struck twice. The body of the dead Andrew Walters has attempted a murder of its own. And the body of the murdered half-wit boy has shown all the activity of an inspired spirit of evil. Captain Friday and Dr. Jamie Croft thought at one time today that they had all the corpses corralled and under control. And then everything broke loose. Let the captain tell you. Dr. Croft and I tied the dead body of Doc Sims to a sofa and locked it in the study of his own house. We recaptured the corpse of the murdered half-wit Hartley boy and locked it in a closet at the Andrew Walters house. Walters' body was supposed to be in the morgue. The excitement of the prowling dead had upset the four young people. They were the cousins, Carmel and Andres Ruiz, and the brother and sister, Gail and Martin Stanley. Well, when we had quieted them down and established them in my cottage, Dr. Croft and I returned to examine Doc Sims' body. To our amazement, we found the study door smashed down from the inside and the corpse of Doc Sims gone. The ropes that had bound him were lying on the floor, snapped and broken as though by superhuman strength. 
From there, they rushed up the street to Andrew Walter's house, expecting to find the murdered half witch body also gone, but it was still locked in the closet. Captain Friday bent over the body when suddenly Dr. Croft yelled a warning, and then there was the crash of wood on skull and a deep void of blackness. Doctor. Dr. Croft. What's happened? It's so blame dark. Mm. Oh, where am I? What's happened? Dr. Croft, is that you? Captain Friday? Are you hurt? It's so dark, I can't see a thing. Uh, I was knocked out. What makes it so dark? Uh, we're locked in some kind of a closet. Locked in? Are you badly hurt? No, it's just my head. Oh, it feels like it's bursting. Yeah, same here. Captain, what happened to us? I don't know any more than you do. I was bending over the body of the Hartley boy. Last I remember was you yelling, look behind your captain. What did you see, doctor? That's right. Now I remember. I, I, I saw something creeping up behind us. I just caught a glimpse out of the corner of my eye when something hit me. And I, I tried to warn you. Oh, looks like we were hit over the head and shoved into the same closet we had the half-wit's body locked in. Uh, yeah, about the same size. Are you sure we're locked in? Well, haven't tried the door, but if anybody would take the trouble to dump us in, they'd certainly lock the door. I suppose so. Oh, feeling the way I do, I don't seem to care much. Well, feeling the way I do, I care a lot. Oh, I think I can stand. Uh, oh, yeah, I can stand, but that's about all. Ooh, wobbly. Eh, we're locked in all right. Well, we don't seem to have hung on to the bodies of either Doc Sims or the half-wit in spite of our precaution. Eh, it's a funny business, Doctor. You'd think anybody with a brain could corral and hang on to two or three corpses. Think you can stand up, Doctor? Perhaps, if there's any necessity. There's plenty of necessity. Come on. We're going to get out of here. We are? Sure. You don't want to grow old in here, do you? No, but I don't. All right, come on, then. I... We're going to smash in the door. Oh, there's scarcely room to move. Well, we can brace our feet against the back wall and push. You think it can be done? Oh, why not? It's a pine door. We can't break the lock, we can break through a panel. Uh, let's try it by all means. Now, wait a minute. Let me take a crack at it with my shoulder first. <laughs> yeah, sure, she'll give. Felt her bulge. Now, Doctor, you put your shoulder against it here. Brace your feet against the wall. And push with all you've got in you. I'm going to lay into it with my shoulder. You know where I'm going to light when it does give, don't you? Yeah, that's all right. You've got good padding there. Ready? All ready. Now! <laughs> Felt it give, Captain. Uh, we'll get it. Yeah. Uh, it's giving, Captain. It's giving. Uh -huh. Now, once more. Yeah. Look out, Doctor. Oh. Head over heels. What did I tell you? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to have had a picture of you. Yeah. Just the same. We're free, and that's most important. Uh, well, maybe... Well, the boy's body's gone, all right. Everything mm. in the room's just as we left it. Yes. Well, I'm a son of a gun. Now what? Look at a clock. We've been laid out in that closet two hours. Joe, we must have been given some potent knockout drops. Two hours? Those kids we left at my cottage will be scared silly. Come on, let's get over to them double quick. I hope they haven't been foolish enough to go looking for us. Uh, cut across the lot here. Now, we told them we'd be back for lunch. They'll know something went haywire. Uh. We warned them explicitly, though, uh, not to leave the cottage. My eye, Captain, you, you've got me doing a dog trot and the way I feel. Yeah, Ooh. and I'm worried. Uh, hey, look, there's a light in the front room of the cottage. Oh, God. Well, that means someone's there. Anyway, uh -huh. that Andres Ruiz boy he seems to have a pretty level head on him. Yeah, uh, so is Gail Stanley. Mm -hmm. You can't tell what her brother Martin might panic him into doing. Uh, hey, look, but the door's standing wide open. Joe. What's that I smell? Come on, Doctor. Something's wrong. Andres, Carmel. Where is everybody? Something's burning in the kitchen. Yes, uh, definitely from the kitchen. Hey, Dr. Croft, come out here in the kitchen. Yeah. Phew. What's all this smoke? Hey, look. They went away and left things cooking on the fire. Everything's burned to the pan. You turned off the gas? Yeah. Another half hour and the whole house would have been on fire. And with three supposedly dead men prowling around, I don't like it. Great heavens, Captain. You're not suggesting the corpse of one of our three dead men has harmed them. I don't know what to think, but I know one thing. If they went out of their own accord, they'd have slipped on their coats. 
Come on, let's have a look. You're quite right. That should give us a clue. Uh, we'll give their baggage the once over. Hey, doctor, look in the bathroom. My medicine case. Someone must have been hurt. Gauze, cotton, bandages scattered about. Someone rushed in here and grabbed things in a hurry. Doctor, where did you have your medical bag? By the bed in my room. Why? Go and see if it's still there. I don't see what you're getting at, but I'll soon tell you. Might as well have a look for their coats. Eh, I don't get it. Even if they were worried, they wouldn't go searching for us with medicine and bandages. They wouldn't do that unless... Hey, I wonder. Captain? Captain, where are you? In the bedroom, Doctor. I say, Captain, you're right. My medical bag gone with the rest. Yes, sir. Huh? Well, the girls' coats are gone, too. What does it mean? I'd say it means that they left of their own accord. But my medicine case and the emergency supplies from your cabinet. Uh, it doesn't add up. Do you suppose someone of the four was hurt? They may have rushed him to a doctor. The nearest doctor's in Sausalito. Besides, they know you're a medical man. They'd have come hunting us. Yeah, that's quite likely. Besides, they wouldn't take your medical case along. Oh, true. Looks to me like they had some inkling of some accident and rushed out to give first aid. That's it, of course. But, but see here, they wouldn't have dashed off like they did, all four, I mean. One of the boys might have gone, but mm, everything here indicates that they were terribly upset. Exactly how they'd act, Doctor, if... If what? If the accident had occurred to one or both of us. Show, yes. Uh, well, that doesn't make sense either. They couldn't have known we were hit over the head and locked in a closet. Anyway, we didn't need bandages. Mm, it doesn't hold together. See here, Doctor. We've got to get looking for those kids. Yes, of course, but But I... before we can start looking, we've got to figure this thing out as nearly as we can. We, we've, we've got to work on, on some sort of a theory. I haven't the faintest idea of one, though. I have. Supposing someone came to the house and said we were badly hurt. Oh, see here, but... Oh, when, just to put it, Doctor. And... Supposing, supposing they told them we were about to pass out and to grab medical supplies and follow him to a certain place. Show? But, but with what object? Why, to lure him away from the cottage. Captain, I believe you've hit it. Now, this is only a theory. Oh, it's good enough for me. Uh, where do you think we should begin looking? This business is centering around Doc Sims and Andrew Walter's houses. They're both empty. Only ones in the village not lived in. But we just came from Walter's house. Yeah, I know. Oh, come on, we'll go to Sim's place first. Are you armed, Doctor? No. Well, here, take this gun. It's small but effective. But you? Oh, I've got my regular. Come on, Doctor. We haven't had any opportunity to shoot so far, but if my theory's any good, it won't be long. I've never shot a man, Captain. Yeah? It's not so different from sticking a knife in him. Being a surgeon, you've had plenty of that sort of experience. Oh, look here. That's a bit offensive. Confound this fog getting worse and worse. Going to last all day. You know, Doctor, another reason why Doc Sims' place is a good spot to start the hunt is that the kids knew we were going over there. They'd go there without giving it a second thought. Shall we take the path through the vacant lot? Yeah. How's your head now? Huh. So much excitement, I've forgotten all about it. Uh -huh. yeah. Looks like it's going to be pretty skinny pickings for the coroner's jury tomorrow. We only got one of our three corpses to put on exhibition. Going to be rather an unhappy affair, I'm afraid. Yeah, mm -hmm. bad. For the village and its temper, no telling what'll happen. Uh, no more mob scenes, I hope. Uh, not while I'm constable. Say, what's the meaning of that light in the morgue? Light? Yeah. You just see it through the fog. Hey, we might find some answers in the morgue. Don't suppose one of us left the light on, do no, you? No, I don't. Come on, I'm going to have a look. But see here, what about these, those four? They, they may be in bad trouble. Sure, this may be a clue to it. I don't follow you, Captain. You're not used to following hunches, Doctor. That's my meat. Better have your gun handy. Is the door locked? Yeah. Uh, come on in, Doctor. The light's on in the back where the slab is. Yeah, that door's closed. Joe, Captain, it, it's dark in here. Shh. Fairly chills the blood, hmm? Now then, I'm going to open the door. 
You ready? Well, perhaps it's a trap. We've got the Ahmed advantage. We'll be in the dark here. Crouch down lower. Right up. Careful now. There. There's there's no one in there. It doesn't look like it. Come on, let's have a look around. Keep that gun handy, Doctor. Captain. Captain Friday. There's the body of Andrew Walters. What's that? Andy Walters' body gone again? <laughs> this is a great little morgue. Can't get a corpse to stay in it. It isn't decent. <laughs> Not a single corpse to exhibit at our inquest tomorrow. I'm telling you, the minute I lay my hands on that collection of corpses again, I'm going to stick them down in that refrigeration room and freeze them up so solid that... Say, Doctor, we haven't looked down there yet. Haven't looked where? Down in the basement, the refrigeration room for dead bodies. There's more than one way to commit murder. There's a refrigeration room in the basement of the miniature morgue in the village of Holman. It's the one place Captain Friday has not thought to look for the missing young people. After all, there are less than 30 houses in the whole village, and that allows little room for making four grown people vanish as completely as have Carmel, Andres, and Martin and Gail. But the basement of the morgue could also be a booby trap. That's the door leading downstairs, Doctor. Ah. Are you going down, Captain? Sure. Come on. Be on your guard. There's a light down there, I suppose. Yeah. Switch at the head of the stairs lights the stairway. Another switch at the foot lights the ante room leading to the refrigeration room. Why? I'm just wondering if we could be trapped in the dark. No, not a chance. Be careful, though. Stand away from the door. Yes. Well, here goes. Holy mackerel, somebody took a shot. Listen! Someone falling downstairs. Yeah. One inch lower, and I'd have had my head blown off. Well, they don't shoot again. Uh, looks like he took one shot and beat it. Fell downstairs trying to make a quick getaway. How can you stand there so calm, Captain? That was a pretty close call. Never mind about that. I'm going down after that guy. Captain, you're not. I'll say I am. You stay right here. Nothing of the kind. You'll need help. It's my funeral. No funeral if I can help it. <laughs> Attaboy, Doctor. Now, come on. We'll go down the stairs with the lights out. Go ahead. I'm with you. Don't follow me too close. We don't want to collide and give ourselves away. I'll watch. Come on. Hello. What's this? A would-be murderer dropped his gun. You found his gun? Yeah. Fellow got away so fast, he left it behind. Well, so much the worse for him. Let's go on. Coming? Yes. You're plenty quiet. You should have been a burglar. Here we come to the bottom of the stairs. I haven't heard a sound, have you? Uh-uh. We'll have to feel our way in the dark. Okay. Come on. Is there another exit from the basement? No. Oh, up the... Doctor. Yes? Just bumped into one of our corpses. I can tell by the feel. Captain, are you certain? Sure. It's all in a heap. Yeah, this must be the chap that fired at me. That'd explain the gun. Who is it? Just a second. It's the half-wit Hartley boy. What are you going to do with him? Leave him here for the moment and go on. But, Captain, you I... stay here and watch beside him. If you wish. Looks like we'd found their hangout, all right. Whose hangout? Hangout of these dead bodies. Looks like this is where our corpses have been hiding out. You talk as though you thought we were fighting the dead. It looks like it, doesn't it? Looks like this chap was set to guard the head of the stairs. Imagine the others will be around close by. I'm going on ahead and turn on the light. Captain, you don't know what you're walking into. I can shoot as fast and as straight as the next guy. You stay here and wait for me. Ah, ah, there's the light. Dr. Croft, come here quick. What do you see? Come here and take a look. What is it now? Oh, my eye, what an exhibition. Can you imagine it? Look at Andrew Walters stretched out there on the floor on his stomach. What's that, a... A rifle in his hand? Yeah, 30 30, pointed right at the foot of the stairs. But he's dead. You can tell by the way he holds the weapon. Yes. He's dead or he'd have taken a pop at us. 
Look at old Doc Sims slumped down over there against the door to the refrigeration room. <laughs> Talk about the army of the dead on guard. Ugh. Gives you the shivers. There never was anything like it in the world, Captain. It's just as though they had set themselves to die fighting to protect that room and then all... Protect that room. Doctor, you don't suppose they've got those four kids in that refrigeration room? Those four children? Frozen? Get that body out of the way. Uh, door's locked. We've got to get in there. Do you suppose Doc Sims has a key on him? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Here, let's see. Hurry, Captain, hurry. The first time I ever rolled a dead man. Find anything? Uh, nothing here. Hey, maybe it's on the key ring I took from him yesterday. Good. Hurry. Hurry. Uh, it seems like a million keys on this thing. Can I help you? No, no, no. Stand out of the way. Here. Hey, this looks like it fit. Ah, uh, no. It doesn't fit. Here, here, here. here. Try no, that. No, no, no. That's too big. Here. Here it is. Here. <clears throat> Oh, holy mackerel, it's freezing in here. Captain Friday. Captain, please. Andres, is that you? Captain, is there a light? Here, on the outside of the door. Here. In heaven's name, Captain, look at them. Frozen to death. Please, please help us. Grab him, Doctor. Drag him out. Got to get him out quick. Uh, Gail Stanley's still conscious, I think. Uh, here, child. <clears throat> Don't move. I'll carry you. There. There. I've got Andres. Save Carmel. Please, I am all right. Save my little cousin. Yeah, we'll get her. Come on. Get young Stanley, Doctor. I'm after him now. Poor little tyke. Carmel's hardly breathing. Uh, we've got to get them into bed immediately or we lose them all. Uh, what a way to die. Somebody's going to pay for this. See here. There's one of these uh, ambulance tables. A what? A double deck table on wheels. I saw one on the main floor. We've got to get these four upstairs and onto it. We can wheel them all over to the cottage at once then. <sighs> Let's go. Take off your coat, wrap Carmel up the best you can, then carry her upstairs. Yes, yeah, I've got her. Please, please, you do not need to carry me. Hey, you'd better wait, Andres. I'll be right back to give you a hand. If I could stand and walk about, Get my circulation to go again. You stand where you are, Andres. As soon as I get Miss Stanley upstairs, we'll attend to you, boys. I left Carmel on the table, Doctor. Is there room for Miss Stanley on top alongside her? Yeah, I think so. Here, Andres, let me give you a hand. Please, no. You take Stanley first. He is worse off. All right, fella. Hang on. I'll be right with you. It, it is bad way to die. This freeze. Charlie, there's a lot of meat on this guy, Stanley. <laughs> I guess he'll have to ride upstairs on my shoulder. Uh, please, uh, please, is Carmel going to be all right? <laughs> Don't you worry about her, Andres. Oh, you've got Stanley, eh? Hmm? Can I give you a hand? No, I'm all right, Doctor. Then I'll take Andres. Poor chap, he's <laughs> suffering brutally. Please, you do not need to carry me. You, you just... Help me walk. As a matter of fact, it'll be better for you if you can help yourself a bit, uh, help to stimulate the bloodstream. Now, right up those stairs. See, Senor. Please, I am sorry. Oh, now, now, Andres, take it easy, lad. What this most horrible thing? Who would do this? Now, then don't think about it, don't think about it. Save your breath to get up these stairs. I, I cannot forget. Oh, Carmel, she cries so hard, but she thinks we are going to die. There, there now. Can you make this step? She is so young to think of dying. Here, Doctor, let me give you a hand. Yep, here we are. Now then, hold yourself as stiff as you can, Andres. See? We'll shove you in beside Stanley. See, I understand. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there. And now then for the buggy ride. Ah, thank heavens we have an easy approach to the road. Yeah, no curbings between here and the cottage. Eh, wheels like a baby carriage. Do you want to lock the place up, Captain? Uh, yeah. Oh, well, look here, Doctor. Can you get along without me for a few minutes? Why? Why? I suppose so. Well, you go ahead. I'll run and catch up with you. I would. What now? Please. Please, if my cousin, she is in danger, you will hurry? I, 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 I don't dare to go too fast. Uh, too many ruts here. It'd be too bad if we 
If we tipped you over. Oh. Oh. Only, only a moment more now. And we'll be at the cottage. Oh, this is mercy. Okay, Doctor. I'm with you again. Uh, here you are. Couldn't see in the fog until I got right on top of you. All right, all right. Here we are. Get them in the house as fast as you can. Yeah, you bet. Great heavens, Captain. My medical case. I've got to have stimulants. Uh, don't worry, I got it. Found it when I went back. Oh, oh, what a fright. Here, here, get the unconscious ones in first. Then I can be working on them. Yeah. You take Carmel, I'll bring young Stanley. Yes, I can take her and still open the door. I think Stanley's going to come too, Doctor. Put him there on the floor before the fire where it's warm. Carmel's the hardest hit. I'll attend to her first. Yeah, go ahead, Doctor. I'll bring in the others. Mm, stimulant to keep her heart action strong. Mm -hmm. Yes, this will do the work. What do you want, Miss Stanley, Doctor? Oh, put her beside her brother. And when you've got Andres in, gather blankets and roll them up. Uh -huh. Better build up a big fire. Yeah, okay. There's some party. Biggest attempted massacre I've ever been on. I'm afraid Carmel's going to have to take an awful beating before she comes around. There. There, now. I better have a look at young Stanley. Lean on me more, guy. Lean on me. But I am bad. Oh, come on. Don't be so independent. Yeah, you flood down here beside the others. Uh, I have never been so cold. How about Carmel, Doctor? Come here, Captain. Yeah? What is it, Doctor? She's very low. I've given her an injection, but uh, I don't know. Hey, you're not giving up hope. Shh. Please? Please, what is it? Now you've done it. Doctor, do that. Tell me she... No, 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 Andres, Andres. <laughs> Carmel's going to be all right. You see, this is no time for sentiment. We've got to slap and massage her rather sharply now to get the blood flowing. I understand. Her <laughs> whole body, Andres. You understand, Andres. We've got to get the blood to flowing. You... You mean whip her? Exactly. Whip and massage warmth back into her body. Here's a bunch of blankets, Doctor. Hey, look. Stanley's coming around. Here. Give them each a drink of this. Okay. I'm having a, a juice of a time getting Carmel out of these frozen pearls, though. Ah, there. Ah, now then I can work. Mm. Oh, in heaven's name, Doctor, not so hard. Oh, keep Andres quiet, Captain. Please. Yeah, what's the matter, fella? It's for her own good. <laughs> My I say, Captain, why <laughs> did you go back into the morgue? Why did you stay behind? I dragged our three corpses into the refrigeration room and locked the door on them. But, Captain, what if they're still alive? You can't freeze them like butcher's meat. What did Andres mean? Does he really believe there is life in those three dead bodies Captain Friday locked in the freezing chamber in the basement of the morgue? It goes against all the rules of physiology, but Captain Friday may yet be sorry for his actions against those three. Listen next week to Chapter 8 of Dead Men Prowl, which is entitled The Prowler with the Rope Around His Neck. You are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... Dead Men Prowl, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. Probably no village of 30 houses in the world 
besides Holman on the Marin County coast of California, had the morbid luxury of its own morgue, certainly not with a morgue so modernly equipped with slabs and ice niches and refrigeration rooms. You will remember that earlier this afternoon, Captain Friday and Dr. Croft were knocked unconscious and locked in a closet in Andrew Walter's home. When they broke out, they found that Carmel and Andres Ruiz and Gail and Martin Stanley had disappeared from Captain Friday's cottage. But here is Captain Friday himself. Well, we began the search and finally discovered the four locked in the refrigeration room in the basement of the morgue. We found them all right. We also found something we hadn't bargained for. Standing guard in the ante room before the door were the bodies of the three prowling dead. Doc Sims, Andrew Walters, and Rich Hartley's murdered half-wit boy. While Dr. Croft rushed the half-frozen young people back to the cottage on a morgue hand wagon, I dumped the three corpses into the icy refrigeration room and locked them in. There would be no more prowling dead if I could prevent it. For half the night, the doctor and Captain Friday worked over the four young people with stimulants, and in the case of Carmel Ruiz, with even harsher methods, for she of the four was almost past saving. But toward midnight, the danger seemed past. Leaving the four in the doctor's care then, Captain Friday disappeared for two hours. And when he returned, he was full of unsuppressible excitement. Doctor! Dr. Croft, where are you? Doctor! Oh, hello. I was sound asleep before the fire. What? What is it, Captain? Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor. If I'd known you were asleep, I wouldn't have stormed in like this. Asleep? Oh, I want to be sorry. I had no business dozing. Oh, see here, Doctor, you're dead on your feet. Mm, a little tired. But I must say, you're standing up under the strain as though you hadn't missed an hour's sleep. Well, I'm used to it. I can live on nothing but excitement for a week, if necessary. Well, the sleep I had has revived me. Better go on back to sleep. <laughs> with you bursting with news? Yeah? How'd you know that? <laughs> Glitter in your eyes. Come, out with it. <laughs> Glitter, huh? Yeah, I got one thing cleared up anyway. You have? Anything of importance? Well, I think so. I know who killed the half-wit Hartley boy. Really, Captain? Haven't any idea yourself. Huh? Oh, I say, now don't keep me waiting like this. Well, I'll tell you. It was Andres Ruiz. Andres Ruiz? Captain Friday, I think you are my friend. Hey, where did you pop from? I hear you say I do this murder. Andres, I... I thought you were asleep. No, I'm not asleep. Yeah, I can see that. And if you say I kill this half-wit boy, you lie. Lie, huh? You cast disgrace hey, on my Hey, 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 Andres, don't shake your fist like that. Well, then you say it is not true. Come on and sit down. I want to talk to you. No, I will not sit with anybody who say I am murderer. Sit down. You say this thing... Sit down. Better sit down, don't you think, Andres? Doctor, you do not think I have killed anyone? You better sit down and hear what Captain Friday has to say. Well, very well. But I tell you... Now then, Andres, I've been out poking around the beach. I found this not very far from where we first met you and Carmel last night. The cloak. The cloak which the skeleton wear. Uh -huh. I thought you'd recognize it. You... You find this on the beach? Uh-huh. And a little further on, I found this... By George, Captain, you seem to have had a very profitable evening. This is the hat we see him wear. There is no doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt, all right. And and did you find the skeleton? Sure. You you did? Andres, I found tracks and blood on the sand. Blood, eh? Yeah. And even you, Andres, would hardly expect to get blood out of a skeleton. Now, would you? But no. What is this you are saying? If you shot at a skeleton and... You admit you did shoot at the skeleton, don't you? Yes. If but you senor... shot at the skeleton and drew blood, you'd be willing to admit that there was something mighty queer, wouldn't you? Please, senor, what is, what is it you wish to say? We'll get at that in a moment. I followed the footprints for a bit, and then pretty soon the footprints got wobbly, and they stopped altogether. After that, there was only a sort of blurred trail, so somebody was dragging himself along on his hands and knees. Plenty of blood, though. Oh, what have I done? Oh, it is not possible. Now, just a minute, Andres. Where do you think the trail led? To the morgue? Right, to the back entrance. The door was unlocked. There were bloodstains on the steps and a smear here and there on the floor. Oh, this is the most terrible thing ever happened to me. I even found stains on the edge of the slab where his soaked shirt had rubbed as he pulled himself up onto the barmel piece. Oh, oh see here, Captain, that's a bit far-fetched. 
Supposing Andres here did mistake the Hartley boy for a skeleton and shoot him. You can't expect us to believe that the fellow raced to the morgue and climbed up on the slab to die. Everything indicates that he went there by himself. But if it was the half-wit boy, well, what make him look like skeleton? I found out that, too. That was done with phosphorescent paint. See here, Captain, you're making this village more on a most unusual character. Oh, no, Doctor, not when you get to the bottom of the thing. As soon as I got all this material together, I beat it over to his father's house and routed him out. Will... will he send me to jail? We'll talk about that later, Andres. I told Rich Hartley the whole story, and he saw right away what had happened to his son. To amuse the boy last Halloween, he'd given him several rubber masks and a can of phosphorescent paint and showed him how to fix himself up like a skeleton. Oh, ho! And the poor lad was simply carrying his Halloween celebration over several months. Uh Uh-huh. I was just out for a little fun, and Andres here, not understanding, took a shot at him. Oh, never as long as I live will I shoot another gun. As for him going to the morgue when he was shot, his father explained that in spite of everything that Doc Sims had ever been able to do, the boy had insisted on making the place his playhouse. Jove! And you think in his death agonies, he crawled to his beloved playhouse to die. That's right. But still, Captain, that doesn't explain how his bossy came to join in the antics of the prowling dead. No, I mean, it takes an awful burden off my mind. Now we can concentrate on Doc Sims and Andrew Walters. There's where the sinister business is concerned. But, but what is to become of me? Please, and yours, if I have kill a boy... See here, Andres. Rich Hartley's a decent sort of fellow. Oh, old moss back, but a just man all the same. I'd advise you go over and have a heart-to-heart talk with him tomorrow. Oh, please, senor, if this will do any good... But better still, he'll probably be at the inquest. We'll take you along. Oh, I will do anything. I think if we can convince him that the shooting was a mistake, that it was accidental, and that the whole thing is as horrible to you... Yes, as... yes, see, si. Oh, I will make him understand. I don't think you'll have any trouble with him, Andres. Oh, never. Never in my life have I killed a man before. No, no, Andres, you mustn't brood like this. Get the thing out of your mind and go back to bed. Bed? Oh, no, I will never sleep again. Always I will see the face of this poor little half-wit boy. Oh, please, you will not mind if I go outside? My head hurt like it has never hurt before. All right, go along out and get some fresh air, then. You think he's recovered enough from the chill he got, Doctor? Oh, quite. But, Andres, wrap up a bit. Oh, yes, yes, I will. Oh, never have I known anything like this before. Poor chap. He's utterly distracted. How's this cousin Carmel, Doctor? Is she going to be all right? Oh, right as rain. Not only that, Miss Stanley and her brother will be as fit as ever by morning. Marvelous, the recuperative forces in youth. Yeah, that's a load off my mind. You know what, Doctor? What's that? I'm all for taking a catnap. I'm getting fuzzy from lack of sleep. I think that's a good idea, Captain. So far as I know, there were never more than two keys to the refrigeration room over at the morgue. And I've got both of them. Only two? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't care how much supernatural power those three dead bodies have. I'll bet they can't break out of that ice room. No, I imagine not. Uh Uh-huh. And with them safe on ice, I figure we owe ourselves a couple of hours rest. Well, you run along. I have a notion to toast myself before the fire. The chair's comfortable. If I get drowsy again, I'll... Just drop off. Do you more good to go to bed? I fancy not. I'd rather be fully dressed if anything should come up. Uh Uh-huh. Um, anticipating anything? Nothing especially, except, uh... Well? Captain, what do you think is the real reason Andres felt the need of cold night air when we only saved him from freezing less than seven hours ago? Oh, Oh, I see think you're flushing out a clue, huh, Doctor? Maybe. Maybe not. Anyway, I think I'll sit here. Okay. Good night. Oh, uh, and Doctor. Yes, Captain? If there's anything unusual, call out. Yes, I will. Who is it? Captain Friday. What are you two girls doing awake? Oh, please. Please, Captain Friday, come in here. Say, what are you two girls doing sitting up in bed jabbering like magpies? You're supposed to be asleep. Captain, there's somebody prowling around outside our window. 
Uh-oh. Are you sure? Yes, there really is, Captain Friday. And we were afraid to get up to call anybody. Prowling outside, huh? But nobody could get in. The window in here is too small. Besides, it's way up high. Oh, I know, but well, nothing seems to make any difference to these these dead creatures. You wait I... here a minute. I'll go take a peek out of the window in my room. Please be careful. I'll be all right. Gail is going to do just what you did when when that awful thing pulled you out of the window. Oh, Captain, please wait. Oh. Nothing in sight. Uh-oh. I'll be back in just a minute. I'm going out the window. Hey, you, you seen something? Oh, don't be a silly, Carmel. Captain Friday can take care of himself. I wouldn't feel so frightened if... If... If what, Carmel? If I could only forget about that awful cold room in the morn. I can't seem to get that terrible cold feeling out of me. Well, you mustn't think about it. Just be glad that... Why, Martin, are you awake, too? I thought I heard voices. Oh, I'm glad you girls are all right. Well, Martin, what is that? You're as white as a ghost. <laughs> I was having a horrible nightmare. Finally woke me up. Carmel, are you all right? I think so. Yes, of course. What's the door doing open between your room and Captain Friday's? Well, the captain just went out the window. Out the window? You mean that... Somebody's been prowling outside the window again. Was it another dead body? Did you see who it was? No, we just heard footsteps. And... There's someone at the captain's window now. Listen. Come on, fella. It's all right. I brought the prowler along with me. For 20 years, not a single death has marred the tranquil life of the little village of Holman. Suddenly, three deaths occurred in one night. Doc Sims died a natural death on the beach. Andrew Walters, the other rich man of Holman, hanged himself in his home. Rich Hartley's half-wit son was accidentally shot through the heart by Andres Ruiz. These three dead men have been prowling the village streets until Captain Friday locked the bodies in Holman's tiny morgue. But even with these precautions, a prowler has just been captured outside the captain's summer cottage. It's okay, folks. I brought the prowler along with me. Brought the prowler? Yeah. Oh, hello there, Stanley. You joined the pajama party, too, huh? Yeah, here's your prowler. Andres. Oh, please, Carmel. Please, everybody. I did not mean to frighten anyone. I could not sleep, and I wished to do something, and so I walk up and down the beach, so I would know everything would be all right with you, Miss Stanley, and Carmel. Oh, that's it. Well, you did give us an awfully bad half hour, Andres. Oh, I am too sorry. Mighty decent thought, just the same, Andres. Uh, what do you say, Stanley? You just said I thought it was mighty decent of you. Why? Oh, uh, nothing. <laughs> nothing. See here now. Aren't any of you going back to sleep? Well, I'm not the least bit sleepy. Oh, no. I want to stay awake. Well, as long as you're all staying awake, I'm going to round up Dr. Croft, and then I want to get the straight of this morgue business. Oh, you got yourself locked in the refrigeration room with the doctor's medical kit. That won't take long. Yeah, you girls stay in bed and keep warm. You two fellas make yourself comfortable. I'll get Dr. Croft. Martin, are you sure you're all right? You look awfully sick. No, honest, Gail, don't worry about me. I'm, I'm all right, please. Carmel, please, you will keep warm? I'm all right now, Andres. Really, I am. Oh, when I think how you suffer in that horrible place, I turn to water in my heart. I cannot bear it. Oh, Andres. I'd give anything in the world if I had a brother like you. Uh, brother? Brother? You wish me for a brother? Why, Andres. You look so hurt. I thought you'd like to know how much I like you. Oh, but of course, Carmel Mia. Uh, it is a beautiful compliment you give me. Well, the doctor's fallen asleep, all worn out. I'm not going to bother him. We'll get along without him. Of course, the poor man. I'd like to have had him here to see if all you folks are okay. Uh, if anybody gets tired, we can stop, eh? Yeah, yeah. Hey, mind if I perch on the foot of your bed, Miss Stanley? No, of course not. No, thanks. Okay, now, I want the whole dope. From the minute Dr. Croft and I left you four here in the cottage yesterday afternoon... So we pulled you out of the ice room at the morgue. Well, we well, were staying... Yeah, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Not all at once. Miss Stanley, suppose you begin. Well, all right. After you left, Carmel and I began getting lunch, just as you told us. Everything went all right. Well, 
That is, we straightened everything out. Now, wait a minute. When... W- what do you mean, uh, straightened everything out? Uh, why... Uh, please, uh... senor. Stanley and I have quarreled. Quarreled, huh? Yeah, and it was my fault. I, I, I'm sorry, Andres. Really, I am. Huh. Well, Stanley, a trip to the morgue icebox seems to have done you some good. I don't know. Perhaps. All right, Miss Stanley, what then? Well, we got everything on the stove cooking nicely, when suddenly someone ran up on the porch and pounded on the door and began to yell. Mm -hmm. It was awful. You'd have thought he was crazy the way he went on. Well, he yelled for us not to stop for anything, that you, Captain, and Dr. Croft had been dreadfully hurt, and that we were to get bandages and medicine and rush over to the morgue. He said you were in the basement. Who was this fellow? We don't know. Didn't you get a look at him? No, he shouted through the door. We were petrified. Well, as soon as I come to my senses, I rushed to the door. But he is gone. Oh, that's a crazy business. All we could think about was you two being hurt. We forgot all about the lunch we were cooking. Oh, we did not waste one minute. We grabbed everything we could find in the bathroom. Bandage, medicine, uh, everything. Well, I happened to think of Dr. Croft's medicine case, so I got that too. It was so foggy outside, we lost our way and went past the morgue. We had to come back. Yeah, we were so excited, we didn't know what we were doing. Tell me, was the front door of the morgue open? Yes. And the whole place was lighted, too. We never think it might be a trap. Why should we? They said you were badly hurt, and so we went... So you went down into the basement, and then what? Well, we all rushed into a big room. Oh, it was so cold. Was the door open and the light on in the refrigeration room? See, yes. But, of course, we didn't know it was refrigeration room when we went in. We all dashed in, the doors slammed shut behind us, and there we were. And then the lights went out. All of a sudden, I I realized what had happened. Knew you'd walked into a trap, huh? Yes. I never had such a feeling in my life. My whole body was filled with such a revulsion. I, I was so nauseated, I, I couldn't stand. I don't think we'd better go into the rest of it. But please, senor, where were you and the doctor all this time? You say the fellow came to the door about a half hour after we left the cottage? Well, it couldn't have been longer than that. Well, along about that time, well, maybe a few minutes before, the doctor and I were getting our heads bashed in. You mean you were attacked too? Yeah, over in Andrew Walter's house. Oh, this is too much. Somebody slugged me and then locked us in a closet where we put the Hartley boy's body. But but didn't you see who it was? Uh, not a chance. They got us from behind. Well, how'd you get out of the closet? Smashed in the door. Look here, Captain. Could the same person have done both jobs? He'd have been busier than a bird dog if he did. Yeah, this is going to take some figuring. Now, let's see now. None of you went outside the cottage until this voice called to you. I'll say not. We stuck to each other like burrs. Please. I know. You were thinking about me. About you? Well, you think that because... Uh, Please, must you tell about what I have done? Oh, I got you. You mean our little conversation about the halfway? Oh, please, if it is not necessary... Don't you worry, Andres. That's in the bag for the time being. Oh, for this, I thank you, Senor. Captain! Captain Friday! Listen, that's Dr. Croft. Captain! Quick! Something's gone wrong. What's the matter? Well, I was awakened by a woman screaming. Uh, I had uh, dropped off to sleep. Woman screaming? Where? I didn't hear anything. I heard it twice. It was an agonized cry, one right on top of the other. Strange. Where did it come from? In the distance. You don't suppose that Suppose what? Why, it occurred to me that our dead friends may have escaped from the morgue and are prowling in some of the neighbor's homes. Yes, that's a possibility. Come on, doctor, we'll check on it. Oh, please. Please, you're not going to leave us alone again? See here, Captain, this is pretty serious. These young people shouldn't have been awakened this way after the harrowing experiences they've been through. Well, the captain didn't awaken us, Doctor. We were awake. I'm perfectly all right. Hmm. Oh. Carmel isn't. Look at her bright eyes and her flushed cheeks. Oh, really, I am. Please. Please don't leave us. Oh, Doctor, don't go away. See here, Doctor. Maybe you'd better stay here. Stanley, will you stay here with Dr. Croft? Well, anything you say, Captain. Come out here a minute first, Stanley. I want to talk to you. Oh, I know. I've been making a horse's neck of my Now then, Carmel, you lie down. I don't want to go to sleep. I don't want to be left alone. Now then, no one's going to leave you alone. I'm going to stay right here with you, and so is Martin Stanley and his sister. Of course, Carmel. We won't leave you. All right, Stanley. Mind what I tell you. Andres, are you ready? You're coming with me. Please, if anything should happen to Carmel... Nothing's going to happen. Put on your hat and step on it. Carmel, you will do what the good doctors say. Everything will be all right. Andres, Andres, let's go away from here. Oh, please, please, you get well and we will go away. Let her alone, Andres. You're simply upsetting her. I will kiss you on the forehead. See, I am your big brother. I will be back. All right, Andres, let's get out of here. We've wasted too much time already. We'll cut across the lawn to the sidewalk. 
Oh, the doctor was angry because we upset Carmel. Uh, I suppose we did go too far. I had to get that information, though. Maybe I should have called him after all. Please, where are we going? I don't know. The doctor said he heard a woman scream. If somebody in the village has been yelling, there'll be a crowd around. Oh, if it was not for this thick fog. Yeah, it's beastly. Here's the sidewalk. We'll have to patrol up one side of the street and down the other. Nothing will get by us that way. Mm, it is good there is only one street. Yeah, a short one at that. If you see anything, Andres, that's out of the ordinary, sing out. Please, if I may ask it, have you no idea who is uh, cause all this? Idea, huh? I've been collecting a lot of ideas lately, Andres. A lot of them. Well, then, um, then you perhaps know who is do this thing, eh? You'd be surprised what I know, Andres. Well, then why you do not arrest somebody, if you know? Listen, fella. All I'm waiting for now is a break. Things are piling up, and when the right time comes... Oh, but see here, Andres. Keep mum. Oh, with all my heart, I will not say a thing. But please, if I can give any little help, I... What is that? It's the morgue. Come on, it's the morgue. Please, I am losing you in this dark. Come on, come on, Andres. They're blowing up the morgue. Oh, this is awful. Here, here I am, Andres. Look out you don't trip and break your neck on that rotten sidewalk. Uh, how can I watch out when I cannot see one little thing? Yeah, watch yourself. Here, over this way through the lot. Imagine that, blowing up the morgue. Uh, maybe these bodies which have given us so much trouble are no Blown more. up, huh? I hope they are. Oh, it is terrible thought. Uh, yeah, I don't see why. They better run for their money. Only madmen would run around in fog like this. Yeah, you got to take a chance on breaking your neck once in a while in this game. I do not think I wish to be detective. Uh, yeah. Uh, here we are. Uh, look there. Oh. Door's busted open. What a blast. Wonder if the lights will turn on. Are you... Are you not afraid of what you will find? There won't be anybody inside. If there is, he got blown up plenty with that blast. Well, where is the lights? Here, along the wall somewhere. Yeah, yeah here they are. Yeah. That's a break. Wonder it didn't tear out the wiring. But they do not see any explosion. I have an idea where to look. Come on down into the basement. You... You mean this refrigeration room? Yeah, come on. Here. Now wait till I find the stair lights. Yeah. yeah, there she is. Look! Look, there are the stairs! I'm a son of a gun if it isn't our old friend, the Hartley boy. Oh, he was come upstairs and he could not go any further. Look how he is fall on his face. Yeah, looks like a jailbreak, all right. Come on, let's go on down. Oh, if I never see this place again, I will be just as happy. Careful you don't step on him. Oh! I would never do that. Uh, frozen stiff. Yep, here's Doc Sims. Is, is he freeze too? Yep, even freezing him won't keep him in their place. Old water corpse Sims. Oh, <laughs> it is no joke for me, I can tell you. Hey, look. Look there at the door of the refrigeration room. Why, it is blow clear across the room. Yeah, that's peculiar. That door was blown open from the inside. But how is it possible? Three dead men frozen in ice room. And they did not have any powder. Yeah. Remember Doc Sims busted out of his ropes and bashed down the door of his study even after I tied him down? You... You think they have some ghostly power? Hey, look. There's Andrew Walters. He didn't get very far. Uh-oh, here's something. Huh? What is it? I do not see anything. Yeah, never mind. It doesn't amount to much. Look! Look, Captain, I have not noticed this before. This string under Doc Sims' hand. A string, huh? What does it lead to? Well, I do not know. I will find out. Perhaps it is nothing. <laughs> Look out, Andres! You've set off a bomb! Look out! The walls are falling in! Senor! Senor, we will be killed! Captain Friday and Andres Ruiz trapped in the ruins of Doc Sims' morgue. Have these two walked into a trap set by the three prowling dead? A string in the hands of a dead man caused the explosion. Again evidence that the dead may rise and go about their morbid duties. 
Listen next week to the ninth episode of Dead Men Prowl, entitled The Prowler Dead Walk Again. Next week, at this same hour, you are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... Dead Men Prowl, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. In the tiny coast village of Holman, death stalked everywhere with grinning lipless gums and outstretched claws. Dr. Jamie Croft had prevailed upon Captain Friday to permit him to spend a weekend at the captain's summer cottage in Holman. They had no more than arrived on the scene when the heavy hand of death struck three times. Three deaths in the little seaside resort where death had been unknown for 20 years. Doc Sims had been found on the beach dead, apparently of natural causes. His rival for control of the village, Andrew Walters, was found hanged in his home. The village halfwit, young Rich Hartley, was found with a bullet through his heart. Even in death, these three have apparently become the most active citizens in Holman. They have been handcuffed, tied, and locked in the village morgue, but to no avail. Captain Friday has been appointed village constable by the people of Holman. Yes, I've been made constable, all right. But the three dead men still prowl the streets of the town. There's some angles to the case that just don't seem to add up. Carmel and Andres Ruiz, cousins, came here to visit their uncle, Andrew Walters. A few hours after they talked with him, he was found hanged. Gail and Martin Stanley came to Holman to investigate the death of their uncle, Doc Sims. There's a funny thing about that. They were notified of his death before he died. About the only thing I've uncovered so far is that Andy Walters was masquerading under an assumed name. He and Doc Sims are, or were, brothers. The two rich men of Holman were feuding. Now they're both dead. It wouldn't be so bad if I could keep track of their bodies. I've tried everything. A few hours ago, I locked all three in the refrigeration room of the morgue. It seems to me a frozen corpse should stay put. But even that didn't hold them. Captain Friday had very definitely locked the three prowling dead in the refrigeration room of the morgue. Several hours later, Dr. Croft heard a woman screaming in the night. So, leaving the doctor and Martin Stanley with the two girls in his cottage, the captain set out with Andres to discover the trouble. Nothing was uncovered in the heavy black fog until suddenly there came a terrific explosion from the morgue. Quickly, the two men dashed to the death house to discover that the door to the refrigeration room had been burst or blown open from the inside. Furthermore, the bodies of the three prowling dead were found outside the refrigeration room in positions indicating that they had made an attempt to escape but had become suddenly inactive. Andre suddenly came upon a cord under the dead hand of Doc Sims, which ran along the floor to a far wall. He picked it up and jerked. There was a deafening explosion, and the whole wall rose up and toppled in upon them. Uh, Andres! Andres, where are you? Are you hurt? Oh, oh, Captain Friday. What's the matter, fella? Oh, we... We are not dead then, senor? (laughs) I'll say we're not. Game mighty near joining the prowling dead, though. Speaking of our dead... I guess they've done their last prowling, buried underneath all that rock and cement. Look here, Andres, how are you feeling? Well, now I have got that big stone off my leg, I am all right. Nothing broken, huh? Well, if there is, I do not feel it. But, senor, how will we get out of this place? We are in the cellar, and all the morgue has tumbled down on top of us. Yeah, I know. Just the same, there's a lot of fresh air coming in down here. 
We'll just have to scramble around and see if we can't find a hole to crawl out of. But are we not liable to bring more rock down on top of us? I guess we'll have to take that chance. Oh, I do not like this business. We'll go slow and feel our way. If we're careful, perhaps we won't dislodge anything. Well, I will follow close behind you, senor. Uh, here. Here's what I've been looking for. Right over my head. Hole big enough to get my body through. Come on, Andres. Give me a boost. Well, is the edge is solid? Yeah, part of the foundation. Ready? All right. Let me put my foot in your hand. All right. Now then, I am ready. Okay. Yeah. Up we go. Uh. That's good. That's good. I'm all set. Now then, I'll reach down and give you a hand. Oh, oh, please, I will pull you back down in this hole with me. No, you won't. I can brace myself. Well, very well, if you think so. Now then, here's my hand. Well, I cannot find it in the dark. Just swing your arms around. Hmm? Oh, there, there, I find it. Okay, now... Now then, up you come. Uh, grab something, Andre. I'm slipping. I have it. I have it. Uh, 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 uh. Ready to go on? Uh, see. Oh, this is most terrible. All the time I think we start new lands lie down on us. All right, come on now. But be careful. Oh, I feel the fog. We must be very near out, eh? Uh, yeah. There's a broken wall alongside of us. Is there a roof over us? Oh, I can't reach the top of the wall to tell. Here, give me another boost up the side of the wall. Very well. Let me step in your hand. No, no, no. no put your back against the wall. Hmm? Not like this? Uh-huh. Now then, link your hands together. And don't boost me too fast. You'll throw me over backwards. Well, I will try. Okay, let's go. All right. Up you go. Higher. <laughs> No, higher. There, I got my fingers on the top. It, it is high as I can lift. Now, come on. Come on. I can help you a little. If I have this strength. Yeah, it's swell. I'm up. Well, we'll get over this and we'll be out of it, I think. Oh, but how am I going to get over? Well, that's easy. I let my legs down. You grab a hold and climb right up. Oh, but that will pull you down. No, you won't. Come on. Well, if you wish. Yeah. Hurry up! Oh. Hurry up, I can't hold you all day. I climb as fast as I can. Grab hold of the top. Pull yourself up. You got it? See. Si. Oh. Uh. Oh, senor, I never do this before. Okay. Now to get down the other side. Uh. Well, if it is bad as going up, I think I will stay right here. Come on. You hang yourself over the outside of the wall like I did. I'll slide down your legs to the ground. Then I'll help you down. Well, if we only had a rope. Well, we haven't, so come on. Ready? Oh, these sharp edges of wall cut me. Well, it'll only be for a minute. Here I go. All right. Oh, oh, Captain, look out, I'm slipping. Hang on, Andres, hang on. No. Oh. Oh. Yeah, that was a swell thing to do. But, but, Captain, I could not help it. Well, we made it anyway. You hurt? I skin my stomach, I think. Uh, do it good. Anywhere we're outside. Come on. We go somewhere else? Back to the cottage as fast as our legs will carry us. Oh, oh this is good. But Captain Friday, who would blow up a morgue? Whoever it is that'd like to get rid of us. We'll see, but who is it? A funny thing. This is the first direct attempt to get rid of me. Before the attempts have only been made on you four. Well, maybe it was a mistake that you were caught in this trap. Uh, I got a hunch it wasn't a mistake at all. Now here's the path across the lot. See. Is it not strange there is nobody around? You know, if I hear a big explosion like that, I would go see what it was. Not Holman, citizens. They're not much on going out on foggy nights for any reason. They'll wait until it gets light. Well, but the people at your cottage, my cousin Carmel and the Stanley. Yeah, and Dr. Croft. Now, that is kind of funny. Still, the cottage is right on the ocean. Might have drowned out the sound of the explosion. Oh, I have not think of that. Hold it, Andres. Huh? What is it? Listen. Huh. It's funny. I thought I heard a motorboat. I hear nothing, senor. Uh, neither do I now. Yeah, it must have been mistaken, and yet I... Oh, well, here we are. Got plenty of lights on in the cottage. Hmm. Maybe the doctor think it's safer with the lights on. Just shut the door after you come in, Andres. See? Si. I... Captain! The doctor! Look, the doctor! Hey, what in thunder's been going on here? Dr. Croft, he is bound and gay. Yeah, stand out of the way, Andres, will you? While I cut him loose. 
Well, his eyes are open. He's not dead. Uh, no, no, of course not. Wait till I get this gag out. Uh, there you are, Doctor. Now, what happened? Uh, Captain. Captain, quick. Go off to Martin Stern and his sister. Uh, motor launch. Trying to escape. What's that? In heaven's name, hurry. I'm all right. Andres, quick. We got business outside. Senor, senor, what is it this time? Stanley's gotten hold of a launch somewhere. I knew I heard a motorboat. But where is he go? And don't ask so many questions. Run faster. But where, senor, where? Down to the wharf, of course. Here, down this way. Got a revolver? No, senor, I do not shoot very good. Yeah, well, young Stanley has. You think he will shoot? Oh, but senor, his sister would not let him shoot us. Oh, yeah. Name of pig, you do not need Here, this. Here, here's the wharf. But I do not hear any motorboats, senor. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You want to run off the end of the wharf into the ocean? Oh, oh, I, I, I could not see where the wharf ended in this dark. Well, the launch is gone, all right. But why would they take the motorboat? Oh, how do I know? Come on, we haven't got any time to waste. But if this is war... Watch why... where you're going, don't fall in. All the time we run, run, run. Never do we get any place. Well, go on back to the cottage if you'd rather. No, 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 senor, I stay by you. But my breath, it's not very good. Now we gotta make speed. See that old shed down the beach on the water's edge? See? That's the swellest little police motorboat launch you ever saw in there. Careful now. But you have said there is not launch here. Yeah, I don't tell everything I know. You know, through this little doorway. Stoop down or you'll bump your head. See, I am all right. Uh, now you stand still till I get her lights turned on. If I can help. Stand still or you'll break your neck. There. Oh, it is beautiful, Bo. Now see that chain hanging by the outer wall? See, si, senor? Go over there and haul away. It lifts the outer door. Very glad to do anything to help. I'll get the motor started. We'll be off in a jiffy. Oh, it is coming, senor. Yeah? What did you expect? <laughs> That's high enough, Andres. Come on and get in. See, si, senor. Oh, but it make big noise. All in? See. Si. Here we go then. Oh, but this is big ocean. Where is it we will look for this other boat? Oh, that's easy. Neither Stanley nor his sister knows the Bay region. They're bound to head straight for San Francisco. They came over to Holman by boat and have a general idea of the direction of the city. Otherwise, they'll be lost, especially in this fog. But perhaps we will not be able to catch up with them. Well, this little craft can run circles around anything Stanley be able to lay his hands on. Oh, well, I do not know very much about boats. Well, you just hang on and I'll do the work. But I do not understand any of these business. Why should these two wish to escape from Holman? I can think of plenty of reasons. You... Could you please tell me one, maybe? Yeah. Bad consciences. You... You mean Miss Stanley have bad conscience? Why not? She wouldn't be the first female with one. Oh, no. No, senor, you are mistaken. Yeah, well, maybe you know. I never could get the straight of how a woman's conscience works. Sometimes it does, and most of the time it doesn't. But, senor, this Gail Stanley, she's very nice, senorita, it seems to me. I... The captain, our engine is stopped. Be quiet, I cut it off. But why you do this? Shut up and listen, will you? Huh? Oh, oh, see. Si. You wish to hear other motorboat, maybe, eh? Don't hear anything. I heard whistle a big ship. No, you didn't. That was just a foghorn. Oh, I did not know. I... Senor! Senor Captain! Now what? Senor, what had become of Carmel? She was also in your cottage. Huh? What did they do with Carmel? If they tie up Dr. Croft, what did they do with my little cousin? Oh, probably left her asleep in her room. Oh, no, no, I do not think so. Well, we can't worry about everything at once. We'll catch this pair of runaways and but then... But suppose they have harmed Carmel. Suppose they have done terrible things to her. Suppose... Cutting out, Andres. What's in yours? Now cut it out, I say. Just letting your imagination run away with you. Oh, if they have so much as lay hands on Carmel, I will kill this pig, Stanley. Andres, get a hold of yourself. I do not care if Stanley is my own cousin. I will kill him. <laughs> Dr. Jamie Croft, the weekend guest of Captain Friday, was found bound and gagged and tossed on a lounge in the captain's cottage. 
They ripped the gag from his mouth and Dr. Croft gasped out the information that Gale and Martin Stanley were trying to escape from Holman by motor launch. In their haste to recapture the Stanleys, neither Captain Friday nor Andres Ruiz thought of Carmel, alone in the cottage. Was she bound and gagged also? Or has she met up with the prowling dead? While Captain Friday and Andres Ruiz search San Francisco Bay in the police launch, Andres threatens to hold Martin Stanley responsible for his cousin Carmel. I tell you, Captain Friday, I will kill this Stanley if anything has happened to Carmel. Take it easy, Andres. Wait till we find Stanley. Oh, please, could you not make this boat go faster? The quicker I get my hands on this... Pipe thing... down, Andres. I'm going to turn off the motor again. See, and I will listen with every bit of me. I do not hear anything. Shh, be quiet. Hey, did you hear it? Yeah, over in that direction. They call for help. Recognize the voices? Si, senor, it is them. They're darn tootin', it's them. Crawl up front, Andres, and hang your ears out. Can't hear much back here at the wheel. Si, senor. I will do good job, too. Yeah, it can't be more than 50 yards from us. Blast this fog. Senor, senor, a little to the right. I hear them. Right, huh? How's that? See, si. Not so fast, senor. Okay. Somebody help! There. There, do you hear them? Yeah. See anything? Not yet, senor. Oh, see, si, see, si, there they are. They are drifting in boat. Drifting where? Oh, I see them. I'm going to kill the motor and glide up alongside, Andres. We'll pay if you'll tow us in. Well, now, isn't that generous? Grab hold as we drift alongside, Andres. Si, senor. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. We thought we were lost. All right, Miss Stanley. Give me your hand. But it's Captain Friday. Say, how'd you get out here? Do as I tell you, Miss Stanley. Get into this boat. Uh, yes, sir. Easy. Oh. Easy. Uh. There, now. Uh. Sit down. Okay. Now you, Stanley. I can get along without you. Give me your hand. Oh, all right. Hey, what are you doing? I want that gun you're carrying. I haven't got a gun. No? Well, what's this in your hip pocket, then? Nothing. Well, you won't need it anymore. There. Hey, what'd you throw it in the ocean for? Just so it wouldn't go off and hurt somebody. Now sit down. Well, that's what I call... Sit down. We had a right to leave, Be Holden. quiet, Stanley. Andres, can you reach the launch's line? Si, senor, I have it. I'll carry it to the back end of our craft and give it a turn around one of those hooks. We'll tow it back to Holman. Oh, do we have to go back there? That's right, Miss Stanley. Who did you steal this boat from? Oh, please. Uh, I never did a thing like this before in all my life. Ready, Andres? Si, senor. So you admit stealing the boat, huh? We don't admit anything. Oh, Martin, please. Let's not try to carry this thing out. Let's tell Captain Friday how it happened. What good would that do? You tell me, Senor Stanley, what you have done with my cousin Carmel. What's eating you, Ruiz? You tell me what you do with Carmel or I will kill you. Well, what are you talking about, Andre? Carmel. It is Carmel who I talk about. What have you done with her? Well, we left her asleep at the cottage. You... You did not touch my cousin? Well, of course not. Why? Is she gone? I do not know. But I say to myself, if Annie has harmed my cousin, I will kill him like a dog. You better find out what it's all about before you start getting homicidal. Well, you are a very bad fellow to my cousin, Senor Stanley. Oh, go take a jump in the ocean. Please, Andres, Martin's upset. You just don't understand it. Nah, this I do not wish to do, I can tell you plain. Come on, Miss Stanley, what's it all about? It's pretty plain that you did steal this boat. Yes. Yes, we stole it. Sissy, you crazy? Well, Martin, I think it's right to tell the truth. I I'm going to tell. Leave it to a girl. Well, we had no intention of running away and... Until Dr. Croft told us there was a boat tied down at the dock. Yeah? How did he know? Well, after he'd gotten Carmel asleep, he went out to get some fresh air. And when he came back, he just remarked that there was a boat tied up at the dock, and... Yes, then well, what? Well, that gave us the idea of trying to get back to the city. It wasn't Gail's idea at all. It was all my doing. Oh, please, Martin. Well, it was my idea. I suggested it, and I kept after her until she agreed to go with me. But I didn't have to go. And she didn't know anything about me hitting Dr. Croft over the head and binding and gagging him, either. Martin Stanley, you didn't do that. Yes, I did. 
did it while you were in the bedroom getting your things together. Oh. Yes, but what I want to know is what you think you'd have accomplished if you had escaped. The police in the city have picked you up in a minute. Oh, but we weren't trying to run away from the police. Uh, oh, no? Really, we weren't. All we wanted to do was get away from that awful place with all those dead bodies. Well, you're going back. Yes, I know. I'm sorry we attempted it now. Well, I'm not. I only wish that engine hadn't conked out. Say, where'd you get this boat, anyway? Uh -huh. Just a little ace in the hole, Stanley. Uh, you detectives make me sick. Yeah, you'll probably be a lot sicker of them before they're through with you. They can't do anything to me. I haven't done a thing. Uh, we'll know more about that when we get back to the cottage. And that won't be very long now. There's the wharf right up ahead. Yeah, Andres. Si, senor. Here, take these handcuffs. But, senor... Take what... them and handcuff the two together. Oh, oh, no, please. Senor, never. I will not put handcuffs on Miss Stanley. Oh, yeah? And suppose you handcuff yourself with Stanley there. I'm not taking any chances of losing him in this fog. Oh, but please, Martin won't run away. Will you, Martin? Do what I tell you, Andres. Either handcuff Stanley with his sister or to yourself. Well, to his sister, I could not do it all. To me, if you wish, yes. It's okay with me. Here, Stanley, hold out your left arm. Sure. With my fist on the end. Oh, oh, Martin, oh. why did you do that? You pig of a pig! I will show you how good Spanish fellow can fight oh, now. Right, you dirty, I'll break your neck for you. There. And I guess they will show you I'm not so bad a fighter, eh? Well, well, for gosh sakes, at least get off my stomach. You're breaking my back. Well, then hold out your left arm for the handcuffs. There. There. That is good. <laughs> good boy, Andres. That sounded like a swell fight. Too bad it was dark. Got him all right, Andres? Si, senor capitano. Great. Well, here we are. No, no, stop crying, Miss Stanley. Your brother had it coming. As soon as I pull up alongside, climb up that little ladder to the wharf. Oh, but it was all so unnecessary. Yeah, now, climb up. Here, you give me your hand, Miss Stanley. Now walk around after you get up. You're liable to fall in the ocean. Oh, but how are Stanley and I to climb up the ladder together? Well, you go first, Andres. You can make it if you keep close enough together. Up you go. Oh, this is not kind of business I like. I'll just tie the launch to the dock here for the present. That'll hold her. She'll ride there till morning. You are coming, senor? Yeah, you bet. Andres, I'm going to make you deputy constable of hope. No, 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 senor. I do not wish it. What? Turn on a job with a title like that? Well, I think this is most deplorable business. It'd make everybody feel bad. All right, come along. I'll take your arm, Miss Stanley. You might stumble in the dark. If you wish. You better take Stanley's arm, too, Andres. Keep you from stepping on each other in the dark. Leave my arm alone. See, I was only trying to be helpful. Oh, if you'd only understand, Captain Friday, that Martin and I really haven't done anything. I think you've done plenty. Well, you'll be plenty sorry for putting handcuffs on me, I can tell you that much. Ten to one, you were thinking about making a break for it as soon as we landed. Well, supposing I was... I mean... Martin, you weren't. No, of course I wasn't. One good thing about Holman, it doesn't take any time to get from one place to another. There's the cottage. Oh, please, I hope we find everything all right with Carmen. Oh, sure we will. Now, look... The doctor must have worked himself free. He's turned on more lights. Oh, I hope this is a good sign. Well, it won't be long now before we know all about it. We've been saying that ever since we arrived, and we don't know anything about anything. You're some detective. Just enough of a detective to pick you up in the middle of San Francisco Bay, Stanley. Come on. Here we are. Andres, you and Stanley go in first. I'll follow with Miss Stanley. Hello. That you, Captain? Hmm. Got him, eh? Yep, we got him. I say, Stanley, whatever possessed you to tie me up? I wouldn't have stood in your way if I'd known you were determined to go. The heck you wouldn't. You threatened to lock me up if I made a move to leave the house. Perhaps so, but it never entered my head you'd be so savage about it. Dr. Croft, I, I'm terribly sorry that... that oh, Martin... oh, there, there now. I know the stress you young people have been under. Captain... Where's Carmel? What? Isn't she here? Carmel? Senor Doctor, is not Carmel with you? With me? Why? What? See here, Carmel's room is empty. Huh? I thought you'd taken her with you. Uh, Carmel, she is gone. Well, something has happened to Carmel. Shut up, Andres. See here, Doctor. She wasn't here when you got loose. Why? Captain, I... Quick, I want to see her room. You haven't touched anything, have you? I haven't laid my hands on a thing, Captain. Oh, Carmel. Here now. You folks stand back. 
Keep out of the room until I've made an examination. Play back out into the hall. Oh, Stanley, if you have done anything with my cousin, you'd better tell me. Honestly, I haven't got your cousin, Andres. Gemini, I'm not that kind of a guy. Well, somebody has. All right. Hi, doctor. Come here. What is it? What have you found? Uh, look at these tracks. Somebody tramped across the wet sand, climbed into the window, and came in here beside the sleeping girl's bed. Oh, no! Do you recognize those tracks, doctor? For heaven's sake, Captain... No. Do you? Yes. Those are the same tracks made by Andrew Walters the night he buried Miss Stanley in the sand. Oh, no. No. My Carmel buried in the sand. Oh, no. No. Once more, the prowling dead have made an appearance at Captain Friday's cottage. The last time the sinister figures appeared, Gail Stanley was buried alive in the sand. Is that the fate of Carmel? Listen next week at this same time for the tenth and final episode of Dead Men Prowl, titled The Prowling Dead Introduces Himself. The murderer is at last revealed by Captain Friday. You are listening to... Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents Dead Men Prowl, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Two days ago, Captain Bart Friday and his friend and guest, Dr. Croft, arrived in the little resort village of Holman, across the bay from San Francisco. They had intended spending a quiet weekend at Captain Friday's summer cottage, but they had no sooner arrived in the village when things began to happen. On the beach, they stumbled on the dead body of old Doc Sims. They found Andrew Waters, the other wealthy man of the village, dead by hanging. Then they found the half-wit Hartley boy shot through the heart. The weird part of the whole thing is the fact that these three dead are apparently prowling the streets and houses of the town of Holman. That right, Captain Friday? Yes, that's right. I've tried everything. Handcuffed them, tied them down, even stuffed the three bodies in the refrigeration room at the morgue. But it didn't do any good. They're still prowling. The only thing I know for certain is that Doc Sims and Andrew Waters are brothers. Walters had been masquerading under an assumed name. The half-wit Hartley boy had been accidentally shot by Andres Ruiz. I've smoked out that much, plus the fact that our other guests, Andres and Carmel Ruiz, and Gail and Martin Stanley, are related. But this latest development has just about got me stumped. Carmel Ruiz has disappeared. Yes, Carmel Ruiz has disappeared. The prowling dead have taken the little cousin of Andres. Death stalks in Holman. While Dr. Jamie Croft lay bound and gagged in Captain Friday's cottage, and while the captain and Andres were racing along the coast of the Pacific to bring back the runaway Martin and Gail Stanley, brother and sister, one of the prowling dead had somehow escaped from the ruins of the morgue. He escaped from the ruins to stalk into the rear window of the cottage and kidnap the sleeping Carmel. And the dead thing who did this was the strangled body of our own uncle, Andrew Walters, the prowler who earlier had buried Gail Stanley alive in the sand. And the reason Captain Friday knew it was Walters was that the prowler had left damp footsteps on the bedroom floor and on the wet sand outside the window. 
And those footprints were Andrew Walters. And the thing with the swollen face, dead eyes, and a rope around its neck had Carmel Ruiz in his possession. Andres Ruiz, cousin of Carmel, is beside himself over the disappearance of Carmel. He is pacing the floor in Captain Friday's summer cottage. But I will go crazy. I will kill myself if anything have happened to my Carmel. If you do not find her, Senor Captain, I will go mad. Now, take it easy, Andres. Sit down, will you? You get on my nerves pacing up and down like that. But Captain Friday... Now look here, Andres, be reasonable. There's no use running around the country. We'd never find her that way. If you'll just hang on to yourself for a minute... You have idea? Well, I might have if you'd be quiet for just two minutes. Oh, in two minutes I will be mad. I do not know what I do now. Well, look here, Andres. I, I can't tell you how sorry I am. I haven't the faintest idea of what happened to Carmel. Well, you have shown very bad nature, Senor Stanley. I do not know what to believe about you. I don't blame you for saying that. It's true, and I know it, and I'm sorry. Well, for why have you done all these things? Say bad things. Try to run away. I don't know. I'm always pulling something I'm sorry for afterwards, but look here, Andres. If there's anything I can do to help save Carmel, I'll go the limit to do it. And he means it too, Andres. Yes, I think he does. Hey, look, everyone. I've got a hunch. I'm going out for three or four minutes, and you four stay here. Don't one of you dare move out of this room. Not out of the room? Not a move. Like company, Captain? No, not this time, Dr. Croft. I've got to travel fast. Anyway, I'd like you to stay here with the others. You'll all be safer. But what about your own safety, Captain? Don't worry. I'll be okay. Now, mind now. Don't even leave the room. Where do you suppose he's going? Oh, if he will only bring back Carmel. Oh, I hope he does. I feel we should be doing something. Oh, see, but Captain Friday said to wait here. It's all nonsense sitting around in one room when we might be out searching. You are nervous too, Senor Doctor. Oh, it is enough to make everybody crazy. But still, Captain Friday said he had an idea. Yes, but supposing it is wrong, Miss Stanley. You're right there, Andres. Theories are very dangerous things to work with. They're as apt to be wrong as right. And still, I have very great faith in this, Captain. Oh, yes, we must believe in him. We'd be lost if we didn't. Well, who else have we to turn to? Well, there's Dr. Croft here. I'm afraid I'm not much of a detective, Stanley. I tell you, it is not possible that my uncle Andrew Walters took Carmel. It is not possible. He's dead. The dead have done a number of impossible things lately, I'm afraid, Andres. Oh, I know, but I see with my own eyes the walls of the morgue fall down on all three bodies. They are pinned under hundreds of tons of stone and mortar. That's a wonder you and the captain weren't killed. Well, we would have been if we had not seen the walls falling and running to the ice-cold room, which protected us a little from the falling stones. A remarkable escape, Andres. Oh, but what I am interested in is about these bodies. They are buried deep under the walls, and, and yet one of the dead men have carried off Carmel. Open the door. Somebody open the door, quick. Oh, it is the captain. I will open. I will open it. Carmel! Carmel, you found Carmel. Oh, get out of the way, Andres. Can't you see she's tied hand and foot? Is she hurt, Captain? Is she hurt? Oh, no. Here, let me put her on the lounge. Here is knife, senor. Cut her loose. Here, here. For the love of Mike, Andres, get out from underfoot. She is not hurt. Tell me she's not hurt. Oh, Carmel, please, you mustn't cry like that. You mustn't. Uh, there. Here, Andres, take the knife and cut her legs free. See, si, see, si, senor. I will do anything. Oh, Carmel, but it is good you are safe. Poor kid. Get back, you folks. Don't crowd in so close around her. Here, Captain. Let me give her a couple of these tablets. She mustn't go on like that. Will they quiet her? I think they will. Here, child. Swallow these and then take a sip of water. Is there anything I can do, Dr. Croft? No, I think not. She's just highly wrought up. She'll grow quiet in a few minutes. Here, Andres. You sit here beside her. She was calling for you when I found her. She... She was calling for me. Oh, senor. She, she was calling for me. Oh, never again will I let you out of my sight. You know, Gail, that, that Andres isn't such a bad fellow either. I knew he was in love with Carmel the moment I first saw them together. But, Captain, where was Carmel? Where did you find her? Well, if you've examined this cottage closely, you'll notice that the backs of the closets have not been finished off. You can go through the back in among the floor studdings and rafters. Oh, yes. Yes, I noticed that. Well, my old aunt used to put junk that she didn't want to throw away back in them. I found Carmel stuffed back among the joists and studdings of her own closet. I oh, do. But no. what made you look there? Well, then you must have carried her through the back window and, and around to the front door. Yes, I did, all right. But what for? Did it to throw our would-be murderer off the trail. Off the trail? You, you mean he's around here? Maybe, maybe not. But why didn't we hear her crying? 
She was gagged. Captain, what made you think of looking in the house for her? Uh, it would have been too dangerous to take her out. He might have been spotted. Besides, the tracks he left when he went away showed he wasn't carrying anything. No, I remember it, Captain. That was the same clue you got when we were hunting Miss Stanley here, when she was buried in the sand. Well, you'd think even a dead body would learn not to make the same mistake twice in a row. And so you figured out the body must be in the house. How did you happen to think of looking in the girl's own wardrobe? Well, I figure he'd probably be working fast, not knowing how long I'd be gone. Besides, Dr. Croft, you were tied up in the other room. Might get free at any minute. Yes. Quite natural when you stop to think of it. And so, uh, from force of necessity, you figured he'd hide her in the handiest place. Mm -hmm. Force of necessity and craftiness. He'd hardly expect us to look so near the scene of the crime for her. Oh, uh, Andre seems to have Carmel quieted. Perhaps we can talk to her now. We'll have a try, anyhow. And Carmel, you're not going to cry anymore, eh? Oh, we're going to be very happy, you and I. Aren't you, Keith? Well, Carmel, you don't look like the same young lady I carried in a few minutes ago. Oh, but, senor, she understands now that she's going to be very happy for the rest of her life. Yeah? Uh, look here, Carmel, you feel like talking? Yes. Please, you will not bring back bad memories? I'm sorry, Andres, but we've got to get all the information we can. Please, Andres, I don't mind. If you'll sit beside me. Oh, nothing in the world could make me move. Okay. Now then, tell us what happened. I, I was asleep when, when something touched me. And, and I opened my eyes and... <laughs> oh, please, Cap. I'm all right, Andres. And there was a horrible face looking down at me. It didn't look like it was alive. And there was a rope around its neck. Oh, it is a monstrous thing. What did you do? When he saw it was awake put his hand over my mouth. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. He held me so tight, I fought just as hard as I could. Oh, my poor Carmel. And, and one of his fingers slipped into my mouth, and I bit down on it just as hard as I could. You, you, bit, you bit his finger, huh? Yes. And when he jerked it away, there was blood on his hand. Captain, a dead man doesn't bleed. No, he doesn't. Oh. No. Yes, that's just what I was thinking. What then, Carmel? Well, he put a cloth around my face so I couldn't see or scream after he tied me up so I couldn't move. He carried me someplace. But if it is live, man? Captain, my uncle could not be alive and dead at the same time. Never heard of it being done before. But if there's a live man mixed up in this thing, we ought to get after him. Yes, but where would we look? I think that'll be easy. You mean, you know where he is? I have a hunch I can walk out that door into the hallway and march our friend Andrew Walters back in here in jig time. Oh, no. What are you saying? You mean he's listening to us on the other side of the door? I have a hunch he's been listening, all right. Oh. Dr. Croft, you mind coming with me? Not at all. You armed? No, but... Never mind. I don't think we'll have much trouble. Now, you folks stay here. And I mean right where you are. I'll be back in two minutes with Andrew Walters, dead or alive. <laughs> Captain Friday has promised the four young people, Andres and Carmel Ruiz and Gail and Martin Stanley, that he would return in two minutes with Andrew Walters, the man who was found hanged in his home. The eyes of the four are fixed on the doorway as it opens slowly and cautiously. <gasps> That's him! That's Andrew Walters! Oh, he's the one that choked me. The rope around his neck. Oh, oh no! All right, go on in. I've got a gat in your back oh, and I won't hesitate Take him to away! Off. Take him away. It's all right. I have his hands cuffed together behind him. He can't hurt you. But who is he? Hey, don't you who? see? Don't you see? He's got on one of those rubber face masks. Oh, no. What is this? Captain Friday, where's Dr. Croft? Don't you know? But, Captain, it is Dr. Croft behind that mask. Oh, uh -huh, sure. Have a look. Uh, Captain Friday, would you mind removing that rope from around my neck? It has an ugly feeling. Now, see here, Doctor, I'm giving you your choice. Do you tell him or do I? Why? It will make a very pleasant story. I think I should like to tell it. All right, go ahead. My dear nieces and nephews. What's that? What did you say? 
For why do you call us nieces and nephews? Because it happens due to certain biologic and sociological phenomena to be true. Oh, cut that stuff out. Who are you, anyway? <laughs> oh, very like Doc Sims you are in temperament, boy. Nuts. As to who I am, do you recall the autobiography left by Andrew Walters, alias Vance Sims? Do you recall that there was a third brother, Franklin Sims, who was murdered in the Near East? I am Franklin Sims. Right, Captain? That's right. Get along with the story, Doctor. Oh, yeah, quite right. Uh, you see, uh, that night 20 years ago, we got news that our father was dying. The night Doc Sims took Vance out and got him thoroughly intoxicated and then hit me over the head and dumped me in a nasty-smelling river. Then Doc Sims, not Andrew Walters, was the murderer. Oh, no, there was no murderer. For I crawled out of the river and foul and smelly as I was from the thick river water, I continued to live. But, but if you are who you say you are... Why didn't you come back to the United States at once and claim your part of the estate? Because, my dear, for almost three years I was so horribly ill, I spent most of my time balancing on the brink between life and death. Later, I went to Germany and I became a medical student. And still you didn't try to get your share of the money? My life had become a thing apart from my family and my rightful estate. I intended never to return to America. And then about 12 years ago, everything became changed again. I became interested in certain biological experimentations. I spent every cent I had saved, could earn and borrow, and still I needed more. And then I remembered the great fortune which had been taken from me in America. I determined to get it back by fair means or foul. It was mine, and I determined to have it. But, senor, it was not us who had hurt Wait a minute, Andres. I returned to San Francisco under the assumed name of Dr. Jamie Croft and set up office while I got the lay of the land. When I first arrived, my brother Doc Sims held the entire estate. It seemed an easy matter to put him out of their way. <laughs> Enter my claim. And then I discovered that he had a niece and a nephew to whom the property would go in the case of his death. That's you, Miss Stanley, and your brother Martin. And while I was trying to find some means of overcoming this difficulty, who should come on the scene but Andrew Walters? And without any fuss, he took over half the Sims estate. It took me three years to discover that he was my other brother, Vance. And then, by a bit of housebreaking and prowling, I discovered that he too had a niece and nephew whom he favored in case of his death. They were you, Carmel, and you, Andres. Yes, go on. Well... In the meantime, I was working out a little scheme which worked rather nicely when the time came. About eight years ago, my brother, Doc Sims, died. Hey, what's that? Our uncle died eight years ago? Yes, all of eight years ago. And being on the ground at the time, I quietly buried the body and stepped into his shoes. Now, wait a minute, Doctor. I've known both you and Doc Sims for more than two years. Which says a great deal for my ability as an impersonator. Do you mean to say that you've been acting the part of two doctors for eight years? I have sufficient proof for even you, Captain Friday. But, but the body. We saw the body of Doc Sims. That, my dear, was also a plant. For the last year, I have been taking care of an old chap over in my San Francisco office. He was a nondescript without any family. But he looked remarkably like me in my role of Doc Sims. For six months, I practically made him live with narcotics and drugs, waiting for the proper time to inject him into the picture. And when Andrew Walters mellowed and sent for Andreas and Carmel to come and live with him, I knew the time was at hand. Yeah? Well, you'll have to explain that a little. Easily. My whole trouble lay in the four cousins who were to inherit the two estates. They must be gotten rid of. With all four in Holman... I believe that might be attended to. You were going to kill us all. And so when my brother Vance, or Andrew Walters, as you know him, called you two, I sent for Gail and Martin Stanley. What about this old fellow you passed off for Doc Sims? <laughs> now, Captain, I assure you I didn't kill him. The poor chap died a natural death. Take his body out of the morgue ruins, show it to any coroner. Worn out body will be the verdict. Mm. Died mighty handy for you. Quite, but the point is he did die, and naturally. Uh, which, by the way, gave me the idea for the rest of this amusing little drama which has occurred since. And you admit that you're responsible for the movement of these bodies from the morgue? Naturally. And you admit burying Gail Stanley alive? My apology, Miss Stanley, but it was necessary to my plan. Oh, you, you must be mad. Oh, quite sane, thank you, quite sane. 
And, by the way, Captain, I had to rush like the deuce to get Andrew Walter's shoes back on him before you and Martin got to the morgue. But I made it all right. Yes, so I notice. And you're the guy that took a shot at me in Doc Sim's study and clubbed Captain Friday over the head. Again, my apologies. I always was a bad shot. Now you put us out and then took the papers out of the safe and stuck them in the pocket of your substitute, Doc Sims, and left his body where we'd find it. Exactly. Well, what for? To impress you all with the fact that dead bodies actually were on the prowl. And you leave Carmel's handkerchief in Dr. Sims' house. Why you do that? Oh, that was simply a little touch to implicate you, Andres, and to cause dissension between you and Stanley here. Nice fellow. And it was you who shot at me from the hall when we were upstairs examining Andrew Walter's room? <laughs> you know, Captain... I think that was my masterpiece. Uh, how did you do it? Why, I, I simply had the Hartley boy's body handy. When you, Carmel, and Andres were in the room, I crept upstairs. I got the body, I took a crack at Andres, I shouted, and I rolled down the stairs with a half-wit's body. Oh, oh sacrament. Startling bit of realism, eh, Captain? Dr. Croft, hmm. were, were you the one that got us to go to the refrigeration room of the morgue? I thought I had all of you that time. After knocking the captain out, I ran to the cottage and, changing my voice as much as possible, told you to go to the basement of the morgue. When you rushed in, I swung the door shut and... There you were. Please, when we liked you so much, how could you do that to us? Oh, let's not go into that, please. Well, then I set the three bodies on guard. Startling effect, eh, Captain? Mm. Then you came back and dragged me in the closet with you and locked the door. <laughs> And all the time, we were breaking down the door. I had the key in my pocket. Seems to me I'm the guy that told you once that the solution to this business, once I got my hands on it, would be so simple I'd blush to think I didn't get wise to it sooner. Well, get an eyeful of me blushing. Oh, see here, Captain, you're not giving me enough credit. I admit, however, I made a couple of mistakes. One of them was forgetting to turn off the light in the bar. If I hadn't been in such a hurry that time, you'd never have thought of searching the morgue until it was too late. Let's see here, Doctor. How did you fix it so that the halfway took a shot at me and then fell down the stairs? Simple. I braced the body against the handrail and hooked a gun in his coat. Fastened the trigger to the door with a piece of wire. Presto, when the door opened, the gun exploded and the body lunged down the stair. Mm-hmm. Good thing for me you didn't allow for the up-jerk of the muzzle of the revolver when it went off. <laughs> I told you I didn't know much about guns, Captain. After all, I'm a medical man, not a gangster. But why did you kill the half-wit boy? Surely he didn't... Oh, that I know nothing about. You didn't kill the boy? Please. Please, he did not. I... I did not know it until the senor captain told me, but... It was I who did this thing. Andres! Uh -huh. Andres, you didn't! Oh, please, Carmel, it was a most horrible mistake. It's like this. Remember the night you kids saw the skeleton on the beach and Andres shot at it? Well, the skeleton was the half-wit boy, and Andres killed him. His father had given him several rubber masks and some luminous paint for Halloween, and the foolish boy continued to use it to amuse himself. The boy's father knows all about this now. And uh, that, by the way, is where I got that mask you recently saw on my face. I found it lying outside the morgue. Dr. Croft, what was your idea in blowing up the morgue? Oh, Captain, you cannot imagine how uneasy a person grows having a bloodhound like yourself on his trail. I grew more and more certain that you were beginning to suspect the truth. So, I laid the trap and got you and Andres off on a pretext of hearing a woman scream. Well, I'm glad I knocked you over the head. Too bad I didn't do a better job of it. <laughs> I get your point exactly, Martin. The real sim spirit. Oh, I never want to hear that name again. You see, you made your big mistake, Doctor, when you kidnapped Carmel here. I was plain crazy. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right, Captain. But I was getting rather upset. Things were growing a little too warm. You'll have to excuse it on that basis, I'm afraid. You see, I'd stolen Andrew Walter's shoes again before I set the trap in the morgue. But I must confess, I entirely forgot to make deep tracks in the sand when I left. Ah! <sighs> Juicy thoughtless of me. Yes. So was that stunt of hiding your mask and rope and shoes in your medicine case after you'd finished with them. Undoubtedly. Oh, I can see a number of things I'd do differently if I were going to do it over again. You know, one thing puzzles me, though. How did you get the body of this substitute Doc Sims on the beach? <laughs> Captain, I don't know if you realize it, but I angled like the juice to get you to bring me over to Homan on this particular weekend. 
Yeah, now that I think of it, you were plenty eager to come. Well, I got the invitation. The day we were to come over, I took the body in my launch and I brought it over. The natives seldom walk on the beach, so I felt perfectly safe in leaving it there for a few hours. I got back to San Francisco just in time to meet you. Then we came over together. Oh. I presume you know we've got enough attempted murder charges against you to keep you behind bars for life. But you're not going to use them, are you, Captain? You think not? Drag these children through the mire of prosecuting their own uncle? Bring all this family history to light? Oh, no. We don't want to do that. I, I couldn't bear it. Exactly. That's just too bad. Now, look, Captain Friday, haven't we gone through enough? Are you folks crazy? I think the police department would like to have a little talk with Dr. Croft. As a matter of fact... Come in. Hey, for crying out loud, Cappy, I've been... Oh, excuse me. I didn't know you had company. <laughs> oh, that's all right, Skip. These people are all friends. Yeah? Well, you sure got some nice friends, boss. Mm. Now, this is Gail Stanley. Miss Stanley, my right-hand man, Skip Turner. Hello, Skip. Howdy, Miss Stanley. And uh, Miss Carmel Ruiz. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Turner? Miss Ruiz. Well, now, ain't that funny? You know, I think I remember meeting you before, Miss Ruiz. Um, uh, Carmel? Wasn't it down Skip. at, uh... Skip. Huh? Did you come all the way from San Francisco just to meet my guests? Huh? Oh, hey, I almost forgot. We got an important job down south. Down south? Where down south? Hollywood. Here, here's a telegram. Who's it from? Don't say. Go ahead and read it. Hmm. Meet me at Maggie's Intimate Drinking Salon... Sunset Strip, Hollywood, tonight at 8. Signed, A Desperate Sister. And what is this, a gag? Gag? I just got a phone call from the same gal, and she wired us $1,000 expense money. Why did she phone? I'm just be sure it would be there at 8 o'clock tonight. Hey, look, we just got time to catch a 5 p.m. plane south. That's why I hustled over here. I got the tickets. She must be desperate. Come on, we ain't got no time to lose, boss. Okay, Skip, we'll look into it. Oh, by the way, you got your handcuffs? Why, sure, why? Yeah, just slip them on Dr. Croft here. We'll drop them off at the Hall of Justice. You bet you. Here you are, fella. And the other one. There you go. Nice little charm bracelet. Well, see here, Captain Friday, I can afford Save to... Save it for the judge, Dr. Croft. He loves those little stories. The rest of you check in with the police in San Francisco. I'll see you as soon as I get back from Hollywood. All right, let's go. Yeah. Oh, uh, Carmel, if uh, you should happen to be in Hollywood in the Come next on, few Skip. days... There's a desperate sister waiting for us in Maggie's intimate drinking salon. Let's get moving. So Captain Friday and his operative Skip Turner are headed for Maggie's intimate drinking salon on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood. The telegram's said to be there at 8 o'clock tonight and was sent by one who signed herself a desperate sister. Tune in next week at the same time for this newest adventure thriller by Carton E. Morse, titled, You'll Be Dead in a Week. You are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... You'll be dead in a week, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Nine o'clock in the evening, somewhere out on the Strip to the west of Hollywood. In case you don't know, the Strip is a portion of Sunset Boulevard, which runs through and adjacent to some of the more exclusive residential districts between Hollywood and the Pacific Ocean. In the Strip are some of the more expensive shops, salons, and eating and drinking places. The Strip is not a portion of Los Angeles Captain Friday and his operative Skip Turner would be apt to patronize. Certainly not the flossy drinking establishments with soft lights, boudoir furnishings, and intimate music. 
And yet, here they are, Captain Friday and Skip Turner, uncomfortably seated on two small chairs before a too small table in a half-lighted corner of Maggie's Intimate Drinking Salon. Hey, Captain. Huh? You showing up trying to bore me to death. Yeah, you aren't any more bored than I am. Well, then what are we a-sticking here for? All this plush and soft lights and elegance. Business. We gonna do business in Maggie's Intimate Drinking Saloon? <laughs> Not saloon. S-A-L-O-N? Salon. Well, pardon me while I arch my pinky. Hmm. I asked you a question, Captain. Did you? Yeah. What kind of business we got here in Maggie's place? By the way, where is Maggie? I don't know. Well, it says Maggie's Saloon. Salon. Yeah. All the folks I've seen is a hat check girl out yonder, the one waiter, and the bartender in the next room. Now, you know, that ain't very many people. Not a very large establishment. Yeah. Seat about 20 or 30 at the most. That's what it means by Maggie's intimate drinking salon. Small, quiet, and exclusive. Yeah, darn exclusive, if you ask me. We're all the guests they got. Isn't there anyone in the other room? No, nope, I can see in there. Nobody but the bartender and the piano player. That makes four of them and only two of us. Piano player, bartender, waiter, and hat check girl. Now, look at Cap, about this hat check girl. Skip right yeah. at the moment we're not interested in hat check girls. Who ain't interested in a hat check girl? I... Oh, you mean the business we got here? Right. Oh. Okay, spill it. Just a minute. Waiter's coming over. Why? We don't want no more of this stuff. Order anyway. Uh, will there be something more, gentlemen? I guess so. Same as before. And you, sir? Yeah, bring me a glass of milk. Uh, milk? That's what I said, milk. I beg your pardon? Go on, get me a glass of milk and quit looking like you never heard of the stuff. I will see what can be done. Hey, and wait a minute. Yes. Why ain't that piano player in there playing? It is a little early in the evening yet. Well, it ain't early if he's got paying customers, is it? I will have to pick that up with him. You do that, will you? And tell him to rip off uh, the last roundup or the Dogtown Strutters Ball, something like that. I will mention your suggestions to him, Dogtown Strutters Ball. <laughs> no, I don't think he cares for me. Can you blame him? When did you take up milk as a beverage? Oh, I'm just ordering milk now on account of it makes our waiters a darn mad. He takes it as a personal insult. <laughs> hey, what's that? Letter? Well, yeah, I can see it's a letter. Hey, does it explain the reason for our being here? Yeah. Want to hear it? Why, sure. Kind of fancy paper, ain't it? Ain't that a girl's handwriting? Yes, it's fancy paper and it's a girl's handwriting. Anything else you want to know? Yeah, what's it say? If you'll keep still long enough, I'll read it. Okay, shoot. Letter signed Eve Carson, girl who wired us in San Francisco. This is what she says. It will be very much to your advantage to meet me in Maggie's intimate drinking salon on the strip sometime between 8 and 9 this evening. I will come directly to your table and join you as though I were an old friend. Please treat me as such. What I have to say to you will take only a few moments, but will mean a great deal to me as well as to you and your friend, Eve Carson. Is that all? That's all. And that's why we're here. Meet Eve Carson and treat her like an old friend. That's right. Yeah, let me have a look at that letter. Go ahead. Very much to your advantage to meet me. Hmm. Does she mean by that that uh, she's young and good-looking, you suppose? Yeah, give me that letter. Well, I always did say it was to a fellow's advantage to meet a young, good-looking girl. But look, you cap, she said between eight and nine, and it's ten minutes after nine right now. Yeah, I know. You mean she ain't coming? Hmm. You know as much as I do. But if she's not coming... Hold it. Waiter's coming back. Mm hmm Well, hi, sport. See you found some milk. Quite. Sure, I knew you'd find some if you try. However, I am to inform you this is positively the last milk I can serve. This is all, huh? Positively. Don't know any accommodating cows personally, I don't suppose. If you please. Okay, let it go. Hey, did you talk to the piano player? I did. Well, why ain't he playing? He is not so disposed. He's what? He is not so disposed. Now, what kind of talk's that? Did you tell him I asked for him to play? I did. And what did he say? I'd rather not say. Oh, he did, did he? Well, darn, he's ornery high. Hey, Skip, sit uh, down. But, but, son... Sit down. Here you are, waiter. Keep the change. Uh, thank you. Okay, beat it. With the greatest pleasure. Captain Friday, we're being insulted by the whole outfit. You started it. Me? You've been riding the waiter ever since we came in. Yeah, but I ain't done nothing to the piano player. I mean, not yet, I ain't. And you're not going to do anything to him either. Just rough him up a little, maybe? No. 
He a friend of yours? No. Well, then what hurt? We aren't starting anything in this place until we know why we're here. Well, it don't look to me like we're ever going to know. Your girlfriend Eve Carson said between 8 and 9 and at 9.15 right now. Wait a minute. And... Somebody's coming in. Oh, sure enough. More customers. No women, though. You can see out in the hallway? Yeah, three men. Giving up the coach to the hat check girl. Huh. Funny place for three men to come without women. Well, after all, we came without women. For a reason. Besides, we expected to meet a woman here. And here they come. Yeah. Sitting down across the room from us. Queer looking setup. Skip. Yeah. Do you have to stare at him? Huh? Was I? Yeah. Now relax. Hey, do you see what I see? What do you see? Well, two of our three customers are gorillas. They're toting pistols, and they don't seem to care who knows it. Huh. Well, on the flea bit side, they don't seem to have much in common with the third member of the party. Yeah, he's a kind of nice-looking fella, ain't he? Now, what you suppose he's doing associating with them kind of monkeys? Skip, stop looking in their direction. Yeah? Why? They know we're talking about them. They don't like it. So they don't like it. Now, look, Skip. We came here for a special purpose. We don't care why a good-looking, well-dressed, obviously cultured young man is associating with a couple of thugs. It's none of our business. Okay, fella. Hey, waiter. Now what do you want? Hey, waiter. Uh, you spoke to me? That's right. Get me another glass of milk. I think I told you there is no more milk. Now, look, am I going to have trouble with you? I beg your pardon? Get me another glass of milk. And perhaps uh, you'd prefer to go to some other establishment. No, I wouldn't prefer to go to some other establishment. Get me a glass of milk and step on it. I will see what I can do. Well, go on and do it. Next thing he'll be wanting is a nursing bottle. <laughs> you hear that? <laughs> yeah. What are you antagonizing him for, Skip? You really don't want any more milk? I know it. It's just that I'm bored. Besides, he's been a trying to hi-hat us all evening. <laughs> hey, will you excuse me for a minute? Skip, sit down. No, I got something I got to attend to. Well, at least tell me what you're up to so I can be prepared. <laughs> well, sir, I'm going in there and talk to the piano player for a minute. What about Music, son, music. What do you talk to piano players about? Look, Skip, take it easy. This place is loaded with dynamite. Yeah? Yeah. Now watch your step. Oh, shucks, Captain. Can't do no hurt just having a little music lesson. Well, hi, son. You the whole doggone symphony orchestra in this here joint? That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> Mind if I lean on your piano? Why not? Thanks. My name's Skip Turner. Yeah? Mm-hmm. That's my sidekick in yonder, Captain Bart Friday. So what? Oh, nothing. That's a funny joint you got here. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Why? Well, it's all dolled up like a woman's bedroom. If you don't like it, there's lots of other places on the strip. Sure, I know. Funny thing, though, it don't seem like this was the kind of place that would attract a couple of gunslinging gorillas, now does it? Huh? What's the matter? There's a couple of trigger men in here now. Why, sure. You surprised? Why do you come in here and tell me? Sit down. Stop looking over your shoulder. I still want to know why you came in here and told me. Just thought you might be interested. Oh, here comes the waiter with my milk. In here, waiter. You always drink milk? Not always. Sometimes more than others. How about having a real drink on the house? Nope. Thanks, just the same. Oh, you wish your milk served here? Yeah, I'll tell you. Hey, did you ever try sipping milk like wine? Tastes all right. Oh, oh. You threw that milk in my face. Yeah, I threw that glass of milk in your face. How oh, dare you? Listen, son, don't ever try to serve me no Mickey Finn. Don't never do it. Especially in a glass of milk. You threw that milk in my face. Look at my uniform. Hold. Maybe you want to make something of it? Well, what's the matter with you, piano player? Sit down. This ain't your party. That's right. It ain't my party, is it? Oh, what about it, waiter? You want we should bounce each other around for a while, or she will call it quits? Bear, ill bread clod. And there he goes. Call me an ill bread clod on account I didn't drink his Mickey Finn. We don't save Mickey Finns in this place. The heck you don't. We don't save Mickey Finns in this place. Well, son, I'm awful sorry to have to differ with you, but that waiter sure enough tried to dish me up one in that glass of milk. I think it's time you and your friends were leaving. Hey, is that friendly? You're more trouble than you're worth. Get your things and get out. You don't say. Yeah. You know, fella, you almost talk like you was the owner of this joint. I am. Oh, now, come on. Don't give us that stuff. Says right on a sign outside the door that this is Maggie's drinking emporium. I'm Maggie. He... <laughs> no kidding. And I want you and your pal out of here in two minutes. And just to prove it... Hey. You're now looking down the muzzle of a 38. <laughs> Cap 
Captain Friday and his right-hand man, Skip Turner, rushed from San Francisco to Hollywood on a strange and mysterious mission. They were directed to Maggie's intimate drinking salon on the Sunset Strip, where they were to meet a certain Eve Carson. So far, all they've discovered is Maggie, and Skip has just found out that Maggie is a pretty tough customer. I'm Maggie. He... <laughs> no kidding. I want you and your pal out of here in two minutes, and just to prove it... Hey. You're now looking down the muzzle of a 38. Well, darn if I ain't. Hey, that was a cute trick, flipping a pistol out of your coat that away. Never mind the compliment. Gather up your pal and get going. Can you play that 38 as good as you play the piano? I hope for your sake I don't have to show you. Yeah. Well, I'm mighty glad to see you're standing up. What do you mean? Because I just hate hitting a fellow when he's sitting down. <laughs> Oh, goodness, son. You sure did go down easier than I expected. Feeling kind of rubbery in the knees? Mm-hmm. Well, it's just like I always said. A fella shouldn't never ought to pull a gun unless he intends to use it. <laughs> fella, you're just playing out on your feet. <laughs> that's it. Sit down. Okay, sprawl on a piano if that's how you feel. I gotta be getting back to Captain Friday. Nice meeting you. Be seeing you later. Hey, Captain, you... Well, I'll be doggone, a little old female girl. Where'd you get her, boss? Don't pay any attention to him. He's only Skip Turner. Hello, honey. Hello, Skip. She's ours all right, ain't she? What's that? I mean, she's a little old Eve Carson, sugar, we've been waiting for. Yes, she's Eve Carson. Where'd we get her? She came in while you were in the other room with the piano player. What happened? Oh, I had to smack him a little. He's in there now with his head in his arms, laying over the keyboard, listening to the birdies. And say, you know who he is? No. Do you? Why, sure, he told me. He's Maggie. Maggie? Sure, you know. Maggie's in him a drinking saloon. Salon, Skip. Yeah. Ain't that a heck of a name for a man? Maggie. Well, his name isn't Maggie. But he said he owned this place. That's right, but his name isn't Maggie. Well, he can't amount to very much. Playing his own piano, acting as his own bouncer in his own little dive. That's where you're mistaken. Skip. Yeah? How did you get away with it? Well, you mean socking him? Yes. People don't smack Blackie North. Who's Blackie North? The owner of this place, the man you hit, a gang leader and plenty dangerous. Him dangerous? Yes. And what I want to know is why hasn't one of his trigger men shot holes in you? Trigger men? See here, who are you anyway? Eve Carson. Sure, we know that. But who are you? Why did you ask us to meet you in this hangout? Why is it to our advantage to meet you? Who's Blackie North and why does he have trigger men? And what connection have you with him? Well, that's a lot of questions. And I want a lot of answers. You'll get them. Don't worry. Yeah, and there's one more thing I want to answer, too. What's that? I want to know why that good-looking boy and them two gorillas across the room haven't taken their eyes off you since I come back to the table. And you'll get an answer to that, too. You mean those three men over there are in this, too? Yes. Those two rats are a couple of Blackie North's torpedoes. Yeah? And who's the good-looking dude? Oh, that's Wesley. Wesley, huh? Yes, my brother, Wes Carson. Oh, Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Captain, that there's her brother, Wes Carson. Yeah, I heard him. Apparently, Wesley doesn't like his sister out with a couple of strange men in a dump of this kind. And I don't know as I blame him so much at that. Hey, how about me going over and introducing myself and bringing him over here? Oh, no. Why not? For two reasons. First? Well, one of those gunmen will prob probably blow a hole in anyone who goes near Wes. You don't say. Second? What? You said you had two reasons for not going after your brother. Oh, Oh, second. Well, I, I've got to tell you why I asked you to come here before anything more happens. Oh, you're expecting something more to happen? Well, it's bound to since Skip here slapped Blackie North around. Okay. Relax and tell us about it. Well, first, I, I've got to tell you who Wes and I are. We're the only members of our family left. I'm 24 and Wesley's 28. And between us, we're worth maybe a million, maybe two million dollars. Oh, God, a little old female gold mine. Oh, well, that's what a lot of the smart boys thought. Nobody's worked me yet. Yeah? Go on with your story, Eve. Oh, yes. We came to California about two years ago after Father, our last living relative, died in the East. We loved it out here. The first year, just getting acquainted. All the resorts and places to play. Oh, it was wonderful. Finally, about a year ago, we rented a house in Beverly Hills because Wes thought it would be fun to be near Hollywood and thought we might get acquainted with some of the motion picture crowd. What's all this leading to? To what's happening tonight. I'm almost through now. About 
Two weeks ago, something happened to my brother. He was coming downstairs to breakfast one morning when he suddenly lost consciousness and plunged head first downstairs. Oh, I get it. He bumped his head in the fall and he ain't been the same ever since. And now he's mixing with gangsters. No, I, I almost wish it was that. What did happen? Well, he wasn't hurt in the fall, but he went to our doctor to find out why he lost consciousness. And why did he? Well, that's the whole story. There's something dreadful the matter with him. Something incurable. I I don't know much about it. All I know is the doctor told Wes, in a week, you'll be dead. What's that? Hey, he didn't. Yes, he did. In so many words, in a week, you'll be dead. You didn't just take one doctor's word for it. Oh, no. We checked with three other specialists. And they all say in a week your brother Oviando will be dead? Yes. Well, where do we come into the picture? Well... Well, I heard about you boys, read about some of your adventures. I mean, you sounded like the, the kind of men a couple of people in trouble could depend on. You're darn tootin', honey. Just a minute, Skip. Huh? Let's hear what you have in mind first, Miss Carson. Well, it's perfectly simple. Naturally, when Wes heard the bad news, he was hit pretty hard. He didn't make a big scene or anything, but he kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, What have I got to lose? And he's been running wild ever since? Well, he's been doing everything he can think of that amuses him. Hmm. And right now, it amuses him to be tied up with Blackie North and his bunch of cutthroats. Yes. And what do you want us to do? Look, he's only got a week more to live. Well? Well, if, if you two could, could sort of look out for him, take care of him, protect him. Protect him from what? What? Well, from himself, I, I suppose. <laughs> It's a funny assignment. Oh, no, it isn't. Look, you don't understand. Well, if he's got to die, at least he can die with a family name clean, not, not as a criminal. Well, say some more. What else? Well, that's, that's all. Get him out of Blackie North's clutches. Keep him out of the hands of the police. Keep him from losing his life in some crazy or criminal experience or from committing suicide when he's low in his mind. Keep him from hurting himself or anyone else for this week that's left. Hey, now, that's an order that is an order. In other words, your brother figures he's got just a week to live, so what difference does it make what he does or how he does it? Yes, that's it exactly. Well, honey, uh, it ain't pleasant to say, but what difference does it make? Oh, no, he mustn't. Well, he's fine and clean and good. He's always lived that way until... until this happened. He can't become something evil now, something that society once wiped out, something to make sensational headlines for the paper. Oh, no, he mustn't. If I get you right, you want us to curb his last week of fun just so you can write he was a good man on his tombstone. You're wrong. You were never more wrong. I want him to have all the fun and excitement he wants. All I'm asking is that you folks keep him out of trouble, keep him out of jail, keep him from harm or violence. Oh. So that's it. And him not caring what he does. Well, it's worth $10,000 to me. Ten grand? <clears throat> Cappy, that ain't hay. You mean that? Ten thousand and expenses. And here's a thousand in small bills to show good faith. Yeah? What about it, Skip? Put that grand in your pocket before she changes her mind. All right, Miss Carson, it's a bargain. And a bad one, if I'm not mistaken. It won't be easy. The police are looking for Wes right now. What's that? Hey, you didn't tell us that. Well, why should I? Hey, Cappy. Trouble's coming up. What sort of trouble? Well, I've been watching the hat check girl. This is the third time she's turned customers away. She keeps telling people the place is full up. Not letting anyone in, huh? Uh-huh. Blackie North still unconscious on the piano in the next room? Yep. Still laying just like a laughter. Miss Carson. Yes? I think our first move to help your brother will be to free him from those two trigger men over there. Well, they're just Blackie North's men. If you really want to help him, free him from Blackie North. Eventually. But first, we'll wrap up those two gorillas. Skip. Yeah. I'll go get them. Hey, what about me? You sit tight with Miss Carson. Keep an eye on the next room and especially watch the back door. Don't let anyone poke a gun through a crack and open up on us. Oh, you'll be shot down before you get halfway across the room to my brother. Are those two men with your brother? Yes. <laughs> watch and see. Keep me covered, Skip. Dive in when I yell. You bet you. Why, Skip, what's the matter with Captain Friday? He acts like he was drunk. Yeah, good job acting, too. Staggering closer and closer to your brother's table. You you mean it's just an act? Yeah, he's almost close enough now. Now watch. Get him, Skip. Yeah! Oh. Hey, hey, you... Oh. 
That's a boy, Captain. That's both of them. And now, if you'll excuse me, son, I'll tap that weight on the chin and make it 100%. Hello, Wesley, old kid. Boss wants to talk to you. Say, what's the idea? Who asked you to crash my party? Sorry to butt in like this. Well, I was sitting here quietly drinking with a couple of friends. The next thing I know, you two have beaten them into unconsciousness. <laughs> Take it easy, fella. Well, who do you think you are, anyway? How about coming over to our table and talking it over? Why? Because I think that's how your sister would like it. She is your sister, isn't she? Eve, certainly. Well, then, come on. Well, how do we do, Miss Carson? You boys are rather wonderful, you know that. Oh, how well, the lady does talk. Sit down, Carson. Hello, Wes. What's the idea, Eve? Are you the cause of all this? The cause of what, Wesley? Well, the whole Blackie North gang lying around like a bunch of stiffs. Even Blackie himself sprawled across his piano in there. Do you really mind? I mean, they're nothing to you, are they? Oh, why should they be anything to me? I just thought they might be amusing. But, Eve, if you think anyone's going to bounce Blackie North and his men around the way they've been bounced around tonight and not pay for it... Well, how about letting us worry about that, son? Well, who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. This is Skip Turner, and this is Captain Bart Friday. Will somebody tell me what this is all about? Sure. Your sister here has hired us to play bodyguard and fall guy for you during the next week. She told you I'd be dead in a week? That's right. And that during that time, I intend doing whatever it suits me to do? Yep. And you two guys are crazy enough to agree to see me through? Why not? <laughs> Suits me. You asked for it. Hey, you seem doubtful, fella. Well, naturally. Dangerous, huh? Unless you or the police put Blackie North out of the way, he'll get you. As sure as we're sitting here. Yeah, let's not worry about that for now. Your sister said the police wanted you. Eve, you told them... Why not? They're here to protect you from the police as well as everyone else. Is that on the square? Looks like it. We gave our word we'd see you through everything for a week. Well, if, if you mean it... We do. Now, why do the police want you? They don't know they want me. They just want the guy who stole this handful of diamonds out of a certain movie star's bedroom last night. Holy mackerel, Captain. Look at them diamonds. Does anybody else know you stole them? No. Well, why'd you do it? Oh, just for the thrill, just to see if I could. Mind if I take them? Sure, why not? What do you want them for? You know, just thinking how pleased the police would be to come along and find these diamonds in Blackie North's pocket. What's that? Yeah, and how surprised Blackie would be. You, you mean plant them on Blackie? Why not? Didn't you say that unless we finished him off or the police got him, he'd stop at nothing until we were dead? Yes, that's true. And we're doing two good deeds, helping the police capture a criminal and fixing it so we won't be murdered. Skip, go out the bar and get the police on the telephone. Tell them to hurry out to Maggie's intimate drinking saloon? Salon, Skip. Yeah, and what'll I say when they ask me who's talking? Oh, tell them you're a fairy godmother to all good policemen. <laughs> Man, that's something I always wanted to be. <laughs> Very godmother to a policeman. <laughs> Captain, we're not going to be here when the police arrive, are we? Not at all. As soon as Skip has stirred up the police, I suggest we adjourn to the Carson home for a good night's rest. Yes, everything's prepared for you two to stay with us. No, I don't want to go home. But, Wes... I don't want a good night's rest. You know what I want to do? What do you want to do? I want to rob a bank. Wes... And I know just the bank I want to rob. Wes, you can't rob a bank. Yes, I can. For seven days, I can do anything I want to. And you've agreed to cover up for me. But why do you want to rob a bank? Because I've never robbed a bank. And in seven days, I'll be dead. Hi, Cappy. I tied up the hat check girl and gagged her. Hey, you hear that? What's the matter? The police. They're coming. You mean you called them? I didn't have to. They got wind of something. Hey, we better get moving. Everybody out the back way. We can't get caught here. Carson, take your sister. Come on, Skip. Whoopee! <laughs> First it's black in north, and now it's the police. Come on, let's go. Here is a strange assignment for Captain Friday and Skip Turner, the guarding of a man who has only a week to live. Listen next week to the second episode of You'll Be Dead in a Week, entitled $200,000 to Lose. Next week, at the same time, you are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... You'll be dead in a week, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, 
come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Late yesterday afternoon, Captain Friday and his operative, Skip Turner, hopped a plane in San Francisco and hurried south to Hollywood on a very mysterious mission. They were instructed to meet Eve Carson at a place called Maggie's Intimate Drinking Salon. It's a flossy drinking establishment located on the Sunset Strip, an exclusive small shop district. The two boys landed at the municipal airport, hustled off the plane and grabbed a cab to their destination. They found Maggie's intimate drinking salon an intriguing spot, but they were even more intrigued with the story Eve Carson was telling them. Right from the beginning, Miss Carson. Well, you see, Captain Friday, my brother Wesley and I came to California after father, our last living relative, died in the East. Between us, we're worth a million, maybe two million dollars. Oh, gone, a little old female gold mine. Well, that's what a lot of the smart boys thought. Nobody's worked me yet. Go on with your story. We loved it out here and were very happy. Then about two months ago, something happened. My brother was coming down to breakfast one morning when suddenly he lost consciousness and plunged headfirst down the stairs. I see. Bumped his head in the fall and he hasn't been the same since. No, he apparently wasn't hurt in the fall. But he went to our doctor to find out why he lost consciousness. The doctor told him, Wes... In a week, you'll be dead. Well, you didn't take just one doctor's word for it. Oh, no. We checked with three other specialists. And they all say your brother will be dead in a week? Yes. I see. And, of course, we're very sympathetic, Miss Carson, but where do we fit into the picture? Ever since Wes heard the bad news, well, he just shrugged his shoulders and said, what have I got to lose? And he's been running wild ever since, huh? He's been doing everything that amuses him. Right now, it amuses him to be tied up with Blackie North and his bunch of cutthroats. Blackie North? Hey, you mean a gangster? Yes. But see here, I I don't see where we... Please, Captain Friday, if you could sort of look out for him, take care of him, protect him. Protect him from what? Why, from himself, I I suppose. If he's got to die, at least he can die with a family name clean, not as a criminal. If I get you right, you want us to curb his last week of fun just so you can write, he was a good man on his tombstone. But this little conference wasn't the only thing that took place at Maggie's intimate drinking salon. Skip Turner, a little bored with the inactivity in the dimly lighted cocktail bar, picked a fight with the piano player and laid him gently across the keyboard. He did the same thing with the waiter and then tied up the hat check girl, while Captain Friday disposed of two of Blackie North's gunmen who had descended on them. It was all over before Skip learned from Wes Carson, the man they were hired to protect, that the piano player was none other than Blackie North himself. Say, what are you trying to do, fella? Commit suicide? Huh? That man you just knocked out is Blackie North. Well, what about it? You wake up some morning with a carcass full of lead. Who are you, anyway? Wes, please. They're friends of mine. Eve, are you the cause of all this? Do you mind, Wes? These gangsters are nothing to you, are they? No, they're just amusing. But Blackie North's a pretty tough guy. Somebody's going to get hurt. Who are these two fellows? This is Captain Friday and Skip Turner. How are you, Wes? Your sister here has hired us to play bodyguard and fall guy for you during this next week. Oh. She told you I'd be dead in a week? That's right. Now, during that time, I intend doing whatever it suits me to do. Oh, she didn't spare the horses none. We know the score. And you guys are crazy enough to see me through? Well, we'll try to keep you out of jail. That may be more difficult than you think. The police want me, you know. Yeah? Why? Oh, they don't know they want me. They just want the guy who stole this handful of diamonds out of a certain movie star's bedroom. Hey, look at them rocks. Why'd you steal them? Just for the thrill. Just to see if I could. Anybody else know you took them? No. Hmm. Mind if uh, I take them? Not at all. I haven't any use for them. Well, what are you going to do with them? Here, Skip. Hmm? Plant these diamonds on Blackie North before he wakes up. <laughs> It'll be a pleasure. I'll go out to the bar and get the police on the telephone. We'll be doing two good deeds. Helping the police capture a criminal and fixing it so we won't be murdered. Hey, you hear that? The police are coming. Yeah, they must have got wind or something. Get rid of those diamonds quick, Skip. Right, boss. Come on, Eve. Wes, let's get moving. Moving where? Well, what would, uh, what would amuse you? I want to rob a bank. (laughs) 
And so the little party left Maggie's intimate drinking salon and retired to the Carson home in Beverly Hills to plan a bank robbery. That was last night. This morning, Captain Friday and Skip are seated in the breakfast nook, wondering about their next assignment with Wes Carson. Hey, with all this leather upholstery on the window seat and the glass top on the table, this looks more like a cocktail bar than a breakfast nook. <laughs> I can see you don't get around much in Beverly Hills, Skip. No, and I ain't used to going without breakfast, neither. What gives? Miss Carson's preparing it, I believe. It's the maid's day off. Oh, this would have to happen to me. I'm starving. Oh, it may not be so bad. She seems a very practical girl. Yeah, but I wish you didn't have to practice on me. I... What you staring out the window for? The fog's lifting. Well, it always does about this time. What you looking at? Huh. Uh, just as I suspected. There he is on the corner. Who? One of Blackie Norris gorillas. See him? Where? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the torpedoes we beat up last night. He's watching this house, all right. Uh, you want me to go out and dust him off? No, we got more important things to attend to. And don't say anything to Eve. Might worry her. wonder if the police picked up Blackie last night. No, unfortunately, our little plan didn't work out. How do you know? No, I've already read the morning paper. That siren we heard was a police car, all right. But they were on their way to a club a couple of blocks down the strip. Yeah? What happened? Oh, the usual brawl. Movie actor and an orchestra leader. Well, then, hey, that means that Blackie's got them diamonds and nobody knows it but us. That's about the size of it. We certainly played Santa Claus to Blackie last night. Now, watch it. Here's Miss Carson. Huh? Oh, good morning, Miss Carson. Good morning. Sorry to make you wait so long for breakfast. Mmm, hot cakes. I hope you like them. Please help yourself to the syrup while I pour the coffee. Could uh, we do anything to help? No, everything's under control now, I think. Please begin. <laughs> I don't need no urging. Mm, these hot cakes look delicious. Mm, and they are delicious. Man, pancakes are my favorite fruit. And these are the best I ever tasted. Hey, you certainly fooled me, Miss Carson. Fooled you? How? Well, you don't look like a babe who could hash. <laughs> <laughs> That's a left-handed compliment, Miss Carson. Skip means you're so beautiful and charming, you'd never suspect you could also cook. Oh, thank you. But I'm afraid I haven't cooked much since finishing school. Oh, you cooked in school? Well, of course. In the domestic economy class. We all had to take it. Well, blow me down. Hey, they're finally getting some sense in these colleges. Won't you have some more? No, thanks. You better save the rest of that batter for Wes. He'll be hungry when he wakes up. Uh, you're, you're sure he's all right, Captain Friday? Oh, yes. I only put one sleeping tablet in his drink last night. They're harmless. I do wish you weren't so set on robbing a bank. So do I. And if it wasn't for you and your pancakes, Miss Carson, I'd be tempted to take it on the lamb right now. But he is set on it. That's why I gave him the pill last night, so I could make a few phone calls. Do you think he can manage it? Safely, I mean. Well, Mr. Jordan's on his way here right now. Mr. Jordan? Uh, he's the manager of the city bank. Your bank, I believe. Oh, oh, yes, of course. Oh, Captain Friday, I love my brother. He's such a good, clean boy. Don't let anything happen to him, please. We'll do our best, Miss Carson, but robbing a bank is dangerous business. I know. And, and sometimes I, I think I shouldn't, but I do want him to be happy for this last week. Oh, probably Jordan now. He said he'd be right over. Where would you like to talk to him? Right here will do. I'll bring him right in. Hey, uh, you know this fellow Jordan, boss? Not very well. I've met him. Well, what if he won't go for the deal? I think we can handle him. Mr. Jordan says he knows you, Captain Friday. How are you, Jordan? Well, Captain, it's good to see you again. This is my right-hand man, Skip Turner. Oh, glad to know you, Mr. Jordan. Well, thank you. Well, Captain, I brought along Miss Carson's bank statement, but I must confess I'm a little puzzled by the mystery. I think I can clear it up for you. May I see the statement, please, Mr. Jordan? If it's agreeable to Miss Carson. Quite. Hmm. Well, it shows a balance of over 200000 in the checking account. Is that right? That's right. Two hundred grand. A face and a figure like yours and 200 grand in the bank. And a good cook besides. Oh, the Lord sure good to some people. If you've finished extolling the virtues of Miss Carson Skip, we'll get down to business. I'll be quiet. But you can't keep me from dreaming. Would you be willing to risk 200,000 in this, uh, this robbery, Miss Carson? Anything for West Captain Friday. Good. We have a strange request to make of you, Mr. Jordan. Yeah? We want to rob your bank. Rob my ba <laughs> But surely you're joking. No, we're in deadly earnest. We want to steal $200,000 of Miss Carson's money out of your bank. But I don't understand. Mr. It. Jordan, you know my brother Wesley. Of course I know Wes. We handle his account as well as yours. Well, he, 
He'll be dead in five days. West, West dead? That's the prophecy of the best doctors on the coast. But, but I can't believe it. He looks so healthy. Why, only yesterday I saw him. Nevertheless, Mr. Jordan, we have it on the best authority that Wesley Carson will die within five days. Apparently, there's nothing medicine can do about it. Oh, Miss Carson, I'm so sorry. Wes is such a fine young man. Now you can well understand that Miss Carson wants her brother to enjoy all the happiness possible during these last five days. But of course. And if there's anything I can do... There I... is. A lot you can do. You can let him rob your bank. It's an impulse he's had since childhood. And now he feels there's no longer any reason for repressing it. Oh, I see. Here's our plan. Miss Carson will give you a check for $200,000. You distribute this money among your tellers. We'll stage the robbery. Enter the bank and steal Miss Carson's money. Will you cooperate? Uh, well, uh, of course I'd like to help, but robbing a bank, there are difficulties I'm sure you haven't thought of. Difficulties? What are they? Well, in the first place, we're insured against robbery. You'd have to have an understanding with the insurance company. I talked to the president of the insurance company last night. He's agreed to delay the investigation for six days, after which time all the stolen money will be found in an ash can at the rear of the bank. Then you can tear up Miss Carson's check. Well, if the insurance company's agreeable, but what if something goes wrong? Well, you're protected. You have Miss Carson's check. You owe her nothing. You're out nothing. Have you fixed it with the police? No, I don't think they'd approve. And secondly, I'm afraid Wes might suspect. Yeah, and as long as we're in this, we might as well enjoy it. I'm afraid I don't share the same craving for excitement. When would this holdup take place? This afternoon. Skip, Wes, and I'll enter the bank about ten minutes to three just before closing time. You mean you want to stage this robbery in, in broad daylight? Why not? But Wes is well known at the bank, and a lot of people know you. You'd be recognized immediately. You leave that to us. I can assure you none of us will be recognized. You mean you wear masks? Mm, something like that. But I have a gun in my desk. I'd be forced to use it. I know. Top drawer, left side. Just leave it in the same drawer, and you won't have a chance to use it. Mm, but the more I think of this, the more ridiculous it seems. Robbing a bank in broad daylight. You, you can't get away with it. Well, it has been done. I know, but they were professionals. And besides, they're usually caught sooner or later. And another thing, there's an electric button under every teller's window. The moment one of them got suspicious, a light uh, touch on one of these buttons would bring the police. Well, the tellers won't touch any buttons. Not if we have them covered. Well, those tellers are mostly girls. I'd never forgive myself if anything happened to one of them. Nothing worse than a fainting spell, I assure you. Oh, I'll take care of the ladies. How's my department, Mr. Jordan? And they'll have something to talk about for the rest of their lives. You're forgetting about our guard. He also carries a gun. Oh, Hennessy? I'll take care of him, too. I don't know. He's a good man, Hennessy. Well, good men are my specialty. And it's settled? Uh, will you write out a check for 200000 Miss Carson? Not so fast, Captain. I haven't agreed to anything. Mr. Jordan, put yourself in the place of Wes Carson. Please, Mr. Jordan. He only has five days. I, I know, Miss Carson, but, but robbing a bank... You're nothing to lose, Jordan. To all outward appearances, this will be an ordinary holdup as far as you're concerned. If we're caught, we'll take the rap. Why, I could lose my position or, or, or land in jail. Not at all. You're not to implicate yourself in any way. Well, well then... Is the check ready, Miss Carson? Here it is. $200,000 drawn on Mr. Jordan's bank. Well, I'll try. Oh, that's a way to talk, fella. We'll have a lot of preparations to make, Mr. Jordan, so you'll excuse us if we rush you off. We'll see you later in the day. Good heavens, you really mean you're going to do it today? At ten minutes to three. Oh, dear. Well, all right. But I warn you, I'll have to do my best to stop you. Of course. That's the way we want it. We'll take our chances. Well, goodbye and good luck. I certainly hope everything goes off smoothly. You don't know how grateful I am, Mr. Jordan. I'll see you to the door. Oh, dear. Ten minutes to three. Come on, Skip. You've got to wake Wes and then do some shopping. And then rob a bank in broad daylight. <laughs> Man alive, this is right down my alley. busy morning for Captain Friday and Skip. After waking Wes Carson and finding him none the worse for having taken a sleeping pill the night before, they left him eating a hearty breakfast while they departed on a shopping tour. The tour included a Hollywood studio arsenal, where they procured several rounds of blank cartridges, and a Hollywood costumers, where Captain Friday selected a number of articles of clothing and makeup items. They're now in an upstairs bedroom of the Carson home, getting ready for the big adventure... The robbing of a bank in broad daylight. Well, how do I look, Cap? Like a real ranch hand? 
I'd say a cross between a ranch hand and a member of a hillbilly band. <laughs> <laughs> These blue jeans are a little tight. Well, that's in character. All cowboys wear them tight. Yeah. I gotta get used to these high heel boots, too. Feel like I'm falling down all the time. You better get over that feeling quick. The slightest mistake this afternoon, we'll all be falling through a hangman's trap. Hmm. Hey, you think we can depend on Carson keeping his head? I can't tell what he'll do in the excitement. We'll have to watch him close. Have you put the blanks in his gun? Oh, not so loud, Skip. Carson's in the next room. Yes, all the guns are carrying blanks. Oh, don't trust me either, huh? Of course I trust you. But I know there's nothing like the sound of a gun going off to let people know you mean business. Hey, you mean we may have to let somebody know we mean business? I don't think so, but we're ready if we have to. I'll get it, boss. Well, howdy, partner. <laughs> Just drove a hundred hay to Kittle down from the bar X. You're mighty thirsty, and so am I. How about a water in my stock while I wet my whistle? <laughs> Good boy, Wes. You're a born rancher. Think I'll do? Sure you will. Oh, come in, Miss Carson. Isn't Wes wonderful? With that blonde beard, I'd never know him in a thousand years. Yeah, and that ten-gallon hat makes him six inches taller. Yeah, let's see, Wes. Let me look at you. Blue serge suit, cuffs tucked into high heel boots, stiff collar, bowstring tie. Yep, you'll do. You're a wealthy cattleman if I ever saw one. Gee, this is exciting, isn't it? I never had so much fun in my life. <laughs> I had an awful time getting him away from the mirror. You should have been an actor, Wes. <laughs> well, how you like me, Miss Carson? Of course, I ain't a wealthy cattleman like Wes and Captain Friday here. Me, I'm just a poor ranch hen that drives <laughs> that big car and does all the dirty work. I love your long sideburns. <laughs> and that false nose makes you look positively beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, if you saw me on the street, would you know me? Well, if I did, I, I don't think I'd admit it. <laughs> but seriously, boys, the disguises are wonderful. Even though Mr. Jordan knows you, I don't think he'll recognize you in those outfits. I hope you're right. Our lives may depend on it. Now let's go over our plan again. Uh, <clears throat> I'll get in character by rolling a cigarette. Get this now, both of you. We'll drive Miss Carson's sedan up to the curb in front of the bank. There'll be a piece of blanket hanging from the trunk in the rear. The end of the blanket will cover the license plate. That sounds all right. Naturally, I don't want Eve implicated in any way. Now we're at the bank. We go in together. Skip a little respectfully behind Wes and me. Mm -hmm. We go straight to Jordan's office behind the little wooden railing, Wes. What do you do, Skip? Mm -hmm. Oh, I look for Hennessy. He'll probably be around the counter in the middle of the floor. Hennessy? Oh, oh yes, that's the guard. He ought to be easy to spot in his uniform. Oh, I'll find him. And then I ask him to show me to the washroom. It's in the rear of the building. Hennessy prides himself on being a gentleman, so I think he'll escort you back there. Well, if he don't, I'll have a gun in his ribs. He'll be polite, all right. When you get to the washroom, you tie him up and gag him. You got your materials? Mm-hmm, right here. Lariat and yellow scarf. Good. Then you get back and cover the entrance. Let anybody come in that wants to, but don't let anybody go out. <laughs> Over my dead body. Well, let's hope not. Yeah. Meanwhile, Wes, you and I are sitting in Mr. Jordan's office. Mm -hmm. We're a couple of ranchers from San Fernando Valley, and we want to negotiate a loan. Right. We discuss the terms of the loan with Jordan until we see Skip return from the washroom and go to the entrance. But what if Skip needs somebody else back there in the washroom? Oh, I'll take care of him. This rope's pretty long. Oh, oh well, Wes, must you go through with this? So many things can happen. Oh, don't worry, sis. We'll have a picnic. Yeah, this ain't no time to get scared. Granting everything's okay and back. If everything's okay, I'll walk through the bank... and then when I go by Jordan's office, I'll take off my hat and wipe my forehead. And when you get that signal, Wes... I remark on the heat and ask Jordan where I can get a drink of water. Now, I don't know what Jordan will say, but I do know there's a water cooler in the teller's cage adjoining Jordan's office. If he suggests the cooler, he'll probably open the door for you himself. If he doesn't, I will suggest it. You can see it from the office through the grill work. Mm -hmm. I go into the cage and get a drink from the cooler. Now, some of the tellers will probably look around as you enter the cage, but as you take a paper cup from the holder and pour yourself a drink, they'll probably continue their work. I finish my drink and whip my gun out of my coat pocket and order all tellers to step back two feet from their windows. By this time, I'll have taken Jordan's gun from his desk drawer. With the gun in Jordan's back, we'll both go into the cage. I'll have the tellers covered, all five of them. I take this sack from under my hat like this, and then I go to work in the number one teller. Right. You order him to empty his drawer into the sack. Then you go on to the next teller. If all goes well, it shouldn't take more than 30 seconds to empty all five drawers into the sack. Then we back out the same door we came in and break for the entrance. Ah, uh, not break exactly. Walk. Don't run. A lot of people in the bank won't even know what's going on. The less commotion we make, the better. Yeah, and don't forget your sack, with. Oh, no. It's full of money, and I've got it under my arm. I walk outside and get in the back seat of the car. I get in the front seat and start the motor. 
But what if you're jammed in? You know, a car in front and a car in back. In Beverly Hills, cars park facing the curb. Nothing can get in front or back of us without blocking the street. Oh, of course I know that. I, I guess I, I'm so nervous I can't think. Now, I back out into the street facing south. Skip? Uh, I keep the entrance covered until I see you're ready. Then I run and jump into the front seat beside you. And we're off. Once we get into the canyons and the hills, we'll change our clothes and get rid of our disguises. We stuff the blanket into the trunk so our license plate shows. We drive calmly back here and park the car in the garage. Once we get that sack of money in the house, we're safe. Oh, sounds great. When do we start? And let's see. It's 2.30 now. Takes about 10 minutes to get there. 10 minutes more to get the right parking space. And we'd better be on our way now. I'm ready. Let's go. Goodbye, Wes. Let me kiss you. Oh, don't worry, Eve. Everything will be all right. But how will I know... When will you be back? It shouldn't take us more than 15 minutes to change clothes afterward. We should be back here in uh, 45 minutes. I have a feeling this is going to be the longest 45 minutes of my life. So have I. Come on, let's get it over with. You see, gentlemen, the appraisal of the property... Mr. Jordan, may I see you for a moment? Yes, of course, Mr. Littell. Uh, would you excuse me for a second? Yes, certainly, Mr. Jordan. Only take a second. I'll be right back. Watch it now, Wes. Skip has taken Hennessy into the back room. He should be back by now. And we can't make a move till Skip's at the front door. What if he doesn't show up? Don't worry about Skip. He'll hold up his end. Can we just stall along with Jordan? That's the idea. Watch it. Here he comes back. As I was saying, gentlemen... You must understand that I couldn't make a loan until I'd had your property appraised. Uh, that may take several days. Well, I'm feared you can't wait that long. See, we need the money now. We've got a bargain in some beeves up north, Mr. Jordan. Uh, what time is it? Yeah, almost three o'clock. Why? Oh, I don't know. Just wondering. Yeah, I guess ain't time to visit no other banks today. They all close before sundown, don't they, Mr. Jordan? Yes, I'm afraid nearly all banks close at three o'clock, including our own, gentlemen. Well, we don't seem to be doing no good here. See anything of Bill? Oh, don't worry none about Bill. You take care of yourself. <laughs> Bill's one of our ranch hands, Mr. Jordan. He don't get a chance to come to town very often. Uh, why don't you gentlemen come in early tomorrow? We'll have more time to talk over your loan. I'm sure we can work it out some way. Early? Say about uh, cock crow? Cock crow? Ha, <laughs> ha. Yeah, I always forget you city fellas don't know how to talk time. Cock crow's five o'clock. Oh, I see. Well, I'm afraid that's a bit early. You see, we don't open our doors to the public until... There's uh... Bill. Where? Yep, I see him. I told you you didn't have to worry none about him. Mm, he must be pretty warm. Bill's taking off his hat and wiping his head. Yeah, it is pretty warm in the city, especially when you're dressed up in your Sunday clothes. Have a drink of water handy, Mr. Jordan? Water? No, I'm afraid Ain't we don't. Ain't that one of them newfangled water coolers in that there cage? Oh, yes, but we don't usually... Go on in, help yourself. Mr. Jordan won't care, will you? Oh, no, 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 of course not. But I'll have to unlock the door to the cage. Mm, sorry to be so much bother. When you're so dry, you're chewing on cactus. There you are. Cool is over there. Hey, what are you doing in that door? Button your lip, Jordan. Now ahead of me. Into the cage. It's you. Why, I didn't recognize... Dive down and do as you're told. Uh, 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 yes, sir. All tellers, hands over your heads. Step back two paces from your windows. Oh, oh, it's a hold up. Hold up. It's a hold up. You there, Blondie. Back two paces. They're all back. Get going with the sack. Now, oh, you. Dump your drawer into this sack. Keep your hands up and your heads down. All right. Number two. Into the sack. Uh, you, you'd better do as he says. Yes. Number three window. Empty your drawer into the sack. And don't spill any. Now number four. Thank you, miss. One more. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd advise you to stay away from those buttons. The first person who touches one gets a bullet. That's Bill out there in the doorway. He can hit a dime at 100 yards. Come on, bring the sack. Back and out. Keep him covered. Take it easy, Wes. Here's the car. I don't see Skip yet. Keep your eye peeled. I'm ready to go. Here he comes. Come in. We made it. Look, there's a soldier signaling. Oh, no time for hitchhikers now. He's an MP. Look at his armband. Yeah, waving us down. I'll slow down. Hey, look, there's somebody coming from the other side. They're jumping on the running board. All right, get him up and into the back seat. We're covered from both sides. Quiet, punk. Keep him covered, Porgy. Blackie North, in a soldier's uniform. That's a federal offense, fella. You know that? Look who's talking. I got him now. Take the wheel, Porgy.
Blackie North, the gangster from Maggie's intimate drinking salon, apparently heard of a bank robbery deal and had his guerrillas on hand to collect the $200,000 without even going near the bank. On top of that, he still has the diamonds that Captain Friday and Skip Turner planted on him in the hope the police would find them. A pretty good day's work for Blackie North. Listen next week for the third and last episode of You'll Be Dead in a Week. You are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... You'll be dead in a week. Featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. clock of a sunshiny afternoon in the green foothills north of Hollywood. A sedan raises clouds of dust as it ascends a rising, winding dirt road toward the uninhabited summit. Looking on this innocuous scene, no one would suspect that Captain Friday, Skip, and Wes Carson are prisoners in the back of the sedan. Half turned in his seat, alongside the driver, is a man dressed in a soldier's MP uniform. He rests a gun on the back of the seat, keeps it pointed at the three in the back. While an army uniform is sacred to most of us, it isn't to Blackie North, notorious gangster. He used this disguise to trap Captain Friday and his companions after they had successfully robbed a bank. But we're getting ahead of our story. We'll start back at the beginning. Last night, Captain Friday and Skip were summoned to Maggie's intimate drinking salon on the Sunset Strip by a mysterious letter. Eve Carson, Beverly Hills heiress, was the writer. Yes, I wrote that letter. I've come to you for help. I'm in trouble. What sort of trouble? About two months ago, my brother Wesley lost consciousness and fell downstairs. Affected his brain? No. No, he's apparently as alert and healthy as ever. But when he went to our doctor to find out why he lost consciousness, the doctor told him, Wes, in a week you'll be dead. Well, you didn't just take one doctor's word for it. Oh, no, Captain Friday. We checked with three other specialists. And they all say in a week your brother will be dead, huh? Yes. Only only two days are gone already. I see. Well, of course, we're very sympathetic, Miss Carson, but where do we fit into the picture? Ever since Wes heard the bad news, he's been doing everything that amuses him. Right now, it amuses him to be tied up with Blackie North and his bunch of cutthroats. That's Wes now at the table over there. Clean-looking fellow with those two gorillas? That's your brother? Yes. Oh, if, if you could sort of look out for him, take care of him, protect him. Protect him from what? Well, wait, from himself, I, I suppose. Well, if he's got to die, at least he can die with a family name clean, not as a, as a criminal. If I get you right, you want us to curb his last week of fun just so you can write he was a good man on his tombstone. I, I want him to have all the fun and excitement he wants. All I'm asking is that you keep him out of trouble, keep him out of jail, keep him from harm or violence. It's worth $10,000 to me. All right, Miss Carson. It's a bargain, and a bad one, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Captain Friday took the job of watching over Eve's brother, Wes Carson, during his last five days. But, as he put it, it was a bad bargain. Wes had become entangled with Blackie North, a Southland gangster who was only one step ahead of the police. To further complicate matters, Wes, just for the thrill, had stolen a handful of diamonds from the home of a movie star. Captain Friday solved this problem by planting the gems on Blackie North, then called the police, hoping they would search him, find the gems, and stow him away safely behind bars. Before they were able to accomplish this, however... Wes Carson came up with a startling announcement. He wanted to rob a bank. But here's Captain Friday to tell you about that. 
Yes, Wes wanted to rob a bank, and there was nothing to do but humor him. We arranged for him to rob his own bank by having his sister deposit $200,000 with a cashier before the robbery took place. Wes, of course, didn't know about this, and everything went off as we planned it. Wes picked up all the money in the teller's cages. We backed out of the bank and ran for the car parked at the curb. Skip Turner covered our getaway. I'm in. We made it. Look, there's a soldier motioning us to stop. Hey, no time for hitchhikers now. He's an MP. Look at his armband. We can't turn the corner without running over him. I guess we better stop and see what he wants. Hey, there's somebody coming at us from the other side. They're jumping on the running board. All right, get him up and into the back seat. Into the back seat before I drill you. Blackie Noah in a soldier's uniform. That's a federal offense. <laughs> Look who's talking. Take the wheel, Porgy. I'll take their guts. And I don't want to hear a peep out of anybody for ten minutes. You get it? Suckers, hands in the air. And get out one at a time. You first, Friday. I got them covered, Blackie. You next, Carson. No funny stuff or I'll drag gulch every one of you. Well, you certainly turned the tables on us, Blackie. Now you, wise guy. Just call me Skip. And keep them hands up. Hog is a little nervous with his trigger finger. You said it, Chief. It is kind of itchy. Now get moving, single file, towards those trees. Bring the rope, Hoggy. Coming, Chief. If you want to play soldier, why aren't you in the army, Blackie? Because the army's full of dopes like you guys. I'm smart. I'd rather play you, see? How'd you get that uniform? Roll some poor soldier? People are always giving me things, like diamonds and gunny sacks full of dough. Halt! Well, I must say I approve your taste in nature, Blackie. This is a beautiful spot you picked. You won't think it's no picnic before I get through with you, Carson. What are you going to do, burn us at the stake? You'll pray for burning before long. Lay down, you two. Heads facing that tree. You on one side Friday, you on the other wise guy. You mean lie down on the ground? Pay the soil in your pretty panties? Get down there quick before I bust your skull open. Okay. No need to get rough, Blackie. No? What about that pink tea you gave at my place last night? Yeah, what about it? I got a memory like an elephant. You got a nose like one, too. Yeah, I got it last night. And I ain't forgetting that neither. Shut up, Skip. You're only antagonizing him. All right, you guys. Shove your heads against the tree. Yeah. Like this? Okay. Now put your arms around the trunk. Now flatter your back. Anything you say, Blackie. All right. Go to work with that rope, Poggy. Yeah. Get their arms around the tree and tie their wrists. I got... Hey, I feel neglected. Don't I deserve some attention? We yep. got something special in mind for you, Wes. How'd you know we were going to rob a bank today, Blackie? <laughs> you small-time operators. You thought I was out cold last night. You mean you were playing possum? It'd take a better man than that wise guy you got with you to knock me out. Let that be a lesson to you, Skip. Always be thorough. Fine time to be given out with lectures. There. There, I guess they won't slip out of them knots. Let me see them. Yeah, they're good knights. Yeah. But slip them a little tighter. Tenny. These guys got too much circulation already. Okay, they see. There. How do you like that? <sighs> Fits me just like a tourniquet. Now get their feet, Porgy. Yeah. The same kind of knots. Same kind. And you, Carson, keep those hands up. How about putting them behind my back or something? I've been holding them up a long time. You'll keep them up there. I'll sew your fingers off one by one. Yes, sir. Hey, listen. What's that? What, Chief? I thought I heard a car. Wouldn't be no cars up here. Probably the police after the bank robbers. I didn't hear nothing, Chief. Well, hurry up with that rope. Okay. Since you overheard everything last night, Blackie, then I guess it was your man you had staked outside the Carson home this morning. Sure. We've been tailing you all day. Congratulations. I only saw him once, through the window. You hear that, Porgy? That'll cost you. The fog went up like a scared window shade, Chief. It never did that before. Don't let him jip you out of your chair, Porgy. Shut up, you. All them ropes, Porgy. Well, they're all tied up like fish in the net, Chief. Yeah, good and tight. Good job, Porgy. Yeah. Maybe I won't find you for that lousy tailing job this time. Thanks, Chief. Say, I can't stand this much longer. Can't I rest my hands and my head? I'm giving the orders, and I said keep them up. I'll get around to you just as soon as I tend to a little unfinished business. And now you, wise guy, you beat me up last night, didn't you? Well, I didn't even hurt you. You said so yourself. But you meant to, and now it's my turn. How do you like this, wise guy? Oh, look here now. You can't kick a man when he's down. Oh, can I? Just watch. Oh, you oh, dirty... Oh, oh, oh. 
Look at that flying tackle. Head up, boy, Wes. Get him. Porky, hit him on the head. Don't shoot. Hit him. Get his head out in the open, Chief. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I guess that'll stop our little football player. Hit him right back of the ear with a butt, Chief. Good aim. You've yeah. killed him, Blackie. Nah, he'll be all right in a couple of years. If he dies, you'll go to the chair, you know that. <laughs> Who'll tell on me? You guys are going to lay here till you rot. Won't do you no good to yell, neither. Nobody can hear you up here. Listen, Blackie, I don't care about myself, but you'd better take Carson to a hospital. He's bleeding around the ear. He asked for it, didn't he? <laughs> so long, you guys. Hope you enjoy the worms. Come on, Porky. How are you, Skip? <sighs> okay. Hurt much? Oh, just a couple of busted ribs. Uh -huh. Is Wes breathing? Can you see? Yeah, I think he's breathing all right. He's in a bad way. We've got to get him to a hospital. Yeah. Any ideas how we're going to do it? Yep, there go our friends. Yeah, I'm glad to see him go if you ask me. But Porgy must have spent some time at sea. The more I work my wrists, the tighter these knots get. Yeah, same here. Yeah, we're in a pretty pickle, all right. Hey, I wonder if it'd do us any good to yell. No, nobody'd come up here, even on a hike. Yeah. Makes you feel kind of alone. Yeah. Skip. Yeah? I've got a hunch. What? I think Blackie made one big mistake. What? Tying us both to the same tree. I don't get it. Look, if you slide around a little, your wrists would be directly in front of my face. Try squirming around. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is that your nose, I feel? Don't poke your finger in my eye. Hold it. And what you gonna do, stare those knots loose? Yeah, just as I thought. This isn't rope at all, it's sash cord. Well, same thing, ain't it? But it isn't nearly as thick. Hold still. Now, what you doing? I'm chewing on the rope. I'll make it too, if my teeth hold up. You mean you're trying to chew through the strands? Well, that'll take days. Worth trying anyway. Besides, it doesn't taste bad at all. Blackie North and his torpedo Porgy overheard the planning of the fake bank robbery and devised a means of cutting themselves in on the $200,000 taken from the bank. The two gangsters, wearing army uniforms, stopped Captain Friday's car, drove to a secluded spot in the Hollywood Hills, and after knocking out Wes Carson, bound Skip Turner and Captain Friday to a tree. The only possibility of escape seemed to lie with the captain's efforts to chew through the sash cord with which Blackie North had tied them. How's it coming, Cappy? It won't be long now. I'm on the last train. Well, can you hold out? It's getting pretty dark. My jaws are tired and my mouth's full of rope. Well, why don't you rest a while? You've been at it for hours. Only three by your wristwatch. It seems a lot longer. Man, it's getting black on an infidel's heart. Has Wes moved? Mm-mm, he's out cold. That's an awful gash he's got behind his ear where Blackie hit I hope he isn't dead. Poor kid. Well, I can't stop now. Time may save a life. Yeah, go ahead and all. You'll get in some place all right. I can feel the cord given. Hey, I'll pull on my wrist. It may help some. Right. You know, I ain't sure, but I think I heard Wes sigh just now. You know, you gotta hand it to that kid. He's got what it takes. Yeah. And if we'd all pitched in on Blackie like he'd done, we might not be in this pickle. But then, on the other hand, we might all be laying flat like Wes. Yeah, I guess we had a better chance this way. Keep going, Captain. I'm helping all I can. <coughs> hey, I'm loose. You did it, Captain. Uh, thanks to a good dentist. <laughs> Wait till I get this rope off my wrist and find my knife. That's another mistake Blackie made, not frisking us. Yeah, well, how was he to know you had a row of razor blades in your mouth, Captain? <laughs> well, I'm through using my knives for a while. How about yours? I got it. Boy, my hands are so numb, I can't hardly feel it. Now, rub your hands together. Oh, they'll be all right. Here we go. Uh, ooh, like needles of blood running back into your fingers. Yeah, it only hurts for a minute, though. Mine are practically all right by now. Here, I'll cut your feet loose. Now, how about your own? After you. It'll only take a second. Uh, that's it. Now, give me the knife. I'll get yours. Yeah, reckon I would have to be a sort of an acrobat to do it myself. Yeah, Porgy was right about this being a fishnet. Now... <sighs> I guess that doesn't. Hoo-wee! Wonder if I can stand up. Yeah, my feet are not so bad. 
Good thing they left our boots on. Yeah, my feet are a lot better than my hands. Now let's take a look at Wes. Yeah, here he is over here. Wait a minute, I'll strike a match. Yeah, poor kid, he's bled quite a bit. His pulse is beating. Good, maybe he's got a chance. If we can get him to a doctor. Oh, but how? We're miles from nowhere. Only one way. Carry him. Help me get him out of my shoulder. Oh, no, you load him onto me, Captain. With two busted ribs, you wouldn't get very far. <laughs> Reckon you're right. All right, up we go. Up. Uh, uh, there. Now, you lead the way to the road. Yeah. That's going to be a long trek into Hollywood. It's getting pretty dark. Yeah, we'll stop at the first house we come to and get help. What, in these disguises? We're giving ourselves up as bank robbers? Man, the papers must be full of our descriptions by now. I bargain to see this kid through. I'll keep my part of it as best I can. But if you want to hey, get Hey, boss, you know I'm sticking with you. Here's a road. <laughs> Sorry, Skip. Oh, sure, I know, Kim. Hey, look, there's a house down yonder. Where? I don't remember any house on the way up here. Don't oh, you see that light? No, that's not a house. That light's moving. Yeah. Hey, it's a car on the winding road. They're coming up the road towards us, too. You suppose it's Blackie coming back? Or the police. Blackie might have tipped him off. What are we going to do? Well, if it's the police, we'll give ourselves up and get some medical attention for Wes. And if it's Blackie? Well, nothing we can do but hide in the brush and let him go by. What if it ain't neither Blackie or the police? Then we'll get him to drive us to a hospital, of course. Well, whoever it is will recognize us from the descriptions in the paper. And that's a chance we'll have to take. Here it comes. Hey, we better get off the road. Can you make out what kind of a car it is? No, not yet. Coming at a pretty fast clip. Oh, now I can see it. It's a roadster with a top down. Good. Maybe a couple of spooners. I better hail them. Go ahead. Stand out in the road where they can see you. Hey, we need help! That's a girl, alone. Hi, miss. Will you help us? We had an accident. Skip, Captain Friday. What? What's Miss Carson? Eve, what are you doing here? Oh, I've been looking everywhere for you. Where's Wes? Right here. And badly hurt, I'm afraid. Oh. We've got to get him to a doctor quick. Get in. Is he conscious? No. Hasn't been for hours. Now, hold him on my lap. Yeah, that's it. Close the door, Scott. Yeah. Hey, you want me to turn the car around? No, I'll do it. Good girl. Drive slowly over these bumps. We don't want to shake Wes up any more than we can help. Bullet wound? No. Bump on the head with a gun butt. Concussion? I'm afraid so. Blackie North. How did you know? Well, after you left the house, I, I was so worried I couldn't stand it. I jumped in the roadster and drove to the bank. I was parked outside when you came out. Hey, and you saw Blackie kidnapped us. I, I saw a soldier and another man jump in the car. I knew that wasn't part of your plan, so I got suspicious. You followed us? Yes. But I had to stay far enough behind so I wouldn't be seen. I, I lost you in the hills. I've been looking for you ever since. You're a brave girl, Eve. Let's hope you were in time. Well, I, I, I feel responsible for all this. I, I'm terribly upset. They were coming to the paved road now. Now you can step on it. Our house is closer than the hospital. I can have the doctor in a few moments. I felt kind of bad walking out on Miss Carson. Nothing we could do. Wes is in the hands of the doctors now. Yeah, sure was a flock of them. Good thing we had time to change clothes and get our makeup off before they arrived. Mm. Eve did a good job on Wes, too. Not a trace of that beard left. Yes, yeah, well, kid. Hope we can recover her money. Yeah, and her car. And I hope those doctors can do something for Wes. Too bad if he has to die like this. Well, at least he had some excitement. If he has to die, I reckon this is the way he'd want it. Yeah, I'd hope to keep him alive for five more days till his time was up. Mm. Well, it's out of our hands now. Hey, Captain, you want me to carry that package a while? No, thanks. Must be pretty heavy. I'm all right. How's your side? All right. Hurting you? A little. Yeah, you should have let one of those doctors back at the house fix you up. All you can do for broken ribs, tape it up. Shucks, I've had busted ribs before. <laughs> well, it won't be long now. There's the sign in the middle of the block. Maggie's Intimate Drinking Salon. Yeah. Hey, do you see what I see? Yeah, where? Parked at the curb in front. Yes, I believe it is. It's Eve Carson's car. Well, if the car's here, then Blackie must be here. And the gunny sack with her money. And don't forget the diamonds. Yeah. Feel up to a tussle? With Blackie North? <laughs> Anytime. What about your ribs? Blackie North broke them, didn't he? Don't ask foolish questions. <laughs> Excuse me. I want to drop in this drugstore for a moment, make a phone call. Who you calling? A couple of friends of mine. Look out for this package while I'm gone. It'll just take me a second. Yeah. 
I'll get a paper and see what it says about the bank robber. Hmm. Looks like we got headlines. Let's see, uh, so. bank robbed of quarter million. So. <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay, Skip. I got my call through. Nickel wisely spent, I think. Yeah, I spent one, too. Look here at the paper. Well, he gave us quite a splurge, didn't he? <laughs> they call me young and handsome. <laughs> <laughs> they make quite a point of my paunch and beard. That's good. <laughs> and poor Wes would get a bang out of what they said about him, too. Too bad he can't read it. Well, Skip, we haven't much time for biography. Let's go to work. Yes, sir. It'll be a great pleasure to work on Mr. Blackie North. Now, if we don't see Blackie or Porgy, we'll sit at the bar and have a drink. And if we do see him, well, that's just too bad for them. Blackie must have an office somewhere in the back. Keep your eye peeled for it. That's where the money probably is. Okay, let's go. See anybody? Mm -mm. Not even a hat checker. Not a customer in the house. Well, the bartender, either. I'll look behind the bar. You look in the kitchen. Yeah. Nobody in the kitchen. Yeah, I left my package back here. May come in handy later. See any more doors? Uh, not a one. There must be an office here somewhere. Why, well, sure. Else where is everybody? It beats me. Man, this place is like a deserted village. Yeah, there's something screwy here. Yeah. Silent like a haunted house. Hold it. What's that? Sounded like a sliding door. Yeah, someone's coming. Sit at the bar, quick. Yeah. Oh, good evening, gentlemen. I did not realize there was anyone at the bar. Kind of deserted tonight. Uh, we cater mostly to the after-theater crowd. Uh, what will be your pleasure, gentlemen? A glass of milk. A glass of... You. <laughs> you are here last night. Well, how sweet of you to remember. But Blackie said... She! Had him, Skip. Yeah, come on. You are... <clears throat> yeah, that's enough. He's out. Anybody here? Apparently not. I wonder where he came from. Sounded like a sliding door. Obviously, one of those panels slides back. Hey, maybe he was fetching a drink for somebody. If it was, they'll be after him in a minute. Right here, help me prop him up against the bar. Prop him up? Why? If anyone comes after him, give us a little more time. Oh, I get it. Hey, he looks like a wax dummy. Pretty lifelike, all right. Hey, here comes somebody. Grab a stool. Get going, Gene. The chief wants a drink. We. Oui. How was that for a French accent? <laughs> Great. Texas Frenchman. <laughs> Skip. Yeah? I saw the door. It's in the wall to the left. Oh, come on. Let's go look. Easy now. Right here, this panel. See anything that looks like a button? Mm, not yet. Are you sure this is it? I'm positive. Porgy leaned against the wall before the door opened. Hey, maybe this little knot of pine here. Shall I try it? Yeah, go ahead. Well, nothing happens. Can I help you, gentlemen? Hey, the waiter. And he's got a gun. When you knock a person out, you should make sure he is really unconscious, gentlemen. This is the second time you have failed in your objective. No, gone. Guess I'll never learn. I believe you are trying to open the door, gentlemen. If you will put the heel of your boot on the second square of linoleum, you will find it will slide back automatically. We ain't so anxious to get in as we was. But I am, gentlemen. I am sure Mr. North will be delighted to see you. And if we refuse? In that case, gentlemen, I shall be forced to commit justifiable murder. What with? My revolver, naturally. Well, you didn't think we'd be silly enough to leave any lead in that gun, did you? Why, I emptied the chambers myself. Didn't you see the bullets in the shake on the bar? I do not believe you. Grab him. Yeah. I got it. Thoroughly. <laughs> I didn't think he'd fall for that old turkey. Yeah, man, it had whiskers, but it worked. What's going on out here? Gene. Hello, I... Porgy, old oh. pal. And you too, Blackie. Keep your gun on him, Skip. I'll dust him off. Where did you... How did you... We're professionals, Blackie. Why should we explain to you dope? Thanks for the gat, Blackie. You too, Porgy. Oh, and looky at the nice stacks of money on the desk. Yeah, nice of you to count it for us, Blackie. Is it all there? Listen, you guys, I'll make a deal with you. Keep them up, Blackie, or I'll dry gulch you. L listen, you guys, I I I'll split with you. Winner take all, Blackie. I I I'll squeal to the cops. Which reminds me, Skip. Hmm? Bring in that little package at the bar. Oh, yeah, sure. Hey, is it behind the bar, Captain? Yeah, it's near the sink. Now, listen to some reason, Friday. I... We might make a deal at that. Where's that handful of diamonds we left here last night? Yeah, what kind of a deal? We'll take half the dough and the diamonds and call it quits. Half the dough and half the diamonds? That's reasonable. Here's a package, Chief. Fine. 
Just open the package and strew the contents around, Skip. We, as Gene would say. Only he ain't talking. Ah, just lay those clothes on the back of the chair. Boots on the floor, the beard's on the desk near the money. What's the idea of littering the place up with that stuff? Well, these were the costumes we wore this afternoon, Blackie. I thought you might like to use them next time you robbed a bank. I thought we was going to make a deal. Well, where are the diamonds? Right here in my vest pocket, here. Hey, look out, you're dropping them, Captain. Uh, what's the idea of throwing the diamonds around? Well, I thought we ought to plant a little more evidence. Why, you double cross hey, you're making a break, tackle him. I got him, go after Porgy. Yeah. Never mind, huh? we've got Porgy. Well, if it ain't the homicide squad. Yeah, I didn't waste any time after my phone call, Lieutenant. What's going on here? They were just making a break. We had to use a little action. Nice job, Captain. That the money on the desk? I think you'll find it's the stolen money, Lieutenant. Here's the disguises they wore. Blackie's friend, Gene, is outside the door. Yes, one of my men has him. Huh. What's this on the floor? I think they're the diamonds stolen from that movie star last week. Blackie tried to make a deal with us. Well, Captain, thanks very much for the tip-off. How'd you happen onto it? Miss Carson of Beverly Hills hired us to recover her stolen car. It turned out to be the bandit car. Nice work. And, uh, I believe you said you wanted your name kept out of it. Credit's all yours, Lieutenant. That is, if you let us drive Miss Carson's car away without any further red tape. I think that can be arranged. I just won't mention a car in my report. Thank you very much, Lieutenant. I'll be reading about you in the papers. We have some wonderful news, Miss Carson. All your money has been recovered. Yeah, and your car's in the driveway. That is wonderful news, but I have better. Your brother? The doctors performed an operation. The blow on his head released a nerve that was strangling his spine. Oh, he's going to live. Well, that is wonderful news. Needless to say, Skip and I are delighted. Yes, sir. And when Wes gets well, I have a hunch he'll be free from Blackie North. And I have a hunch that Blackie North won't be free. You'll Be Dead in a Week, written and produced by Carlton E. Morse, has been another in the series, Adventures by Morse. A regular feature over this station... Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... The Land of the Living Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. This is the tale of ancient Chicota mysticism, the drama of strange terrors and weird deaths. Involved in this adventure of the land of the living dead are Dr. Julian English, renowned archaeologist and paleontologist, and his daughter Judith. On the far side of Russian Hill in San Francisco sits the English home, standing alone in a garden of neglected shrubbery and vine-entangled trees. About the whole place is a tall, dilapidated hedge that cuts off the house from the rest of the world. But let Captain Friday go on with the story. We pick up this business on a certain dreary night with a fog hanging in a sinister wet blanket over the city. In the distance, the foghorns bellow mournfully, but all other noises are muffled to a weird, indistinct muttering. Skip Turner and I, moving stealthily along a residential street, now and again caught glimpses of other beings but only as vague, indistinct phantoms. In this fog, walking with us was the essence of sudden death. Danger breathed on the backs of our necks, and every step we came near to Dr. English's home, the more pronounced it became. Creepy, huh, Captain? Yeah, we're almost there. Don't get separated from me in this fog. Yeah. Hey, Captain, why didn't we take a taxi? Why sneak up on Dr. English's place like a couple of footpads? Like I told you, Skip, Dr. English's son, Robert, just got back from Chile. Apparently with some information that scared the doctor silly. He says it's dynamite. Well, I still don't see what that's got to do with us sneaking in at midnight. For one thing, he wanted to be sure we weren't trailed. Hey, you think somebody's tailing us? Yeah, well, we've doubled back on our track twice. That should stop him. Yeah, and this fog's thick as pea soup. 
Hey, what you think this dangerous information is that Robert brought back? Maybe found a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? <laughs> you may not be far off, Skip. Why, what you mean? I got an idea that Dr. English and Robert have been playing a pretty dangerous game. Before Robert left, the doctor told me he was going on a mission into the jungle country of Chile to look for a tremendous fortune, supposedly buried in some lost city. Well, he's an archaeologist, ain't he? What's so dangerous about looking for a lost city? Yeah, there's something in the wind, something apparently pretty big. Oh, I know, but... Hey, what's that? Well, it may be a dog howl. And again, it may not. Well, then somebody is tailing us. Well, there's no telling. The English house is behind this hedge. The gate's just ahead. Should we double back again? No use. Too close now. Come on. Okay. No, I still don't see what danger there is in looking for a town that nobody can't find. It seems this lost city is guarded by an ancient Indian tribe, the Chakotas. Oh, I get it. They don't want nobody fooling with their buried treasure. And they're ready to knock off the first fellow that tries, huh? In capsule form, that's about right. Well, say, did his sister Judith go along with Robert? No, Dr. English wouldn't let her. Said the trip was too dangerous. You know, I could go for that little lady, boss. The way she makes a dress important is a sight to see. <laughs> You've said that before. Here's the gate. It's open. Come on. I can't get that phony dog all out of my mind. Hey, there it is again. Yeah. Come on, it's Judah's voice. Yeah. Now get the door. Ah, it's locked. Hello, Dr. English. Hello. Skip, there's a window just to the left of the door. See if it's unlocked. I just tried it. No go. Then smash it in. Look out for glass. Uh, yeah, I'll go first. Stay close behind. Yeah, I'm in. Come on, Skip. Yeah, right behind you, Captain. There. Hey, Duck, Skip. Somebody's shooting us from the hall. Can you see who it is? No, just a shadow. There, he's moving into the light. Hey, it's Dr. English. Hi there, Dr. English. Don't shoot. It's Captain Friday and Skip Turner. Step out in the hall where I can see you. You make one false move, I'll shoot. It's really us, Doctor. What's going on here? Captain Friday. Thank heaven it's you. We heard a shot, and then we crashed in the window. Was that you shooting, Dr. English? No, no, I don't know who it was. Robert's been murdered. Uh, what's that? Murdered? Here, I better take a look. No, no, it's no use, Captain. He's dead. Shot through the heart. Judith was with him. Where is she now? She fainted. She's with the housekeeper. Skip, see if Judith's all right. Okay. And Skip. Yeah? When she feels up to it, bring her in here. Okay. Now, Doctor, I'll call the police. No, Captain Friday. We can't call the police. Why not? I'm involved with forces that go beyond the help of the police. Let's see here, Doctor. It's no use, Captain. I've lost Robert. I'm not going to take a chance on losing Judith. Oh, come now, Doctor. You're wrought up. You can't let someone walk into your home and commit murder without going to the police. We've got to take some action. I haven't the heart for it, Captain. That my rapping at the door of the unknown should have brought this tragedy on us. What do you mean, rapping at the door of the unknown? Oh, it's a long, involved story, Captain. And as it turns out, a tragic one. Huh? Well, perhaps you better begin by telling me just what happened here tonight. Well, it isn't all clear to me yet. We, that is, Judith and Robert and I finished dinner about half an hour ago. Yeah? After dinner, I left Judith and Robert in the library talking. Suddenly, I heard a shot. Judith screamed. Yes, we heard that from the street. I rushed down to find both my children on the floor. Robert shot through the heart, Judith unconscious. I left Judith with the housekeeper, grabbed my revolver, and rushed out into the hall just as the window crashed in. Did you hear anything just before Judith screamed? No. I don't believe I did. Why? Uh, just as we reached your house, we heard a blood-curdling howl of a dog. Now, uh, listen. There it is again. Captain, what sort of a dog would howl like that? Sounds like a werewolf's cry. I don't think it was a dog, Doctor. The moment the howl had died out, there came the shot and Judith scream. A signal. A signal, the cry of the pack. You mean that a gang is responsible for Robert's death? Gang? Roll all the gangs in the underworld of San Francisco, Chicago, and New York together, and you wouldn't have an organization one-tenth so vicious, so dangerous as the Brothers to the Living Dead. Brothers to the Living Dead? It's an odd name. It's an ancient Chicota priest clan which still exists in Sacred City. A sacred city hidden somewhere in the jungles of Chile. Mm, so that was Robert's mission. Yes. If the mission had been satisfactory, Robert and I had planned to invite you and Skip to join us with Judith and search for the sacred city. I think our job right now is to run down a murderer. No. Oh, here's Judith now. Father, Father, they murdered Robert. Here I am, dear. Now. They murdered Robert. Now, now, Judith, now, now. But Bob is gone. Yes, Judith, Bob's gone. But I'm afraid it isn't going to end there. You, you mean we may be next? There is danger. Especially when the brothers to the living dead discover they didn't accomplish their purpose when they murdered Robert. The Dakota priest? Father! Judith, I thought you understood. 
Understand? Yes, I understand. Look what I found inside the neck of my blouse when I came to. Judith! What in heaven's name is that? A sacred jade, Captain Friday. A small Gila monster carved in green jade. The Gila monster. Symbol of the ancient brotherhood. Don't you see what it means? They've got every member of this household marked for death. Oh, that howl. Father, I, I heard it just before the girl stepped into the library and leveled her gun at Robert. Hey, a girl. Did you say the killer was a girl? I saw her as plainly as I see you three men. A beautiful girl. Beautiful except for her hateful, blazing green eyes. Uh, you want me to go, Captain? No, no, it might be... Nonsense, nonsense. We're making ourselves hysterical. I'll answer the door. Here, Doctor. Better let me go. Skip, yeah. duck out through the broken window and keep an eye peeled. Yeah. Coming, coming. Good evening. Why do you keep me waiting outside your door like this? And who are you? I will tell you nothing. I must see Robert English. I think you'd better come in. I wondered when you were going to find your manners. I think you should explain your mission to Robert's father, Dr. English. Bother. Is not Robert English here? Doctor, this woman came to see Robert. I am from La Jolla. La Jolla, Chile, if you please. La Jolla? Why, that's where... Did you know Robert? Did I know him? What do you mean, Miss English? Did I know him? My son was murdered half an hour ago. Murdered? Robert murdered? They got him too. Oh, Dr. English, I am sorry. What do you mean, they got him too, Mrs... Uh... Santos. Mrs. Roberto Santos. Mrs. Santos, what did you mean? Dr. English, how much do you know of your son's activities in Chile? Enough to recognize the significance of this jade. Look. The symbol. The Jade Gila monster. Exactly. The girl who shot Robert to death left this little token. Girl? Tell me, was she lithe and dark? And did she have wild green eyes? Did she? Yes, yes, savage green eyes. Tula again. It is Tula. Look here, Mrs. Santos. Before we exchange any more confidences, uh, supposing we exchange credentials. Yes, Mrs. Santos. Just where do you fit into the picture? I do not like your attitude, gentlemen. I have come here as Robert's friend. All the way from La Jolla, I came to protect him from the brothers to the living dead. Don't misunderstand, Miss Santos. But my son was murdered tonight. I have reason to be on my guard. I do understand, Doctor. I, too, have lost much. My own husband, as did your son, walked too near the terrible secret of the La Jolla jungle. Your husband? Mrs. Santos, how did he know what lay in the jungle of La Jolla? Like you, he was an archaeologist. Not Roberto Santos, the archaeologist. Not the Santos. See, si, of course. Mrs. Santos, you are indeed a friend. I understand. Captain Friday, Dr. Roberto Santos actually saw the hidden storehouse where the vanished treasure has lain hidden since the white man first invaded Chile. Mm -hmm. But the sight cost him his life. I can very well see why you want to drop the whole matter, Doctor. No use putting more lives in jeopardy. And that's exactly what would happen if we went to Chile. If you go to Chile, of course you are going to Chile. No, I'm finished. Robert's death has been too much. I'm going to drop the whole matter. Well, that will not do, Doctor. The priests know exactly how much you know. You will all die one by one. I know. I have been fighting them all these years since my husband's death. You think they intend to murder us all? I know it. Doctor, under the circumstances, we've got to call in the police. Yes, the police. We'll have to have them for Robert. You poor innocent Americans. Do you think the police can help you now? The yeah, police have quite a reputation, Mrs. Santos. Reputation, is it, Captain Friday? What do your police know about the mystic rites of the sacred little monster? How would they cope with this age-old nest of sinister wisdom? Then what are we to do? Act, Miss English. Act. Act promptly. Fight them with their own weapons. If you're suggesting we all turn into a rival gang of gunmen, Mrs. Santos, I don't it think... It is not murder, Captain Friday. What I say you must do It is your future existence. Their lives... Or yours. What in heaven's name have I brought down on this household? Judith. Judith, my oh, daughter. There, there, Dad. How could you know? I think we should see it through. If we've got to die, at least we can die fighting. It is tragic that you should be caught in this net, Miss English. But your fate from now on is with mine. But why go to La Jolla if that's where the danger lies? Why not stay with civilization where there's some organized force for protection? You do not understand, Capitan Friday. In La Jolla, there is a very strong group of people who are beginning to understand a little of the mystery of the La Jolla jungle. We are learning to fight the Brotherhood with its own weapon. We battle mysticism with mysticism. In La Jolla, 
you will find protection such as you will not find anywhere else in the world. I think I'd be satisfied to live and die in La Jolla. What a wealth of archaeological material. Why, La Jolla holds a solution to the ancient mysteries of the world. I'd gladly spend the last years of my life there. But Father, Mrs. Santos, we can't simply ignore Robert's murder. The police must be informed. I understand that, Miss English. But need we mention the true cause of his death? Well, then what will we say? Well, we've got to call the police, of course. But, Dr. English, if you feel we will endanger the lives of others by reporting it as murder, we can say Robert was shot by a burglar who escaped. You think it necessary to hide the truth, Mrs. Santos? The only course. Otherwise, it would prevent us from moving secretly. Moving secretly? Just that. When we leave San Francisco for La Jolla, we do not want all our enemies aboard the ship that carries us south. And, Doctor, if you leave the disposal of Robert's body to me, I think I can give the police an acceptable story. Thank you, Captain Friday. And if you don't mind, I'd like you and Skip to stay the rest of the night with us. Right. That is very wise, Dr. English. The Brotherhood does not rest. It may strike again, even tonight. The Brotherhood of the Living Dead whose tentacles reach out from the sacred city somewhere in the vastness of the jungles of Chile, has spoken. Their language was the language of violence, sudden death. And young Robert English, just home from an archaeological mission in the South American jungle, was the victim. Because of this hovering menace, Captain Friday and Skip Turner have taken up residence to protect the father, Dr. English, expert in the ways of ancient mysticism, and his daughter, Judith. It's three o'clock in the dead of morning. Three o'clock. Chimes at night remind me of dead things. Getting edgy, Skip? Well, ain't you? Sitting here in the dark, screaming women, werewolf howls in the fog, the Gila monsters and sudden death. Forget it. Yeah, I'm glad Dr. English asked us to stay here tonight. The closer we stick together, the better it pleases me. Hey, we're going to see this through, ain't we? What do you think? Hold it. Hmm? What's the matter? I heard someone bump a chair down the hall. Mm, footsteps. Hide behind these curtains. Here, take this cane. I'll slip down the hall and try to scare him up, whoever he is. If he comes in here, let him have it. Ask questions afterwards. Maybe I better go with you. Don't argue. Stay here. Hey! hey. Uh, Captain! Captain Friday, they got me! Uh, you killed me! Skip! Skip! Skip, did you call? Skip! Where are you? Dr. English, everyone, turn on the light. Skip's disappeared. Here I am, Captain. What is it? Well, they've got Skip, too. He's gone. Oh, no, Captain Friday, no. Captain Friday? Father, what is it? I heard someone shouting. Father, you're white as a ghost. What is it? Skip, they've got Skip Turner. But where could they take him? Well, let's look. Let's help Captain Friday search. Stand still. Listen. Someone in the hall. It is I, Mrs. Santos. I heard the cry. I understand. Who is it this time? Skip. They've carried him away. My poor friend. But what happened, Captain? What happened? We heard noises in the hall. I posted Skip behind the curtains there by the door. I slipped down the hall expecting to see who it was. My son, you are courageous. No, I did exactly what they wanted. Left Skip alone. There was a struggle. There is the cane. The carpet is dragged and rumpled. Hush. Hmm? There's someone else in this room. I heard a noise. Yes. Yes, listen. There it is again. There is someone behind the Davenport. Yeah. Doc. Yeah. It's Skip. Here, give me a hand. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's it. Now, lower him on the lounge. Yeah. Skip. Skip, speak to me. He can't speak. He's bleeding internally. Can I speak, eh? Here, let me look at him. Oh, I have seen this work before. Come, Captain Friday, hold his shoulders perfectly still. You, Dr. English, lift his head a trifle. Hold it firm. Yes, that way. Now, Judith, help me pry open his jaws. You know what you're doing. I assure you I do. There we are. Oh, how terrible. A stick of polished bamboo thrust down his throat. My friends, our foes are old in wickedness. He would have been dead in another half hour. We, we must have a doctor. There is no longer any danger. He will be all right in a few moments. See, he's already beginning to rally. Mrs. Santos, we can't go on like this. We can't spend the rest of the night without protection. Quite right, Doctor. I'm going to try to reach Captain O'Leary. We'll have a guard thrown about this place and a couple of good old Irish cops parked right here in this room. Please, please, you must listen to me. My friends, 
I am going to show you why we must not bring outsiders into this affair. This great globe on the pedestal in the corner, it is crystal, eh, doctor? Why, why yes, a crystal ball from the Kang Ho Monastery. Good. Captain Friday, please turn off the lights. Right. Now, gather around the crystal. Now watch, watch closely. Why, why it's dark and yet the crystal is aglow with light. For one moment now we will peer behind the curtain. The curtain that separates the now from that which has been and that which is to be. You will not believe me. See for yourselves. Figures in the glass. It's, it's Robert. Robert. And he stands over a bearded man lying in a pool of blood. Look. He points to us and to the figure on the ground. His lips are moving. He's alive. Robert's alive. Robert is not alive. From another world, he sends this message. Father, you must carry on for us. The power which lit the world in ancient days is being desecrated in the hands of the high priest of the Temple of the Sun. The fate of mankind is in the balance. He bids me say the monster is seen to ride again with the sun. Move with utmost caution. That is all. The crystal's dark. Now, my friends, do you understand why we must carry on? Mrs. Santos, I don't get it. How did you do that? Do not ask how, my son. Be content that you have seen. We understand only a very little of such things. And that little is infinitely more dangerous than you may suppose. Well, tell me, what did he mean, the monster is to ride with the sun? Robert said that to me once when he was alive. There's an old Chicota legend, Captain, which declares that preceding every great world catastrophe, a figure in the shape of a giant Gila monster is seen riding across the heavens on the face of the sun. And my friend, the monster is forecast to ride again. Then, then a great catastrophe is near at hand? That is so. We know not what. All we know is what we have told. Is there no appeasing the wrath of these people? Never, Doctor. So long as the secret of their ancient city is endangered, men shall die. Already thousands have died to preserve the sinister secret. Who can say how many are yet to lay down their lives? Here, I got an idea. No, oh, we oh. forgot about you, Skip. How do you feel? Oh, throat's a little raw, otherwise okay. Hey, but I've been thinking. Look, if Miss Santos can use that crystal to show us people who are, well, who are no longer with us, why can't we use it to unveil the activities of the enemy? You don't understand, Skip. Our knowledge of this phenomenon is imperfect. We've not yet sufficient mastery of it to command its use. We believe we understand a few fundamental laws of mysticism, but so very few it's pitiful. Dr. English, do you not agree with me that it is time to take Captain Friday and Senor Turner into our confidence? Tell them all that we know. They have thrown their lot with us. It is only fair. I don't wish to draw my friends into this net. We're already in. That right, Skip? After what I've been through, <laughs> and what an initiation. See, si, Doctor, they are in as much danger as we, even more danger, for they are handicapped by complete mystification as to what it is all leading to. Well, what do you think, Judith? Father, we need Captain Friday and Skip. Need them badly. It's all settled, Judith. Skip and I sail with you. Now, Mrs. Santos, tell us, what's your next move? Our next move, and the next, and the next, wherever... So carefully planned, long, long ago. I don't get it. You say that whatever move we make has long ago been decided upon? Understanding will come, my son. To each of us there has been given a part to play. Dr. English, you tell the story. Something more than a year ago, we came upon our first clue to the mysterious city. We were returning from Mongolia. On an inspiration from Robert, we detoured to the monastery of Kang Ho in Tibet. Our audience with the Lama was brief. We were led to a cell near the roof of the massive monastery, and the Lama was seated on the floor in a patch of sunlight spinning a prayer wheel. He thrust into Robert's hands a package secured with many seals and sighed as if with relief. Then he said, My children, you have come in time. Carry this package to your own country. Guard it with your lives. It holds your destinies, perhaps the destiny of all mankind. Go at once. The dread menace of the sacred city of the living dead reaches even here. Beware. 
the monster rides with the sun again. Later, we learn that the very day that we received the package, the Dalai Lama was murdered. Well, for jumping up and down, what was in the package, anyway? A piece of tanned human skin on which had been painted a crude map. Likewise, there were seven pieces of ancient parchment, utterly blank, but which brought forth ancient Sanskrit characters when applied to heat. Robert knew Sanskrit. What did he make of them? No man will ever know, Captain. We read the documents twice, then Robert burned them and destroyed the ashes with acid. After that, we both said prayers to erase from our minds the memory of what we'd read. Man, it must have told some story. And the map? Is the one and only way to the sacred city in the Chilean jungle, the city of the sun, the dwelling place of the ancient Chakota Brotherhood. There is little more to tell that is not legendary, and these legends are dangerous, for they deny all the accepted theories of the rise of mankind. You really have got hold of something. Well, I'm way over my head already. Today... Man vaguely realizes that there are forces and powers in the world just outside his grasp. Mysticism is the general name given these powers. That's where the ancient Dakota priests come in, see. In the beginning, man had the use of these powers without reservation. But man, with his pig-headedness, used them to his own advantage and the detriment of civilization. Result? Chaos and red death. The legend says that the gods, to restore peace and happiness, wiped out men's memories of these great gifts. But they did not steal our heritage of mysticism. No, they put these powers in the hands of a faithful line of priests, the descendants of who are now to be found in the lost sacred city. And these priests were fighting are in possession of all these powers? Yes, to cherish and preserve against the day when man is perfect enough to be allowed the use of them for the good of the world. No fooling, Miss Santos. Is this legend or truth? What is legend but a truth beautified by the coloring of time? But the wickedness of these priests. Haven't they cold-bloodedly killed Roberto Santos, Robert English, and hundreds of others? Those who have studied the problem have wondered, Captain. After all, is it wickedness? These priests have exercised a powerful influence upon men. They have functioned as a sort of stabilizing force controlling events and destinies at will. They have controlled checked or encouraged the ambitions of man. They have prevented wars and caused wars. Hey, Miss Santos. And now you understand something of the power of these men of the sacred city. <gasps> Look, huh? up the window. Eyes huh? are watching us. Well, Look, it? what is Keep it? Keep still, what? everyone. Kick over the lamp. Yeah. Everyone on the floor. Madre de Dios, tiene compasión. Stick with me, Skip. We'll crawl to the window and try to grab this guy. Funny he doesn't beat it. Did you ever see eyes like that? Man. All right, you throw up the window and I'll try to grab him. Ready? Yeah. Get him. What in blazes? Hey, give me some light. Yes, light. Light. There, there, there you are. <laughs> Captain Friday. How funny. It's only an owl. Well, I scare for nothing. Just a harmless owl. A harmless owl? My son among the chicotas. The owl is the symbol of death. Hey. For each one of us. Death. The Brotherhood of the Living Dead have placed the brand of death on five people. The further adventures of Captain Friday and Skip Turner in their fight against the ancient mysticism of Jakota comes to you next week. You are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... The Land of the Living Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. A net of death has been thrown about a little group of San Franciscans by the ancient Chicota priests of a far-off jungle temple in South America. Robert English, young archaeologist, was killed. 
on the advice of Mrs. Roberto Santos, Spanish-American woman familiar with Chicota mysticism, the condemned group is secretly fleeing through the protection of an old monastery hidden in the jungles of Chile. The party includes Dr. Julian English, noted archaeologist, his daughter Judith, and Captain Friday and Skip Turner. The monastery in the Chilean jungles is kept by monks who are fighting the tremendous power of the deadly priests of the living dead. Tonight, the group, including Mrs. Santos, is aboard ship, seven days out from San Francisco. The craft is in a heavy fog that has clung to the ship during the whole passage. The vessel, headed for La Jolla, Chile, moves cautiously through the murky atmosphere, continually sounding its deep-throated whistle. What are you trying to do, Skip? Go over the side? In this fog, we'd never pick you up. Oh, hi, Captain Friday. Yeah, I reckon I was leaning too far. Man, this fog's sure thick. No worse than it has been. Yeah, seven days out of San Francisco, and we haven't been able to see ten feet in any direction. This fog hangs on like a leech. That's kind of uncanny. Regular ghost ship. All week of this doggone clammy fog. Seven days of just drip, drip, drip. Hey, Cappy. Well? You think there's anything in this here gorilla business? You know, anybody could make a mistake in a fog like this. I don't think three people would all make the same mistake. Yeah, but a gorilla running loose on a ship. I can't think of nothing sillier. Where'd it come from? Where does it go to? Why did it attack somebody? Well, there's that menagerie down in the hold. The two gorillas with it. Yeah, I was asking the skipper about that. Seems that it belonged to a circus that went broke in Arizona. Animals was bought for a zoo in Peru. But if one of those gorillas were loose on the ship, the keeper would know about it, wouldn't he? Maybe so. But I don't think anybody's seen a gorilla. Everybody's got nerves on account of this here fog. Yeah. Hey, hey, look, you hmm? see that, Captain? Where, Skip? I don't see anything. I swear I saw a shadow like a big ape. Where? Not ten feet away. Right over yonder. Hey, Captain, wait for me. We'll soon prove that you're just seeing things. You got a gun? You bet you. Then come on and look out where you shoot. Yeah, just as I thought. Not a sign of your gorilla or anything else. Well, I saw some. Ah, just the movement of the fog. Yeah, here's a couple of deck chairs. Let's finish our cigarettes before we turn in. <sighs> Captain, do you realize it's just 11 days ago tonight that we walked through the fog in San Francisco to Dr. English's house? The night Robert was killed? 11 days. It seems like years. We've been in the fog ever since. Man, them last four days in San Francisco was a little rugged. The day of Robert's funeral, that blanket of fog was so blame thick you could cut holes in it. We didn't do nothing but sit around and wait. <laughs> Wondering if an agent of the Dakota priest was sharpening a knife for us. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah, kind of gives me the willies. Now that same fog's following us to sea. <laughs> you uh, suppose them Dakota priests has followed us to sea, too? I've wondered that myself. Hey, how you explain that brotherhood of the living dead stuff? Quiet, Skip. Deck of a steamer's no place for that kind of talk. This fog may have ears as big as cartwheels. Yeah, but we checked a passenger list. Just the same. Let's not stick our necks out. Okay, boss. Hey, if you're finished with your cigarette, let's go down to the doctor's cabin, huh? If we stick out here on deck with this fog rolling around, I'll be seeing worse things than gorillas. Footsteps. Don't move. Can you see who it is? No. They sound human. Oh, well, hello, Dr. English. Didn't expect to see you up on deck. Oh, Captain Friday, I've been looking all over for you. Anything going wrong, Doctor? Not so loud, Captain. The thing I've been most afraid of has happened. Come to my stateroom and walk slowly. Talk. Talk of anything. Appear unconcerned. Hey, what's wrong, Doc? Is Judith all right? Don't ask questions, Skip. When I came along the deck just now, I was within three feet of you boys before I saw you. This fog may conceal anything. Come on, let's be moving. What do you boys say to a rubber bridge? Oh, we were just coming by for you, Doctor. Well, uh, yeah, we was just coming by. You know, Doctor, Skip thought he saw that phantom gorilla a few minutes ago. My heavens, Captain, not that. Talk of anything but that. Listen, off there to port, do you hear it? Whistle of another ship. Dangerous waters, these, Captain. Very dangerous. Where should we be by now, Doctor? Somewhere off the coast of Ecuador. Huh? We passed the SS Virginia going up the coast just before dinner. Here's my stateroom, boys. All right, now, watch your step. Close the door, Captain. I'll get the light. Hey. What a mess. Well, the place is wrecked. Huh. Did you lose a collar button, Doc? I found the stateroom just like this when I came along from the smoking room not ten minutes ago. 
whoever my visitor was, he was very thorough. He didn't miss a drawer nor a bag. Searched everything. Got any ideas, Doctor? Yes. The brothers to the living dead. No doubt of it. Then we haven't thrown those priests off the trail. They followed us to sea. Exactly. It's a little puzzling. We checked the passenger list. Hey, what about Judith and Mrs. Santos? They ought to be warned. They're safe enough for the present. I left them with the ship's captain for the evening. You think they're after that map? The map the Lama and the Kang Home Ministry of Tibet gave to Robert? There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I can't imagine anyone being so stupid as to believe we'd carry it around with us. Well, what the heck does it all mean? This means, Skip, that the fight is on. In spite of the fact that we checked the passenger list in the steamship company's report and the members of the crew, someone vitally interested in our movements is succeeding in boarding this ship. It also means that from now on, we're on our own. We've got to keep our eyes open, and more important, our mouths shut. You want me to get a dog? Yes, Skip, please. Yeah. Oh, hello, Judah. Yeah, Skip talking. Oh, just a minute, Judith. Hey, Judith and Mrs. Santos have left the skipper's cabin and are coming here, Doc. Uh, hadn't we better meet them and bring them over? Don't have to know about our visitors. It's probably best that we tell them here. Skip, tell Judith we'll call for them. Okay. All right, Judith, I'll be along for you in a jiffy. No, 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 it's no trouble at all. Listen, wait for me in your cabin, you hear? Be sure now. Right. Bye. I'll go along with you, Skip. From now on, we travel in pairs. Oh, looky, boss, it's only a step. Captain Friday's right, Skip. We mustn't take any more chances. I'll try to have the room in some semblance of order by the time you're back. Are you both armed? Yes, of course. Hey, what's that? Listen. The call of a pack, Doctor. That's the sound Skip and I heard outside your place in San Francisco just before Robert was killed. Yeah, and I heard it the same night just before they tried to get me. You see, there's no escaping them. They're drawing the net even more tightly around us. Do you think we should phone Judith to stay put? No. We've got to bring the women here. Doctor, there's plenty of room in your suite. Don't you think it'd be safer to give Mrs. Santos and Judith your extra bedroom for the rest of the trip? They've got to have protection from now on. Good idea, Captain. But you'd better be getting along. They might get impatient and start out alone. We won't be but a moment, Doctor. Come on, Skip. And, Doctor, lock the cabin door. Right. Hello? Hello, radio room, please. This is Julian English speaking, suite 3-2. Take this message for Lambert, British Museum, London. Yes, British Museum. Ready? Eleventh day. Apprehensive. If no word from me in 12 hours, Radio Donovan to proceed from Vista Del Mar as instructed. That's right. Sign that English. Yes. Yes, thank you. Huh? Now to put the cabin in. The gorilla. No! No! Captain! Help! Captain Freddy! Skip! Unlocked, Captain. Dr. English must have gone out for a minute. I told him to stay here. Oh, what's happened? Look at this room. The work of the ancient priesthood. We're afraid so, Mrs. Santos. Dr. English found the cabinet had been searched just a few moments ago. Well, where is Dr. English? Yes, I, I know that he wouldn't have gone out and left his cabin unlocked. Well, he can't be far off, Judith. Uh, maybe he'd just gone to report this to the person. He would not make a report. Dr. English knows too well the necessity for silence. Hey, look, here's his hat. Yeah. Just where he dropped it when we come in. I don't like it. I'm going out on deck and have a look around. Hey, how about me going too, boss? Remember, the doctor English said it ain't safe to go around alone. Please let me telephone for help. No, Judith. If your father wanted this kept quiet, it's up to us to follow instructions. Captain Friday, I do not think Dr. English left this room alone. <gasps> oh, Mrs. Santos, don't say that. Yeah, let me get that, Judith. Please, Captain. 32, Captain Friday speaking. No, Dr. English is not here. Yes? Now, just a moment, please. Radio room reports receiving telephone instructions from Dr. English that a radiogram he placed with them be stopped. 
This is report to the British Museum. Say to the operator, Captain Friday, that Dr. English's message must go through. Now, at once. It must go through. Hello, radio room. Now there's some mistake. I'm sure Dr. English doesn't want the message canceled. Please see that it's sent immediately. I'll be responsible. Yes. Thank you. The brothers to the living dead. We must move quickly now, Captain Friday. Captain Friday, look. Here, on this piece of paper. Hey, that's blood. And here is another drop on the table. Oh, Father, Father. <laughs> Captain Friday, we've got to do something. Get hold of yourself, Judith. Hush, Senorita English. Keep your wits about you. There are secret agents of the Mayan Nahib aboard this ship. And your father has fallen in their hands. You must help us fight them. <laughs> Oh, Mrs. must we all die one by one? My child, <laughs> we are fighting the most evil thing our civilization has ever known. It is inevitable that one or more of us must die, but the price is small. Remember, we are five against the destiny of mankind. The price is small. Your father knew. Why do you use the word knew, Mrs. Santos? There, behind you, Captain Friday is something I noticed when we first came into the room. See on the wall there, beside the door. <gasps> oh. hey, the imprint of a hand, a bloody hand. What's the meaning of that, Mrs. Santos? It is the blood-red hand of the Chicotas, a sign employed since the beginning of their civilization to indicate the accomplishment of a task. It means this work is finished. Oh, no, Mrs. Santos. I am sorry, Senorita, but... Quiet, everyone. Skip. Yeah? There's someone at the door. Yeah, the knob's turning. Judith, Mrs. Santos, get in the other room quickly. Come, Senorita English. Watch it now, Skip. The door's opening. It's the laugh of a madman! The laugh of a madman! The ship carrying Captain Friday, Skip, and the party of Dr. English to Chile, South America has become a death ship, fog-bound and the stealth of death. First, Dr. English vanished from his suite, and then someone in the passage outside softly opened the door. Without waiting, Skip shot through the door. Skip, stop that. Stop shooting, do you hear me? Give me that gun. I had the whole ship done on it. Yeah, but Captain, do you want him to get away? What was it? What was it, Captain? I couldn't tell. Whatever it was, partly opened the door, then suddenly slammed it shut and ran as Skip opened fire. No, I reckon I made a fool of myself. But that terrible laugh sounded to me like the laugh of one of the Chicota neophytes. I have heard that laugh before in the La Jolla jungles. Well, I'm going out after him. Skip, you stay here with Judith and Mrs. Santos. Hey, Captain, wait. Don't go out there alone. <laughs> oh, he shouldn't have gone alone. My son, take heart. At such moments, we are not ourselves. You are being trained for the great crisis in your life. Your senses are being ground to a finer edge. Look here, Mrs. Santos, we're fighting in the dark now. I'm going to call the ship's captain. Wait. Well, we ain't done nothing but wait. They killed Robert. We sat around and waited, and then they almost got me. We waited again, and Dr. English disappeared. Now Captain Friday's out there on deck in that fog. I'm all through with waiting. Wait. What do you say, Judith? Well, I, I don't know, Skip. I don't know. What? You don't know? Have you then so soon forgotten your father's words, Senorita? Yes, Skip. Of course I know. If it's Dad's wish that we work undercover and alone, even if it costs the lives of all of us. Yeah, but Judith, can't you see? We're fighting in the dark against big odds. We can't just sit and wait for the end. It's Captain Friday. Let me in. Did you find Dad, Captain Friday? Not a trace of him. Did anybody hear my shots, Captain? Apparently not, Skip. The deck's deserted. Mrs. Santos? Yes? Would you and Judith feel safe locked in here if I should take Skip with me for another look around the deck? Captain Friday, then you have found something. No, Judith. But I do want to push the search a little further. If you'd rather, we'll take you to the salon first. We will remain here, Captain Friday. Good. Now, Skip, we need a couple of flashlights. Dr. English had several of them. Do you see any in this mess? Oh, here's one. Oh, and here's another one. Right. Now, Mrs. Sanders, above all things, don't open this door to anyone. If either Skip or I rap, we'll call out. Identify ourselves. Understand? Oh, do be careful, won't you? We'll watch it, Judith. Come on, Skip. Yeah. 
Hey, what's up, Captain? If you have found something, I could tell it the minute you come back. Yes, I have, Skip. I didn't want to upset Judith until we had a chance to investigate. I discovered it by accident when I returned to the stateroom. Look, see how the light of that deck lamp falls on the wet deck there by the door? That dark spot? Hey, that's a blood stain. Fresh, too. Yes, blood. And I think we'll find others. I get you, Captain. The enemy, whoever he or it is, left a trail for us to follow. Yes, that's why I wanted the flashlights. Oh, it's nice work, boss. I want to hope the trail don't lead us over the rail. I don't think so, Skip. Dr. English is more valuable alive than dead. Hey, look. Look, here's another spot. And another. Quiet, Skip. What's allowed? Let's go slow. We don't want to rush it. There's that thing again. Hey, what's the matter, Captain? Turn out the light, Skip. Listen. Looks like somebody's setting the stage for another murder. If it hasn't already happened. Keep still. Listen. I don't hear nothing. All right. Let's go on. Yeah, see? Here's another spot. Careful now. We don't want to run into any trap. Hey, what do you make out of that howl, Captain? You really think there's any such thing as a werewolf? <laughs> I could introduce you to a half a dozen reputable men who would swear to it. Besides that, I... Hello. Our trail's come to an end. Right in front of a stateroom. Hey, you want me oh, to... Wait a minute, Skip. Let's scout around. I don't want to go making any mistakes. Uh, oh. Hey, listen, Captain, you hear that? Someone groaning. Did it come from the stateroom? Well, I ain't sure, Hold but... It's oh, Dr. English. They've got him in this stateroom. The door's locked. I tried it. That won't stop us. Are you going to break in? Of course. Come on. Now, together. Yeah. Right. <coughs> Once more, Skip. <coughs> hey, Cap. Cap, look out. It's a gorilla. Shoot, Skip. Shoot. Duck, Cap. Duck down. You're in my line of fire. Let him have it. Quick, Skip. You got him, Skip. He's down. Hey, look out, Captain. He's up again. Hey, look, he's tearing at his head. Look at those hands, Skip. They're human. That's no gorilla. It's a man. He's torn the skin away. There's his head. Look out. He's getting out the other door. He's heading for the rail. Stop him. Stop him, Look Skip. out for him. He's got a knife. Brother, hey, listen. He's saying something. Dead. Hear me. Thy servant is thy servant no more. Look, there he goes over the side. Well, good for him. Good riddance. Hey, did you hear what he said, Captain? Well, I heard he mentioned brothers to the living dead. He was an agent to the Brotherhood, all right. Come on. Let's go have a look at Dr. English. Yeah. I got just one glimpse into that gorilla fella's state room before he made a jump at me. Yeah. Well, the doctor was tied to the bed. Hey, if he's dead, what are we going to tell Judith? He's not dead. Now, right in here. Doctor. Dr. English, you all right? No. Oh, he's not dead. He's... Oh, Captain. Uh, Captain, look at his arm. Yeah, it's horrible. We're fighting a gang of fiends. Mm. Yeah, help me carry him back to his own suite. Yeah. Now, you take his knees... I'll take his shoulder. Oh. Yeah, I got it. Let's get him out of this before he comes to. No wonder he fainted. Oh, no wonder he screamed. Are you set? Yeah. All right, and let's go. I... Oh, Mrs. Sandal. Do you think they've killed Dad? Tell me, really. Do you? You've got to tell me. I can't... Stand I can't stand it. Anything better than the suspense. Senorita English, <laughs> stop and think. Is not there something these agents of the priesthood want more than they desire the life of your father? <laughs> the map, Mrs. Santos. The map from the Kyang Ho Monastery. Of course, Senorita. The map. They may succeed in killing each one of us. But if they do not recover the map of the secret passage to the sacred city... Yes, yes, I see it now. I thought you would. They know that your father is custodian of the map. If they kill him before they lay hands on the map, then they may never find it. Then Dad isn't dead. I know now that he isn't. But he might better be. He might better be. What do you mean, Mrs. Santos? The torture they will put him to, to make him tell where the map is hidden, will be excruciating beyond belief. The brothers to the living dead are very devils when it comes to torturing. They wouldn't. They couldn't. Wait. I hear footsteps. Mrs. Santos, Judith. It's Captain Friday and Skip. We've got Dr. English. Oh, they've got Father. Here, I'll open it. There, come in and... Oh, what's hey. happened to Father? Is, is he dead? No, he's just fainted. Yeah, clear off the bed, will you, Judith? Some cold water is what you want. Judith, lock the door again. Yes. Here are smelling salts, Capitan Friday. Thanks. Skip, help uh, me rip off his shirt so we can get to that arm. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah. Oh. Yeah, there. Oh, what have they done to his arm? I told you they were masters of torture. Oh. Hey, he's coming too. Yeah, quick. I want to get his arm bound up before he awakens. Skip, huh? self in the medicine chest. Yeah. Bandages, please, Judith. Oh. Oh. He will be around now any moment. I will bathe his head with his cold water. I'll be finished here in a moment. Another piece of adhesive tape, Skip. Here. There. He's opening his eyes. There, what did I tell you? Oh, Father. We've got you back. You've come back to us. Oh, my heart. Stop. Stop. Don't torture me this way. Uh, 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 where, where am I? What? It's you, Judith. <laughs> Oh, you poor dear. Yeah, doctor. Drink this and you'll be all right. There, now. Oh, careful of that arm. Oh, you found me just in time, Captain. I, I'm grateful. No, never mind that. How do you feel? Better, I think. What happened, Dad? What did they do to you? It began when the captain and Skip went out to get you and Mrs. Santos. I, I was at the phone. When I turned around, there was a huge gorilla right in front of me, grinning in my face. At least I thought it was a gorilla at the moment. Yeah, we ran into him ourselves. Go on, Doctor. He, uh, he knocked me unconscious. When I awakened, I was tied to a berth in a strange stateroom. This horrible gorilla thing was standing over me. At the foot of the berth, it, oh, it was the most grotesque, most ghastly being I've ever laid eyes on. Dad, what was it? It was a thing, uh, I suppose he was human, the thing that followed the captain and skipped the night Robert was killed. Little, hunchbacked, beady-eyed, ears back flat against his head like a, like a mad dog. Has a long face like a dog, too. He's the one who's been doing the howling. I never believed in werewolves before. The La Jolla jungles breed many such human monstrosities, Dr. English. This is only the beginning of what you will see. Then the girl spoke, and I know it to be a man in an ape skin. He asked me for the map, and I kept my mouth shut. After ten minutes, he and this werewolf thing went into a corner and whispered together. Finally, the wolf monstrosity slipped out of the stateroom and... The gorilla man came back to me. He had a dagger in his hand. A long, slender dagger. Oh, an old, old torture method. He made a fire and held the dagger over the flame until it was red hot. Oh, Dad. Then he bent over me and gave me one more chance to tell where the map was hidden. I clenched my teeth and waited. Oh, how awful. Then I'm afraid I screamed and fainted. Now that scream saved your life, Dr. English. Yeah, Skip and I heard it and broke down the door. What became of the gorilla man? Skip shot and wounded him. Before we could stop him, he leaped over the rail of the ship and plunged into the ocean. What a desperate crew we're up against. My dear people, this is but the beginning. Think, if they hold their own lives so cheaply, how little our lives must mean to them. Yeah, but this werewolf fella... But... Get him... And you will have one of the most desperate of the Brotherhood's agents outside the sacred city. It is known that his terrible cruelties can make even death seem a pleasant possibility. Desperate Deeds of a Desperate Brotherhood continues next week when you will hear Chapter 3 of The Land of the Living Dead entitled The Green-Eyed Murderess Again. There will be violence and mystery and breathtaking action in the jungle village of La Jolla on the secret passage of the living dead. You are listening to Adventures by Morse.
Adventures by Morse. Carton E. Morse presents The Land of the Living Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Death comes to La Jolla. Tonight's episode opens with the Dr. Julian English expedition at the seaport of La Jolla on the coast of Chile, following the deadly adventure on shipboard with the gorilla man and the werewolf. Two barriers placed by the ancient priests of the hidden sacred city have now been overcome by Captain Friday and Skip Turner. Agents of the ancient priesthood of the living dead had attempted to prevent the English party ever leaving San Francisco and then had attempted to annihilate the whole party at sea. But the little group has won through to this abject little Chilean seaport of La Jolla on the edge of the fever jungles. But here's Captain Friday. Yes, the seaport itself has perhaps 500 inhabitants, not counting the superstitious, half-savage Indians of the surrounding jungles who enter and leave the seaport at will. Shacks make up the town's edifices, with the exception of the single two-story hotel. At the moment, Dr. English, who heads our expedition, and we four, who are his companions, stand gazing with interest on the Indians who pass us by with ill-natured stares. Dr. English's injured left arm is still in a sling, but Judith, his daughter, and Skip Turner are in high spirits and eager to push on toward the peaks of Zambala, behind which the sacred city is said to lie. Even the pessimism of our Spanish guide, Mrs. Santos, has somewhat fallen away as a result of again setting foot on her native soil. How about that arm, Dr. English? Think you can travel? Without the least discomfort, Captain Friday. In any event, we start for the ancient monastery immediately. Hey, you say you got the man who can guide us through this secret passage, Miss Santos? See, si. I have found Juan Mendoza. Well, then we can get going today, huh? Patience, Senor Turner. The path we take is a long one. A path of many traps and creeping horrors. A path encompassed about grotesque tortures and pitiless death. Do not be too impatient to thrust yourself into it. Oh, must we always harp on the gruesome, Mrs. Santos? We... <gasps> Father, Father, quick. Eh? Did you see her? Did you see that girl? What do you mean, Judith? What girl? It's the girl who shot Robert. The girl with the green eyes. Tula. Tula here? Are you certain, senorita? Do you think I'll ever forget that face? I tell you, it was she. Which way did she go? Quickly, Judith, which way? She plunged into that crowd of Indians down at the end of the street. A girl with green eyes. You can't miss her. Come on, Skip, let's find her. Yeah, ma'am. I always did want to get my hands on a green-eyed gal. Save the jokes. This may not be a laughing matter. We'll catch up with you later, Doctor. So Tula is back in La Jolla. But how could she get here before us? We took the first boat out of San Francisco. Most certainly by aeroplane. She is cosmopolitan, that senorita. That seems a little out of character, Mrs. Santos. The ancient jungle priests resorting to airplanes. Nothing is out of character for the priests of the La Jolla jungle, senorita English. Why, some of the most cultured diplomats of Europe are their ancients. Just as surely as are such obscene monstrosities as this vicious werewolf being. Oh, I, I hope Captain Friday and Skip catch that girl. I'd like to see her suffer as she's made us suffer. They will not overtake her, senorita. Why do you say that, Mrs. Santos? Yes, she's had but a moment's start. Senorita English, Tula is the mystery woman of three continents. Always it is the same with Tula. One moment she's here, the next she is not. Do you mean you believe the woman has the powers of black magic, Mrs. Santos? Who am I to say? All that we know is that she's the darling of the ancient priests. The priests at work again, eh? building another formidable barrier between us and their precious secrets. Be very sure of it, Doctor. Tula's presence in this place means something, something ominous, something very bad for us. And the quicker we get out of here and into the protection of the secret passage, the better. Come, we'll wait for Captain Friday and Skip at the hotel. <laughs> Hello, who is it? Senora, senora. Ah, it is Juan Mendoza. One moment, Juan. There. 
They are coming. Senora, I have come to report that all is in readiness. The pack train stands at the beginning of the secret passage. Behind the church of Santa Maria? Oh, I beg of you, Senora, be discreet. The walls have ears. You have heard something, Juan? Only that a misplaced word may bring death to us all. La Jolla is filled with the spies of the priesthood. And when do we start, Juan? At the hour before dawn. That is well. Then, with your leave, Senora, I go now to Santa Maria to say a prayer for our safe journey. The hour before sunrise, tomorrow. But if we should need you before then... I shall be in readiness, Senora. Religious chap? All South America is religious in one form or another. Intensely religious. Fanatically religious. Dangerously religious, perhaps. You will learn just how true these words are, Dr. English, before you have been in La Jolla many days. Hello in there. Oh, it's Captain Friday. They're back. Uh, the door is unlocked, Captain. Hello. Oh, hasn't Skip back yet? But you were together. Lock it. Will you, Captain Friday? Oh, yes, of course. Skip didn't return to the hotel then. I know. How did you happen to separate? Is, is anything wrong, Captain? Well, not that I know of. He went down one side street, I took another. We agreed to meet back here. It's funny, he's had plenty of time to get back. Did you find the girl, Tula? Yeah, no luck at all. Hey, wait a minute. Maybe Skip found her. That's why he's not here. I will not be too certain of that, Captain Friday. What do you mean? Senor Turner will never find Tula until she wants to be found. By the way, Mrs. Santos, what's wrong with the Indians? The Indians? Yes, they're in ugly humor. Crowded me off the sidewalk and snarled at me like animals. Acted as though they wanted to stick a knife in my back. I wondered what form it was going to take this time. Why, what do you mean, Father? The priest's newest effort to stop us. Don't you see? If what the captain says is true, then the priests have roused the Indians against us. See, and we have a lot of Indian country to go through before we reach the monastery. The new barrier between us and the sacred city. Is that it, Mrs. Santos? See. Si. Capitan, what you have just told me makes me anxious about Senor Turner. Now, that must be skipped now. I'll get it. Who are you? My friend, I am myself and myself alone. May I enter? A priest of the Chicotas. What do you want? A little courtesy, my friend. And a word with your estimable companion, the Dr. English. Yeah. Come in. This is Dr. English. Ah, yes. The illustrious Dr. Julian English. Archaeologist, anthropologist, and anthologist. And Senora Roberto Santos, widow of the learned Dr. Santos, who was beloved by all the people of La Jolla. Ah, and the Senorita Julian English. Who are you? What's your business with me? Does it matter who I am? I am an Indian. I am a descendant of the Chakotas, an Indian who has struggled valiantly with the intricacies of your civilization. Your robe proclaims you a priest of high office. A matter of no importance. I serve at times indifferently well. If you'll excuse me, doctor, I'm going to have a look for Skip. Uh, but my young friend, I am going to ask you to stay. Thanks for the invitation, but I'm leaving. Now. No. You are to remain. Perhaps this dagger will convince you that I am serious. Oh, no. I don't like people pulling knives on me. You'll regret this violence. Not regret, my friend. Pay, perhaps. Yes. I shall pay dearly for holding you here. But not regret. You bet you will pay. You're just making silly conversation, Captain Friday. I know. What are you driving at, priest? I say, I know I shall pay for my act. You see... We Indians are sometimes gifted with uh, clairvoyance, inner knowledge. Uh, rubbish. So? Just the same, Captain. I know you are going to stay with us. Get away from that door. Just a moment, Captain. Look here now. Just why did you come here? What do you want? I am here to reason with you. Perhaps to bargain with you. Are you an agent of the Brothers to the Living Dead? Dr. English! How indiscreet of you, Doctor. Senor, let your mind go back to high noon of a day of last year, to high noon of the 28th of January. Picture a cell near the roof of a monastery in Tibet, oh, no. a patch of sunlight on the cell floor, 
a Dalai Lama seated in that patch of sunlight spinning a prayer wheel. So that's it. That is it. A package. A package that was given into the hands of Robert English, your son. Doctor, I want that package. An agent of the Brotherhood of the Living Dead. The contents of that package was destroyed before ever we set foot on American soil. Doctor, I am pained to remind you that your statement is not entirely true. There was a map. A map drawn on a parchment of human skin. A map indicating the secret passage from the monastery of your friends to the sacred city of the living dead. A secret passage that even Maya Nahib does not know of. Dr. English, I must have that map. In all the world, I alone know where that map is. In Ixkin. There's no power anywhere that could make me reveal my secret. Be fair with yourself, Doctor. You are a man of science. You have no chance of reaching the mountains of Zambala alive. Come. The map, and in exchange I promise safe conduct back to the United States. Judith, I... No, no, Father. Don't give in to him. You realize what you're saying? Don't you dare give it to him. The answer is no, priest. Such determination. Such self-sacrifice. You are going to fly in the face of fate. But none of you will ever live to see the sacred city. Uh, except perhaps the charming Senorita English. If she were inclined to look upon my master... Why, you good for nothing... Just a minute, Doctor. Excon, don't say that again. The matter rests entirely with the Senorita. Get out of this room before I kill you. Of course, Capitan. Oh, uh, one thing more. There is a little matter of hostage. Hostage? One more inducement. Should you have a change of heart, should you decide to part with the map, your personal aide, Senor Skip Turner, <laughs> quaint name, will be delivered safely into your hands. You've got Skip? Adieu, ladies, gentlemen. Move a step and I'll drop you in your tracks. Get away from that door. <laughs> Really now? You leave this room to lead me to Skip Turner, or you don't leave at all. If I die, do you suppose Skip Turner will live to hear about it? The priest of the living dead, Ix Khan, stands in the hotel room of Dr. English with drawn knife. Captain Friday has him covered with his gun, as Judith and Senora Santos watch in white lip suspense. Captain Friday has issued an ultimatum. Ex-Con, unless you agree to take me to where Skip Turner's held captive, you'll never leave this room alive. There are certain people whose one object in life is to prevent you reaching your destination. I am expected to join them in five minutes. Should I not appear, it is understood that I have failed to accomplish my purpose. Undoubtedly, others will come with uh, more persuasive uh, arguments than I have put forth. A bluff. It won't get you any place. Uh, you are going to be annoying, aren't you? My young friend, I am ready to go. And I will wager one gold piece. Here, Dr. English. I'll wager that one gold piece that I leave this room unmolested. Unmolested and, though it is unkind, I shall laugh as I go. Ixcan, upon your word as a priest, tell me, what is Tula doing here? Tula. Tula, the blazing one. The torch that has lighted 10,000 hearts to the cause of Maya Nahib throughout the world. Ixcan, what brings Tula here? Ah, Senora Santos, the forces of Maya Nahib are gathering. From all over the world they are gathering. Have you forgotten that the Gila monster is soon again to ride with the sun? Then Maya Nahib is preparing for some great catastrophe? The whole world is preparing for the catastrophe, but it knows it not. Only Maya Nahib knows. Batula! Enough. Now I go. Take one step and I'll drop you. So, my young friend, you give me a choice. Either a bullet in the back or jail. Or lead us to skip. That is not possible. <laughs> you force me then to leave 
as I said I would. A thousand pardons, Senorita English. Senora Santos. The knife! No, don't! Ah, look out! He stabbed himself. <laughs> Madre de Dios, it's gone. Was this necessary? Uh, uh, the, the only way I, I have failed. My Anahib continent is no failure. <coughs> A nuisance, my friends. Senora Santos, for your ear alone. See, si, see. Si. Strike quickly, Mrs. Santos. Ortula is forever lost. No, no, don't say that. Hush, someone will hear. <coughs> Doctor English, it is useless to examine me. I, I know where to strike to make a wound fatal. I am slowly bleeding to death. <coughs> a gold piece. I stake the piece of gold that I would leave this room unmolested. <laughs> I am going now. <laughs> going. No, do not cry, senorita. Life is not worth it. Life is very cheap in La Jolla. The monster rides with the sun. Again, your, your pardon, please. Ix Khan is gone. A strange, perverted spirit. Do not weep, Senorita English. He did not want it. Another pawn removed from my naive side of the chessboard. Now well, we've got to call in the constabulary and hope to heaven they'll believe we didn't kill this fella. No, no, Capitan. That we cannot do. You do not know La Jolla as I do. We would be arrested, held in the horrible jail for months, perhaps even convicted and shot. But, but we haven't done anything. We would have a hard time proving it to unfriendly officials. No, we cannot bring in the police. We certainly got to take some action. Leave the body here. Get into the secret passage to the monastery as fast as possible. Quiet. Listen. The werewolf man is outside in the hall. The cry of the pack. The promise of death. I'll get that thing this time. Don't go out there, Captain. He won't follow anyone again. Yeah, there's, there's nothing here. Well, the devils, why don't they fight in the open? This black magic stuff's getting on my nerves. We've been fighting in the dark for years. This is just the beginning for you. But Skip, Father, we've got to help Skip. And this body. Do we have to stay in here with this body? That howl again. Look out, I'm going to shoot through the door. No, no. Oh! Open that door, Doctor, and stand out of the way. Juan Mendoza. You. They got you, too. Stabbed in the back. Murdered. Come out here, Doctor, quick. Take care of this man. Well, the hall's empty. I'll bring him in our room. I'm going out and get Skip. No, don't go. Please don't go, Captain. Come, Capitan. You are needed here. Juan is not dead. Help me. Give me a hand, Captain. All right. Easy. Easy with him. Uh. I came almost too late, senora, with words. Easy through the door. Yeah. There. Yeah, that's it. Judith, close the door. Now then, gently. Turn him over. Mm. Oh, father. Murder, murder. Every way we turn, we find death. Senora? See one? Uh, senora, I have heard that the senor Skip Turner has been captured by... But Yes, tell us by whom. Hush. By whom, Juan? By the Indians from down the river of... River of broken waters. They are carrying him... Carrying him toward Zambala. The work of the Brotherhood. Senora. Juan... For me, Senor. See, si, Juan, I will pray. He's dead, Mrs. Santos. Juan is dead. <laughs> Take me away, Father. Take me to my room. I, I can't stand anymore. I, I... Catch her, Capitan Friday. I've got her. Yeah, just a faint. Here, we'll take her across the hall. You stay with her, Mrs. Santos, until she's recovered. Uh... 
You say Mrs. Santos is still with Judith? Yes, I locked him in the room. I want to talk to you, Dr. English. Now what, Captain? Did you hear what the priest Ixcon said to Mrs. Santos just before he died? We weren't meant to hear. You heard? Yes, I did. He said, strike quickly, Mrs. Santos, or Tula is lost forever. He said what, Captain? Strike quickly, Mrs. Santos, or Tula is lost forever. But what does it mean? Only one thing that I can see. Mrs. Santos has some connection with the Brotherhood to the Living Dead. You mean that... Looks to me like she's working with them hand and glove. Impossible. She's our friend. She's helped us. All the better for the priesthood. If they've got a friend in the enemy's camp, all the better for their cause. I don't believe it, Captain. She knows altogether too much. She explained that. How do you know she's Roberto Santos' wife? We just took her word for it. I believe her. Robert would never have trusted her unless she was one of us. And I'm sorry, Doctor, but Robert could have been mistaken. Captain, you believe this, and yet you leave her alone with Judith? It was the only way at the moment. Don't let her know we're suspicious. She can't get out of the room. But if my daughter's in danger... Judith's not in danger. Mrs. Santos will want to stay with us. She'll do everything possible to avoid our suspicions. She'll do everything possible to keep in our good graces until... Yes, Captain, go on. Until what? Until the moment comes to strike the blow. The blow that'll sweep us all into eternity. But to have such a traitor right with us... The danger will be small now that we have her spotted. Leave it to me. I'll take care of our Mrs. Santos. But what's our next move? Obviously, it's to get out of here before these two bodies are found with us. To get on the trail of Skip's kidnappers as quickly as possible. But with one dead, we haven't a guide. Yeah, if we could only just get word to the monastery for aid. That's impossible, of course. Yeah, I suppose so. Look here, Doctor. We've got to take a desperate course. Our pack animals are waiting at the beginning of the secret passage. Yes. Well, we'll lead the animals and get away. You have maps. We'll just have to chance getting through. If we fall in with the proper people from village to village, all will be well. If not, then we're lost. Yes, there's no turning back now. Doctor, what is this secret passage? There are two passages. Oh? One from La Jolla to the monastery. The second, the secret passage from the monastery to the sacred city of the sun. The passage which our friends at the monastery have sought for centuries, but have never found. And our arrival at the monastery will mean much to our friends who are fighting the priests of the living dead? It means everything. That's the reason we can't turn back. Yeah, a long chance, Doctor. Please, senores, please open the door. Open up, Doctor. I've got the door covered. If it's a trap, I'll get him. Wait, Captain. Hello? Who's there? It is I, Carlos. The door. Open the door. It will be too late. Open it, Doctor. Open it. Muchas gracias, senores. I am not too late. Shut the door. Shut it, please. What's the matter? Save me. Save me. The constabulary are after me. Step back, Doctor. I've got him covered. Do not let them catch me. Hide me. Hide me. Take me into the jungles with you. Shut up. They say in the marketplace that you go into the jungles. Take me. Take me or I am a dead man. Oh, here, get hold of yourself. Now, what's the matter? Who are you? I, I am Carlos. I, I place myself on your mercy. The, the constabulary are coming here. Hide me. Hide me, senor. Coming here? Ah, keep your hands up. Uh, Look he? here, Carlos. What have you done? Why do they want you? Uh, senores, I, I am no bad. <laughs> like you, I I have killed a man. Like us? Uh, see, si, senores. He, he had to die. You see, I, I had to kill him. That's enough. You say the constabulary is coming here? Yeah, any moment. Save me, senores. And I will never breathe a word that you two have killed. Uh, take me with you. Don't say that again. We haven't killed anyone. But the bodies, senor. The two bodies. Uh, great. Uh, luck is running true to form, Doctor. <laughs> Come, senores. We can save each other. Now, see here, Carlos. You're mistaken. You, you have nothing to fear from Carlos, senor. He will never tell. He... Who are they? Ah, the priest who calls himself Ixcan. Good work, senores. He, a wolf, a jackal. You're talking of the dead. <gasps> and Juan Mendoza. Uh, Juan knew the jungle as few others. But, senors, I do know the jungle. You knew Juan Mendoza? He was a friend, senor, a good friend of Carlos. What Juan knew, I knew. You save me now, and I will save you in the jungle. Listen. What's that? Oh, it is the gathering of the mob, senor. They have come with the constabulary for me. We must do something, Captain. Come, we'll go for Mr. Santos and Judith. Are you going to trust this fellow, Doctor? We've got to. Perhaps he can be our guide. Oh, gosh, yes, senor. But make haste. Out the back way. I'll get Judith and Mrs. Santos. Carlos, you see that the passage in the back is open. You see? Come on, Doctor. Here, I have the key. Captain, the door's unlocked. No, they're gone. Judith and Mrs. Santos are gone. What have we done? What have we done? Look, they've taken all Judith's baggage. Everything's gone. 
Quick, let's check Mr. Sanders' room. It's just next door. Yeah, this door's unlocked, too. Huh. Look, nothing here at all. Gone. All gone. My son gone, my friend is gone, and now my daughter's gone. That cursed woman, that traitress. Carry Judith off right under our eyes. They'll take her to that evil Chakotas high priest, Mayanai. Doctor, we mustn't waste a minute. I'd rather know she was dead than in their hands. We've got to get through to the sacred city now. We've got to get through. Por Dios, senores, they are upon us. The constabulary is upon us. Run for it, senores, or we will never leave this hotel alive. Yeah, the mob's breaking in. Come on, doctor, we've got to save ourselves. That's the only way we can help Skip and Judith. Skip Turner in the hands of the enemy. Judith betrayed by Mrs. Santos. The Indian mob of La Jolla at the heels of Captain Friday and Dr. English. Listen next week to Chapter 4 of The Land of the Living Dead, which is entitled The Tree That Eats Flesh. You are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents The Land of the Living Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. The original party of Dr. Julian English has dwindled suddenly and appallingly to two people, Dr. English and Captain Friday. Skip Turner has been kidnapped by the Chakota Indians and has been dragged off into the jungles toward the Zambala Mountains and the sacred city of the Brotherhood of the Living Dead. Then suddenly, the secret side of Mrs. Santos' character came to view. Captain Friday overheard a dying agent of the living dead whisper to the woman, you must strike at once if you would save Tula. And Tula is the girl who held the smoking gun at the death of Dr. English's son, Robert. Tula was the green-eyed emissary of the deadly Maya Nahib, high priest of the living dead. But go on, Captain Friday. Yes, it suddenly dawned on me that Mrs. Santos was not a friend, but rather a very clever agent of our enemies, and closely linked with the girl Tula, their agent. You must strike at once, declared the dying priest. And that very hour, Mrs. Santos vanished, and with her went Judith, daughter of Dr. English. With Skip and Judith lost to us, Dr. English and I turned our whole attention to reaching the safety of the monastery at the foot of the Zambala Mountains, where there were friends who would know how to go about rescuing them. Carlos, a fugitive from justice, offered to guide us through the jungle, pretending that he knew the secret passage to the monastery. And now we're deep in the jungles at the mercy of our guide, Carlos. Carlos, you fool, we're lost. You're taking us away from the secret passage. No, no, senor. The trail is just ahead beyond the river. Carlos does not lie. Carlos, no, see, si, senor. Either you don't know the secret passage or you're deliberately misleading us. Now, which is it? Oh, Captain Friday, that could not be. The honor of Carlos is a byword in the marketplace of... Five days now you've led us on deeper into the jungles. Now you've run us up against a blank wall. Fever-infested jungles on our right hand, on our left a wide rushing river that we can't possibly cross. And our path has dwindled to nothing. But, but, senor... Haven't I told you that the lives of my daughter and Skip Turner are at stake? But, senor, across the river we shall again pick up the train. Across the river. Across that vicious stream, foaming and frothing like a mad beast. Ah, but, senor, beneath the river there is a passage. A passage under the river? Look here, is this another of your lies? But did I not promise you to bring you to the river of broken water? Is that not where they were carrying your friend, senor Turner? River of broken water? Is this the river of broken... Look here. Aren't we near the sacrificial stone of the Chakota Indians? I, I know not. I, I have not heard, senor. Strange you haven't heard if you're familiar with the jungle. Mrs. Santos told me that somewhere on this river, there's a great ancient stone upon which young men and girls were stretched in sacrifice to the Chakota gods. Oh, see, si, see, si, senor. These jungles know the horror of human sacrifice. 
I have heard it often in the marketplace in La Jolla. I think you picked up most of your jungle experience in the marketplace. Oh, senor, you are not George. It's high time you learned about Justice Carlos. Do you see this gun? Huh? Oh, uh, are you going to kill me? Two hours after dawn tomorrow morning, if you haven't led us to this passage under the river, I'll kill you. It's only my generosity that lets you live through the night. Uh, no, 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 senor. Tomorrow you will see. Tomorrow I will show you. The passage is but an hour's journey along the bank. One hour after dawn, senor. I ask but one hour. And I give you two. Now go to your tent. Stay there until I call you tomorrow. It's getting dark, Captain Friday, and I'll share the watch alone tonight. Uh, gracias, senor. Muchas gracias. Until tomorrow, senor. Muchas gracias. Hasta mañana. Captain. Captain Friday. Where are you? Over here, Dr. English. There's something out there in the jungle watching us. Watching us? Yes. I stepped off the path to look at a curious flower, a vicious-looking flower. Looked like a bloated orchid. It had a deep throat, deep and red, red as blood. There are a good many curious flowers in these jungles, Captain. Yeah, but that isn't all. As I stood there, something touched the back of my neck. What's that? It was like nothing I've ever felt. My body turned icy cold. For a moment, I was frozen on my feet. Then I whirled. Was it... Human? I saw a face, Doctor. A human face hanging in a tree, staring at me. A horrible human face. Are you sure? Your nerves My nerves are... are all right. I saw it, staring eyes, the eyes of a hanged man, eyes of death, but with life still burning in them. Hopeless, terrified life. And I stood there, my skin burning with fever and my fresh creeping. Jungle fever, Captain. I was afraid of no, this. No, no, I'm not ill. I saw it, I tell you. And then it vanished. Vanished as though it had been suddenly swallowed. Swallowed? Yes, swallowed, as though the tree had swallowed it. Good heavens, man. I tell you, there's something devilish out there in that jungle, something inhuman. Maybe Carlos can explain it. Carlos? Yes. Once the lips of the face moved, and I'll swear they said Carlos. Besides, I felt there was something wrong, something very wrong ever since Carlos joined us. I had a showdown with him just now. I gave him until two hours after dawn tomorrow morning to find the passage under the river. That or death. What did he say to that? Seemed entirely too satisfied. He'll never lead us to the jungle, through the jungle, and the skip and Judith. Something's wrong. You say he's in his tent? Yes, of course. You know, Doctor, I was by the fire smoking last night after you turned in. I looked up and caught Carla's face in the firelight. He was alert, staring into the jungle. Then he saw me watching him, and he grabbed up some wood and began fixing the fire. Hmm. Look here, Doctor. We're doing the best we can. Now, don't worry too much about Judith. Don't worry? How can I help but worry? I know, I know. But look here. We've got to know Mr. Santos pretty well. She wouldn't let him hurt Judith. She wasn't a vicious woman. Anyone in the employ of the Brotherhood of the Living Dead is vicious. Well, yeah, come on. Let's turn in and catch some sleep. Listen. What was that? Come on. It came from down the trail. Captain, keep your gun ready. I have it. And the flash. It may be a trap. That agony was real enough. Here, let me lead. I think I know where it came from. You're thinking of that face in the tree. Yes, I am. Here, it's right ahead. Yeah. There, right ahead. There's the tree. Look, use your flashlight. Captain Friday, stand back. Don't go near. It's the tree of death. Tree of death? Look. Look, it has Carlos in its grasp. Its limbs are clutching at his body. Look at them ride like snakes. Doctor, what on earth are we seeing? One of the little pleasantries of the La Jolla jungle, Captain. The tree that eats flesh. What are you saying? They, they threw me to the tree of death, senor. I, I, I've done my work and... They no longer need me. They? They? Uh, Carlos, can you speak quickly? Uh, Who are they? My masters, the, the brothers to the living dead. But why kill you? Uh, why, Carlos? No! Oh, it is killing me. It is killing me. I can't stand this, Doctor. I'm going uh, into that tree. Keep away, Captain. That's suicide. Uh, Look how the branches are uh, writhing and reaching for you. Uh, is that tree alive? It's sensitive to the presence of flesh. Uh, the limbs reach for flesh to eat exactly as the ordinary tree lifts its limbs skyward to feed on sunshine and fresh air. Carlos, can you still talk? It, it, it is squeezing my, my brain. Carlos, answer me. Why were you thrown to the tree of death? Because I, I revealed the, the secret of the passage under the river. And it's all over. He's gone. Disappeared, just as though he'd been swallowed by that tree. I know, Captain. You're thinking of the other face you saw on that tree. Yes, I... I wonder who it was. Why do you say it like that? I was thinking of Skip. Skip? Skip? 
Wouldn't you have known if it had been skipped? How could I? It wasn't a human face when I saw it. Captain, this is terrible. You... You don't think it might have been... No, no, not Judith. I know it wasn't. It was a man. Come on, back to camp, Captain. We're alone now. Alone in the La Jolla jungle. Oh, no, you are not, gentlemen. If either of you move a step, you will be run through with a poison spear. Who said that? I don't see anyone. Of course you see no one. But I am here. Here in the jungle. Your hands over your heads, both of you. Do as you're told, Captain. We're trapped. Good advice, Dr. English. Remember, you die the instant you move. Mon, you and Ikan, take their weapons. Yeah, looks like the end of the trail, Doctor. The end, Captain Friday. The end, unless... Unless what? Why don't you come out of those shadows and show yourself? <laughs> it does not suit my purpose to come out. As to the other, you may still save yourselves and Senor Skip Turner if a certain piece of dried human skin is turned over to me. Is that true? Give me the map, and I promise you safe escort aboard the ship at La Jolla. And my daughter, too? Your daughter? Yes, yes, my daughter. I refuse to agree to anything unless you return my daughter. Ikan, take them to the Chicota sacrificial throne. There are ways of making men tell their innermost secrets, Dr. English. And Ikan, when they are stretched upon the ancient sacrificial stone, many things may be done to the anatomy. <laughs> many unpleasant things. See? Just a minute. Throw them into the dungeon at the foot of the sacrificial stone. Skip. Is it really you? You and Dr. English? So they've got you in the dungeon too, Skip. Are you all right? Oh, sure, I'm okay. But man, I never expected to see you two again. Hey, grab Dr. English. He's going to pass out. No, no, I'm all right, but all hope of saving Judith is gone. Judith? Captain, what's happened to Judith? Kidnapped by Mrs. Santos the day you were captured. Kidnapped by Mrs. Santos? Well, then she's... Yes, a traitor in our camp. And you ain't heard a word? Not a word. She's gone. Skip, have you been in this little stone cell ever since they captured you? Yeah. But where are we? We were pushed in here with you without any chance to look around. What is this place? Look through that chink in the wall. You mean here? Yeah. It doesn't look like much. Just another stone chamber. A good deal bigger than this. Looks pretty gloomy. Well, use your eyes, boss. What are you driving at, Skip? You see that big rock at the end of the chamber? Oh, you mean the one covered with red paint? Red paint. Paint is good. Look here, Skip. What's the mystery? You're looking at the Jakota sacrificial rock. Eh? What's that? Here, Captain, let me have a look. You mean that red is, is the blood of the poor critters sacrificed to the Jakota gods during the last thousand years? Then we must be in the death chamber. I reckon so. Looks like we're going to be next. Skip, is this a gag? Do you know what you're talking about? Listen, if you think civilized people know anything about torture, just wait till you see these Jakota Indian priests at work. So that's what we're in for, eh? What's that, Dr. English? What do you see through the chink in the wall? It's the drum ceremony. The Jakota invocation to the sun god. Hey, look through the crack, Captain. Into the amphitheater. You see, the sun's coming over the eastern wall. The sun shows over there every morning. It ain't got no roof on it. It's a beautiful sight. You're right, Captain. Beauty and viciousness are very close relatives in the Jakota soul. Civilized man's incapable of understanding these ancient people. Skip, how are we locked in here? This room we're in must be thousands of years old. Is there a modern lock on the door? No, oh, their fastening is as old as the building itself. Some sort of a system of bars and interlock. It holds the stone door closed all right, though. Eh, might as well be a dozen year locks as far as we're concerned. But supposing we had a friend on the outside. But we ain't. But supposing we did have. Well, if we did have a friend outside, I don't suppose they'd have much trouble getting us free. But what the heck you getting at? We ain't got a friend. I was just supposing. Supposing we've got a friend. Listen, Skip. That werewolf fellow. Looks like death approaches the English expedition. Why do you say that? Every time we've heard that howl, hasn't someone either died or come very near to death? Yeah, that's right. Gives me kind of the... Hey, listen. Somebody stopped just outside our door. So death is going to pay us another visit. They're coming for us. 
There's no two ways about that. They're coming for us. Captain Friday, Skip, and Dr. English are in the death dungeon of the Chakota Sacrificial Temple. Through a chink in the wall, they can look in upon the execution chamber and the sacrificial stone. And just outside the dungeon, the werewolf and the Chakota priests are standing. One of the three, or perhaps all, are to go to the execution room. down the bars. One of us is going to pay a little visit to that red rack out yonder, sure as shoot. Before that happens, we'll introduce him to a good old-fashioned knockdown, drag-out street brawl. It isn't you boys they want, Captain. It's me. They want the map. The map of the secret passage between the La Jolla Monastery and the Sacred City. That is true. Hey, I didn't see the door open. You have a high sense of intuition, Dr. English. Good morning, senores. No, it ain't a good morning. Easy, Skip. Doctor... Once again, I make you a proposition. You give me the map, and I promise you and your two friends safe conduct back to the United States. But Judith, my daughter. What of my daughter? <laughs> oh, yes. The senorita. Look, fella, I'm going to take you apart. Be quiet, like... you fool. I'll tend to you later. Come, Dr. English. Which do you choose? To give up the map or a trip to the sacrificial stone. Oh, a great guy when you're in the driver's seat, ain't you? Skip, no use antagonizing him. Oh. The sacrificial stone is not a comfortable bed. Come, which do you choose? You can't bargain with me so long as my daughter's in danger. Ikan, um, remove the doctor to the sacrificial chamber. Wait a minute, doctor. Let's have this thing out. Do not move, Captain Friday. Each of my men is armed with a poisoned spear. A mere scratch from which would cause you instant death. Stand where you are. Take the doctor out. It's no use, Captain. Look at the tips of those spears covered with deadly venom. Yeah, but, Doctor, no, we can skip. Do... No, But this isn't the end yet. Some of us are bound to reach the sacred city. <laughs> what wonderful faith. Are you going to walk, or do you prefer to be dragged? I'll walk. I ain't going to stand here and see Close the door. Stood by and let me carry Dr. English off to be executed. That's what we did. Yeah, great. Well, why didn't we pitch into him? If we'd moved, we'd been dead now. And the doctor'd still be in the same fix. Dead, we're a total loss. Alive, we might still work an angle. Yeah. You know what we are? We're just a pair of lambs waiting our turn at the slaughter. Snap out of it. I'll be thinking of some way to fight our way out of here. <sighs> okay, what you want me to do? One of us is going to watch the sacrificial chamber through this chink in the wall. The other's going to try to find a way of opening that door. Which job do you want? I never want to see that sacrificial chamber again. Not after what I seen yesterday. And see what you can do with the door. I'll watch. You'll be sorry if you do. It'll haunt you the rest of your days. I wouldn't do it if it wasn't necessary. But it may give us a clue as to our own future actions. The only clue it'll give you'll be how you're going to die. Nevertheless, I... Uh-oh. They stripped Dr. English to the waist. Yeah, nobody ever dies on a sacrificial stone with his clothes on. And they've grabbed him. Three. No, no, four men have thrown him on the rock. On his back, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's the way the girl died, too. Skip. Skip, what are they doing? Well, you wanted to watch. Oh, well, there ain't nothing I can do with this door, and you know it. They've got him on his back. One man holding each foot, a man hanging on each arm. Do you have to tell me? Haven't I seen it? Don't I know that each priest will brace his foot against a stone and pull in four directions until his body's as taut as the head of a drum? Now, that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah, and then that werewolf beast will step forward with his knife and... Run his hand over the body until he finds the tortoise spot of all. Don't I know? Didn't I see it with my own eyes? Animals. Animals, all of them. Yeah, find a place where the tension is greatest. And there's where he'll plunge the knife. The werewolf's stepping forward. He's bending over. Skip. There's Tula. There's Tula. Who? Tula. The green-eyed girl who killed Robert. She's standing right behind the werewolf. Right behind him. Sure, she's part of the ceremony. Look how beautiful she is. How can anything so beautiful be so ungodly? Like a snake. So Tula's companion of the werewolf. Skip, he's running his hand over the doctor's body. Look, he's found the spot. I know, it's always the same. On the left side, right under the heart. Mrs. Santos. Mrs. Santos is there too. She just crept inside the doorway. Hey, is she a prisoner? No. No, she's standing in a shadow. They haven't seen her yet. And she's one of the sacred priests. Made suckers out of us. She fooled me all right. 
Skip. Werewolf's raised his knife. He's asking Dr. English a question. Yeah, must be about the map. You know, the doctor won't give in. He shook his head. And it's all over. No, no, no! Hey, what happened? Is Dr. English dead? Quiet, listen. Look! Look at the sun! The healer monster is riding with the sun! Skip! Come here and look! There's the shadow of a Gila monster on the face of the sun. The prophecy's fulfilled. The Gila monster is riding with the sun. And that means some awful catastrophe for the world. The Dakotas are struck dumb. They're scared stiff. Hey, they've let Dr. English go. He's off the stone. Yeah, they've forgotten all about him. He's got away. He's free. The priests are just standing there staring at the sun. Oh, I hope he makes it. I hope he makes it. He's out of the chamber. Mrs. Sanders has disappeared. Oh, if we were only out of here, Cappy. Dr. English won't have a chance alone, but the three of us might put up a fight. We... Hey, someone's opening the door. Who is it? Who's out there? It's Dr. English. It's Dr. English. He didn't run away. He's freeing us, Captain. Yeah, yeah, I heard you. Hurry, Doctor. The Dakotas have come to their senses. They've discovered you've gone. Hurry, Doctor, hurry. Hurry. Come, come quickly. Into the jungle. It's our only chance. Into the jungle. How much further to the river do you think, Doctor? Phew, I'm about all in. Well, if Carlos didn't lie to us, and men don't lie when they're dying, then the passage under the river should be very near this place. Now, let's, let's get our breath for a moment. Yeah. Phew. Well, they'll never find us in this tangle of jungle. Good thing you grabbed up your clothes as you left, Doctor. This is no place for a man in a loincloth. I wonder if you realize how true your words are. Look, Captain. See that plant? The one with the leaves splashed with red? Yes. Only those red splashes happen to be vicious red ants. Red ants? A few hundred of them could eat a man alive in 24 hours. You mean these ants eat flesh? That's right. <laughs> Everything seems to eat human flesh down here, even the trees. Skip, look out. What? A snake? Oh, that was a close one for you, Skip. Man, look at the size of it. A poisonous brute called a swamp steak. Thanks, Cappy. But where in heck did it come from? Drop down from that limb above your head. Unroll like a tape measure. Must be 12 feet if he's an inch. Ooh. Come on, let's get out of this jungle. This is the awfulest hole I ever was in. Here, let me go ahead. I'm familiar with the jungle. Follow close on my heels. Whatever you do, don't touch so much as a leaf without first knocking it with your club. Never can tell where a poisonous bug or reptile may be hidden. Pleasant thought. Yeah, remember this. Every step you take is as much as your life is worth. Hey, what sort of an entrance do you think this passage under the river will have, Doctor? I haven't the slightest idea, Skip. Maybe a dark tunnel mouth overgrown by vines. Oh, well, that's going to make it hard to find. <laughs> Doesn't sound very encouraging. Maybe weeks finding it. Remember, we got no food or weapons. Listen, there's the roar of the river. Come on. We're about an hour's travel up the river from our camp. The passage under the river can't be far off. Look! Look! Well, burn my britches, a building. A concrete building in the middle of the jungle. Nothing of the kind, Skip. Ancient ruins. Look at the jagged, broken walls. The caved-in roof. Chakota ruin. Hey, Dr. English, we're discoverers. A lot of good Chakota ruins are to us. What I want to find is that secret passage under the river. Hey, Doctor, you suppose we could explore that building? Oh, that's great. With Chakota savages on our trail and the death of the La Jolla jungle all around us, you want to explore. Captain Friday's right, Skip. We can't stop now. But what a wealth of archaeological material that old place must hold. Yeah, but it's right on the edge of the river. What's that got to do with it? Well, but don't you suppose... Look here. Maybe the entrance to the river passage is in that building. Yeah, what do you say, Doctor? Is that reasonable? Why not, Doctor? Don't you remember? Carla said the tunnel was right around here. That's a wise thought, my boy. Well, let's get at it. It's going to be dark pretty soon. We've got to search through old ruins. I want daylight. Come on, let's go. Look at that magnificent structure. Thousands and thousands of years ago, perhaps this building was the place of worship for a great race of people whose civilizations lost to the world. Nothing but a heap of decaying rock and vegetation now. Yeah, except for the walls. Look. Look at the mosaic floors. Did you ever see more beautiful carving? The pattern almost wiped off that solid stone by time and the elements. Think how many centuries the wind and rain must have swept floors and... Dr. English. Dr. English. Listen. Dr. English. 
The passage on your right leads to the cavern beneath the river. Hey, who said that? Where is she? Keep still. The passage to the right. The passage to the right. Mrs. Santos' voice. I don't see nobody. Just a voice. Quickly. Quickly. You must not hesitate if you would be saved. Take the passage to the right. Here. This is the way. Come on. Doctor, you're not going to follow those instructions. Remember, it was she who took Judith. Then what do we do, Captain? Anything but fall into another of her traps? You have little time left. Act quickly. I am your friend. Then where's Judith? The path to the right. I'm going. I'm going to take a chance. Skip, don't be a fool. I'm going, Captain. Maybe at least I can see Judith once again before I get stretched on that sacrificial rock. Doctor, stop him. He's walking into certain death. I'm going with him, Captain. No, you fools. You unadulterated fools. You're walking into a trap. Don't come if you feel that way, Captain Friday. No, of course I'm going with you. To the left now, Senor Turner. To the left. Now down the three steps. Trust me, Senor. Down the three steps. Again to the left. Now around the big boulder. We're all a pack of lunatics to do this. You are now at the mouth of the cavern, Senor Turner. There are torches set up along the route for you. Hey, looky, ain't that a sight? Torches along the walls of the cave. I'm going in. Wait, Skip. At least let's go in together. Keep close, Doctor. All right, let's go. Hey, them torches throw funny shadows on the wall. Look. Hieroglyphics on the wall. Watch your step. I still think this is a trap. <laughs> hey. <laughs> and you were right, Captain Friday. But the werewolf. It is a trap. The werewolf says it's a trap. Mrs. Santos says she is still to be trusted. In the tunnel beneath the river of broken waters, Captain Friday, Skip Turner, and Dr. English face the new menace of the Brotherhood of the Living Dead. And what of Judith? Further developments of the land of the living dead will be unfolded next week at this same time. You are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents The Land of the Living Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, Come with me. Deep in the Chilean jungle, Captain Friday has escaped from the Chicota sacrificial chamber with Skip Turner and Dr. English, only to be led into a second trap in the passage under the river by the voice of Mrs. Santos. Hardly had they entered the underground passageway, which was lighted by weird flickering torches, when they came face to face with members of the living dead priesthood headed by the werewolf, face to face with a half-man, half-animal whose eyes glittered and whose ears lay flat against his head like a mad dog. And by his side, but this is your story, Captain Friday. Yes, by his side stood the beautiful green-eyed Tula, Chakota priestess, with her lovely lips curled in a snarl as vicious as the werewolf's. Then suddenly from some side passage stepped Mrs. Santos. She stepped between the werewolf's back and skipped Dr. English and me. To our surprise, the werewolf fell to the ground, groveling, and his pack dissolved into the darkness with yelps of terror, Tula escaping with them. And now we're in the ancient La Jolla Monastery, the refuge of all persons like ourselves who are fighting the priesthood of the living dead and who seek the downfall of their sinister Maya Nahi. Maya Nahi, dissolute high priest of the sacred city of Chicota, who in his jungle sanctuary plans the downfall of all nations and the end of all civilization. The monastery of La Jolla raises its gaunt walls on one side of the Zambala Mountains. On the other side of the mountains lies Maya Nahib's lair, 
also known as the land of the living dead. And now, senores, that the monks have received you and have appointed you each a cell, I want you to come with me. Yes, some place, any place where we can talk. I've got to know what's become of Judith. You put me off and put me off. Mrs. Santos, if my daughter's fallen into the hands of the Maya Naib... Patience, Dr. English. The walls are listening. The whole world will know it if you... Senores, come into this chamber. The monks gave you candles, Capitan Friday. Light them. Hey, did we just get ourselves locked in? Light your candle, Skip. Well. Father, Captain Friday. Oh, Father, you're safe. Judith's my daughter. Oh, father. Oh, doggone, Judith. Oh, I ain't never been so glad to see oh, anybody. Here, here, here. 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 Hold it, everybody. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. We're not getting anywhere this way. Oh. One at a time, please. Now, let's hear what Judith and Mrs. Santos have to say first. Yeah, Judith. How'd you get here? And what was Mrs. Santos doing in the Dakota Sacrificial Temple? Man, now she scared the pants off that werewolf fella and that green-eyed babe, too. Look. Hold it, Skip. Huh? Let Judith talk. Well, I, I came by way of a secret passage between La Jolla and the monastery here. But, Mrs. Santos, you tell me. The secret passage? But how did Dr. you... Dr. English, did you not get my message? What message? A verbal message from an old Indian. We didn't get any message. The moment we discovered you and Judith gone from the hotel, we fled into the jungle. That explains it. The message I left said, wait at the hotel until tomorrow. Then you will follow Judith and me through the secret passage. You'd better explain that, Mrs. Santos. There were friends from the monastery who knew the secret passage waiting in La Jolla. When Juan, our guide, was slain, they came to our aid. Because of the danger from the agents of the living dead, they could not take us all at once. So they slipped Judith and me away and were to have come for you to make a second caravan on the following day. Your sudden dash into the jungle upset everything. Then we are to trust you after all, Mrs. Santos. I hope so, Dr. English. Then what did that dying Indian mean when he said, if you would save Tula, you must strike at once? <gasps> you heard? And what were you doing with the priestess Tula in the chamber when they were about to sacrifice Dr. English? You saw me there? Yes. I was not with Tula, Captain Friday. But you stood there watching them put the doctor through the agony of the sacrifice. Why were you allowed the run of the temple if you're not a friend of the living dead? Did you know, Captain Friday, that it was I who saved Dr. English? That it was I who called attention to the shadow of the Gila monster on the face of the sun? That was coincidence, Mrs. Santos. You were as much appalled by it as the werewolf and Tula were. Coincidence, you think? I wonder... You have answered none of Captain Friday's questions, Mrs. Santos. None of them. And they all implicate you, connect you with mankind's deadliest enemies, the brothers of the living dead. You refuse to trust me, Dr. English? Trust you? How can I trust a woman who can turn back a mob of half-mad savages led by a creature as vicious as the werewolf merely by the simple signal of a hand? Signal? Signal? Yes, you signaled the werewolf. Mrs. Santos, what is your relationship with Maya Naib and his living dead? My... my relationship? Yes. In what capacity do you serve them? Dr. English, you do not know what you are saying. But I saw you signal. You saw? You saw my hand? What movement did you see it make? Tell me, what movement did you see me make? I, I, to be frank with you, I couldn't see your hand. It was your general attitude, the gesture of your arm. Your back was then to me, Then you did not see. You did not see the signal. Then you admit you did signal. But that does not matter as long as you did not see the signal. But what the heck's so important about that? I will tell you. You must believe. Yes? For the first time in my life, I found it necessary to have recourse to certain discoveries which my husband made in his investigations of the ancient priesthood. You mean some form of mysticism? See, the gesture of my hand represented a single word, the most powerful, most potent word that the mind of man has ever conceived. Its origin dates back to the dawn of life, and in all these hundreds of thousands of years, not once, has it ever been spoken by the lips of man? For it is a word which cannot be spoken. You expect us to believe that? I have told you, Captain Friday, that in the La Jolla Monastery we battle mysticism with mysticism. That gesture of my hand saved our lives. 
and brought us safely to the monastery. But how did you know that the werewolf would understand and obey? I did not know. For he is a power in my Anahib sacred city. In the temple of the living dead, the sign is known. And it seemed only right that he would know it. For his own protection. Well, I don't get it. What for the love of Mike does this sign mean? That I cannot reveal, Senor Skip. Oh, it sounds like a lot of cheap oakum to me. Oh, no, Skip. What do you say, Doctor? It's quite possible that Mrs. Santos is telling the truth, Captain. Quite possible? Quite possible? You suppose the monks of this monastery would allow me to... It would be well for the Brotherhood of the Living Dead to have a spy in the enemy's stronghold, Mrs. Santos, especially an agent with your credentials. And is this the thanks I get, Captain Friday, for rescuing you and your friends? You insisted on us coming down here. You exposed us to danger. You remember that, don't you, Mrs. Santos? Captain Friday, not too harsh. And another thing. Dr. English, doesn't it seem strange that your son Robert didn't once mention either yourself or Judith the name of Mrs. Roberto Santos after his return and before he was murdered? Yes, I've thought of that. In fact, doesn't it seem strange that if they were such intimate friends as Mrs. Santos declares, that he didn't bring her directly home with him? Yes, Captain, it does. Such a friend would have been more than welcome in our home. You senores are worn out with fatigue and excitement. You are overly suspicious at the moment. Your minds are not fit to judge any situation clearly tonight. I will leave you now. I would advise you to go to the cells the monks have provided and sleep. Perhaps understanding will come to you in your dreams. Well, here we've spent two weeks in this blooming monastery, and what have we accomplished? Answer? Nothing. With a capital M. Ah, oh, but how wonderfully peaceful and quiet it is now. Yeah, it's been tough sledding for you, Judy. For all of us, Skip. Where's Dr. English? With Mrs. Santos. That was a horrible fall she had down those rough stone steps yesterday. Captain Friday, she would have been killed if you hadn't saved her. She'll be in bed a week with those bruises. Those monks are wizards when it comes to human ills. They're so quiet and efficient and sure of themselves. I had a headache... And one of them simply passed his hand over my forehead and down the back of my neck. And the pain was gone instantly. Hmm. <laughs> Funny ducks, ain't they? With their prayer wheels and their rough sackcloth robes down to their feet. Their leader reminds me of the Dalai Lama of Tibet. There is a close connection, I suspect. Father thinks so, too. Well, what I wish is that Dr. English should bring out that secret map of his. The one drawn on human skin. Why don't he? No, Skipper. Don't mention that map again. Hmm? Not here, nor any place else. You'll never see that map here. Well, then how the heck are we going to find the Father and I know every line of that map by heart. Yeah, but how the heck are me and the captain going to help hunt out the key that'll lead to the secret passage? The one between the monastery and the sacred city, if we don't know what was on the map. Skip, keep your voice down. Mm -hmm. One of us will have to tell you. Well, don't you think it's about time you did it, then? As I understand it, the passage begins somewhere right here in this monastery. Skip and I have searched the place as thoroughly as possible, but not a clue. Well, that's not surprising. The monks here have been hunting for years. Then they've known all along there's an entrance into the sacred city. Yes. That's why we're so welcome here, given the run of the monastery. They are as anxious as we to solve the riddle of the secret passage. Well, listen, Captain and I are going down into the underground part of the monastery again this afternoon. Now, uh, how about giving us a lead, huh? Well, but I want to go along, Skip. Why, sure. Of course you can come along, honey. Uh, Judith? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hmm? Look here, Skip. Are you calling Judith honey in private? That's the second slip for you today. Why, you, uh... Do you mind, Captain Friday, if I don't? Oh, haven't any objection in the world. But I'm warning you. Watch out for him. <laughs> you go to blazes. But, uh, as you were saying about the map, darling, um... Hey, Judith, hey. <laughs> oh, aren't you ashamed to meet a skip like that? Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> I'll fix him. No, but... Seriously, about that now. At the beginning of the secret passage, it shows a building representing this monastery, standing on the edge of a mountain in a terrible storm. Storm, huh? Has that some significance? Yes. The rain is falling in great torrents, and there is a long, jagged streak of lightning just over the building. I see. That's all. It, that's all? Well, it, it isn't very much, but... Well, somewhere in this monastery is a door. And what I have just told you is the key to it. Well, then we'll find it. Hmm. 
the monks have been hunting years. And you the optimistic lad. And we've got to work fast. Remember, two weeks have passed since the Gila monster rode with the sun. The catastrophe which it predicts may crash down on the world at any moment. Yeah, but how will our enter in the secret city prevent this world tragedy? Saying it's true. It's feared by those who know that Maya Nahi and his living dead will be at the bottom of the catastrophe. But the monster has already ridden with the sun. Doesn't that mean we're too late? You mustn't say that, Captain. You mustn't even think it. The Black Death is too terrible. Captain Friday, Skip Turner, and their companions, Dr. English, and his daughter, Judith, are in the dank slime of the underground room in the La Jolla Monastery, searching. Down here in the darkness, with only reed torches and flashlights, they are looking for the entrance to the secret passage. The passage which will lead them into the very heart of the enemy. The stronghold of the Brotherhood of the Living Dead. Careful, Judith. It's a slimy, dark, wet place down here. Yes. Dank as a rain barrel. And we'd sure be in a fix without these torches the monks have stuck up all around. Hey, what do you suppose these big bare chambers are used for, Dr. English? This looks very much like a chapel of some kind. Notice the paintings on the walls and the altar. The altar down at the lower end of the room. Who do you suppose did them, Doctor? Spanish? Oh, no, no. These are the work of the Indians. Some truly marvelous pieces of work. Now, look at this one. I... By Joe. Judith. Father, what is this? Look, Judith. This picture here. <gasps> oh. Holy mackerel. Look, a picture of a storm. The map. Our precious map. Exactly. You think this is the key to the secret passage? Symbolical, see? At the top of the room, it's rain. By the time it's reached the center of the wall, it's a veritable waterfall. Oh, yes, yes. Look how the big rock divides the waterfall. On the one side, the water runs in a boiling, frothy disorder. And on the other side of the rock, the water falls smoothly. Gently, almost placidly. Oh, never mind that, Dr. English. But the symbolism, man, the symbolism, don't you see? The rock painted on the wall represents the dividing line between turmoil and ascension on the one side and order and harmony on the other. Yeah, sure, I suppose so. You mean we're to look for a rock and that's the key to the secret passage? But where are we supposed to look? Why look any farther? Rain and lightning was the clue given on the map. There's your rain and lightning. Hold your flash directly on that painting of the rock, Captain. Hey, wait a minute. I've got it. Look here. The painting of the rock exactly outlines the actual stone on the wall. Do you suppose we're actually looking at the rock that hides the opening to the secret passage? I'd swear it. Well, what do you know? Here, Doctor. We can move this altar up against the wall. By standing on it, we'll have easy access to the rock. Good. Give us a hand with it. Yeah, let's go. Come on. Uh, it's solid stone, but we can do it. All right. Come, come on. on. Everybody now. Yeah. All right. Easy. Easy. Yeah. <clears throat> There you are. Hey, it's strange the monks haven't run onto this. Would you? Remember, we had the original clue, the storm scene. They're not in a million years. <laughs> Clever, these Indians. Better let me climb up and try the stone first, Doctor. Go ahead, Captain. Judith, you and Skip hold your flashes on the picture. Yes. Even if it is the gateway to the secret passage, these past 300 years will have sealed it pretty tight. Yeah, sure. Hey, you up, Captain? Yeah. Hey, here, here. Take this chisel. It'll help you to loosen the dirt and mortar around the edges. And here's a wooden mallet to pound with. Out of everything, huh? Yeah, I've got him. Now we try it. How does she look? Hello. There isn't any mortar in the cracks. Huh? Look out. Huh? Look. Look, it's swinging open. The rock swung open. It's on a pivot. That's strange. That opened entirely too easily. Been used lately, all right. Swung open the moment I touched it. Uh, are we going in? Well, anyway, there's your passageway, Doctor. It couldn't be anything but the secret passageway, could it? No, no, it's got to be. Of course we're going in. Okay. Skip, help Judith up on the order. Yeah. Give me your hand. Up, you come in the passage. Uh, there. Oh, it's, it's dark in here. No noise, please. You're next, Doctor. I'm coming. Here, give me your hand. Uh, there. Yeah, thanks. Okay, come on, Skip. You bet. Uh, and here we are. Yeah. Now, Doctor, you and I lead. Judith, follow us. And Skip, you bring up the rear. Yeah. Everyone keep his flash in one hand and his gun in the other. Come on. There's a fine sand on the floor. 
Our feet don't make a sound. Hey, Doctor, look at these walls. All these carvings. Ancient Jakarta works, Skip. A magnificent fine for us. I don't doubt but much of the unknown history of the world is told in these pictures. Look. Clear to the ceiling. At least 15 feet high. And as far down the passage as our light carries. Beautiful. Stupendous. Look, the stairway ahead. We're going down into another room. Hey, we should have closed that entrance. I tended to it, Captain. Oh, good. All right, down the steps now. Careful. Amazing. Look, Captain. The room we're descending into is hewn from solid rock. A man. A man screamed. Hey, I thought we had this place to ourselves. Hold it. Listen. Well, are we going on? What do you say, Doctor? We're going on. Judith? If you want to go back, there's still time. I, I, I'm still going with you. Any idea what that was, Doctor? Sounded like a man in mortal agony. Diabolical. Oh. Hey, there it is again. Listen. English. Dr. Julian English. Someone's calling your name, Doctor. Come on, come on. Keep your gun handy, Skip. You bet you. Listen. Listen. Hey, there he is. There on the floor. Oh, no. Horrible. Judith, get hold of yourself. Yes. Stand up on your feet or I'll shake you. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll be all right. Here, give me a hand, Skip. Dr. English, this man's chained to the wall. Too, too late, Dr. English. I, I, I'm finished. The, the end of the passage, the stairway to, to the sun. Chained to the wall. Poor, emaciated body. We came too late. Hey, look, he's white. American. You know him, Doctor? He called your name. Hold the light on his face. Judith, look. It's Arthur Henderson. It's Henderson. Of course I know him. Henderson? But, but his hair is white. Henderson was a big man. There's, there's nothing but skin and bones. Agony can do that to a man. Agony and terror. But who is he? Fellow archaeologist. Saw him less than two years ago at the International Convention in Bogota. Only two years ago. But how did he get here? The brothers to the living dead have taken another pawn from our side of the board, Captain. Robert? Henderson? Who's to be next? Looks like we are. I'm for getting out of here. Quiet. Put out those lights. The werewolf. Talk about your black magic. That thing's everywhere. Looks as though we've tracked him to his lair this time. Listen. Gone. Just a wolf cry fading out into thin air. Look, Doctor, why not get the monks back at the monastery to help us? We can come back with a crew of those monks. Turn back now after what Henderson said? You don't know what you're saying. What Henderson said? Yes, at the end of the passage, the stairway to the sun. Well, what about it? I think now I know what that zigzag streak of lightning in the storm symbolizes. Come, we've got to go ahead. Yeah, you're the scientist. You say so. You can stand there and see the way this is affecting Judith and still say go no, on? No, no, Skip. Of course we're going on. Remember, Judith, if you keep your head, use it. I'm all right, Father. Look, there must be hundreds of rooms down here. Little passageways leading off in every direction. Hello, something ahead. Steady with your light, Doctor. Stairway. Henderson's stairway to the sun. Well, what do you know? Broad as a road and leading up and up and up. It doesn't seem to be any end. Hewn out of solid rock. And look, there on the first step, a great yellow disc planted in the rock. And golden rays shooting out in all directions. See, there's one on every step. Looks like gold. Why, it is gold. The stairway to the sun. Stairway is a series of terraces. Seven steps, and then a terrace. Then seven more steps. It's the same all the way up. Wonderful. Wonderful. Father, look. Look there on the first terrace. Hello, a skeleton. Skeleton. Chained to the wall. Yeah, and there's another on the next terrace. And on the next. And the next. And the next. Stairway to the sun, my eye. More like we was coming up out of the pit of Hades. Oh, it's hideous. It's... Catch her, Skip. Uh, yeah. I got her. Oh, poor little kid. She couldn't take it. Here, let me see her. Hmm. That's all right. You'll be all right in a moment. We'll have to carry her. We can't stop now. Yeah, she's light as a pigeon. I'll take her when you give out. Are you kidding? Okay, Doctor, you and I lead off. Skip, sing out if we go too fast for you. 
poor luckless chaps. There must be thousands of those skeletons on this stairway. Up and up we go, right into the heart of some vast mountain. And on every seventh step is a grinning skull and a heap of bones chained to the wall. Wait. There's a light. It's coming from a doorway leading off the terrace just above us. It's coming through a drape over the doorway. Now, you folks wait here. I'll go ahead and investigate. If I flash my light once, that means for Dr. English to come on alone. If twice, it's all right for all of you to come. Watch yourself, boss. There's one flash. Time to go. You wait here, Skip. Okay, but I don't like it. What is it, Captain? Keep your voice down. Great stone chamber with torches stuck in the wall. Four persons seated at a table. No any of them? No, uh, three in long cloaks and their hoods over their faces. The fourth is a werewolf monster. A werewolf, eh? Listen, the werewolf's talking. Pull the curtain back just a bit. Maybe we can hear. Easy now. And as I have said, I have just come from the great master. For three days now, the people have seen the shadow of the monster upon the face of the sun. The hour is at hand. Centuries of waiting are at hand. (laughs) The world is ours. The world and all its millions and millions of helpless people to crush. To crush. These are the words of Maya Nagy. The Almighty One. The agents are awaiting the command to strike. This present civilization, ah, we will wipe it from the face of the earth. We will breed a greater civilization. The brothers of the living dead will rule the earth. Maya Nahib has spoken. Five days hence, you will have word from the master. Then strike. New York, San Francisco. Paris, Berlin, London, around the world, the Black Death shall raise. But strike London first. Crush London first. Wipe them from the earth. Crush London. Remember, five days. Then the dance of death begins. But come, I must return to the city of our fathers. Maya Naive, the great high priest, awaits. Return to your post. Quick, Doctor. They're coming out. Get back into the recess. All right. Back in the shadow. <laughs> Return to your post. But in five days, world will come. Yes. And then the dance of death will be here. Did you hear that, Captain? Only five days. Hold it. Only three people passed us. There's still one in the room. Be quiet. Here he comes. Let's get him. Doctor, I've got him. They're not much of a fighter. I've got my hand over his mouth. Oh, blast this, Doc. Give me a handkerchief. Yeah. Got a gag in his mouth. Captain, why do you look crazy? You'll have a whole crew down on us with your noise. Oh, I'm sitting on him. He can't hold. I haven't made much noise. Now, listen. Yeah, not a sound. We're safe enough for the moment. Here, turn on your flash. Let's see what we've got. You fool. There, turn it on his face. In heaven's name. Mr. Santos. You! It's Mrs. Santos again. Mrs. Santos, who is in the confidence of the monks of the monastery. Mrs. Santos, who says she is fighting the living dead with body and soul. And here Captain Friday and Dr. English have caught her conniving with the highest agents of Maya Nahib the Evil. Next week, you will hear the sixth episode of The Land of the Living Dead. You are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents The Land of the Living Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. 
If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. This is what has happened to date. Robert English, son of Dr. Julian English, archaeologist, was killed the night he returned to San Francisco from Chile, South America, with information concerning the land of the living dead hidden in the La Jolla jungles. His killer was believed to be Tula, beautiful and deadly priestess of the Brotherhood of the Living Dead. Then, Mrs. Robert Santos arrived in San Francisco, also from La Jolla. She persuaded Dr. English and his daughter Judith with Captain Friday and Skip Turner, that their own lives were threatened by the ancient brotherhood. But here's Captain Friday. Yes, she urged us to go with her to La Jolla, Chile, where we would have the protection of a monastery whose friendly monks are fighting the forces known as the living dead. The monastery is pitched on the steeps of the Zambala Mountains. On the opposite side of the mountains lies the sacred city or stronghold of the enemy, ruled over by that high priest, Maya Nahib. No sooner had we arrived in La Jolla then we became aware that Mrs. Santos had some strange attachment with the Brotherhood of the Living Dead. Finally, however, we reached the safety of the monastery and discover an underground passageway which led to the enemy's sacred city from the monastery. Boy, did we find it. Go ahead and tell them, Skip. Well, more than that, we discover Miss Santos in conference with priests of the Living Dead. We found them in the secret underground passage, and we took Miss Santos prisoner. <laughs> In the meantime, the prophecy that the Gila monster was to ride on the face of the sun had been fulfilled. The Brotherhood believed that each time there was to be a world catastrophe, there appeared on the face of the sun the shadow of a Gila monster. The monster had appeared, and thus a new world catastrophe seemed imminent. Dr. English and Judith believed that the tragedy was to come through the agency of Maya Nahib, high priest of the enemy. This belief was strengthened when he and I heard the werewolf, agent of Maya Nahib, declare that the civilization of the world was to be destroyed in five days. But now they have captured Mrs. Santos. Oh, you fools, you miserable, meddling fools. Fools, are we? Fools to catch you double-crossing us, huh? Don't you know by entering this passage that you will precipitate immediate attack upon the monastery by the priests of the living dead? Do you think that Maya Nahib will wait an instant to strike when he realizes that those in the monastery know of this passage under the mountain? But why should he know, Mrs. Santos? We've avoided his agent so far. Ah, believe me, Dr. English. If he does not know, he will know very soon. You will not be the one to tell him, Mrs. Santos. What do you mean, Captain Friday? That you are our prisoner and you're going to accompany us back to the monastery. Prisoner? Don't you understand? All we understand is that you've played traitor ever since we reached La Jolla. That we caught you in conference with a werewolf and his fellow agents that you and they are planning in some way to destroy the civilization of the world in exactly five days. You, you heard that? Yes. What is it you're planning to use? The atomic bomb? Listen to me, Captain Friday. These next five days are important beyond words. We have terrible work ahead of us. If by us you mean you and the Maya Nahib and the werewolf, I think I understand. No, no, no. What work we, you and Dr. English, and Senor Skip and Judith and I have ahead of us? I don't know what you're talking about. You're no longer one of us. Stupid fool. Because the game I am playing is too deep for you. Are you going to hang back and let London and New York and San Francisco and Paris, the whole world, be crushed by the mad high priest Maya Nahib? Doctor, let's get back to the monastery with her. I think she's stalling here for a purpose. Stalling? Yes, stalling. That's what I said. Keep us waiting here on the stairway to the sun. Maybe the priests are warned. Let's get out of here before it's too late. Very well. Judith and Skip are waiting for us down on the lower level. You truly mean that I am your prisoner? Well, your hands are tied behind you. What would you say? Now, come along with us. If you will but listen. Now that we've discovered the secret passage leading to the enemy's stronghold, knowledge which you seem to have had all along... Secret passage? Yes, that's what I said. Captain Friday, you are under some delusion. This is not the secret passage indicated on Dr. English map. This... not the secret passage? What are you giving us? Oh, they certainly not. This passage has always been known to the priests of Maya Nahib. Is this the truth? And to the monks of the monastery? Do they know of it too? No. No, senor, they do not. I think you're lying. But I am not, Capitan Friday. The priests of Maya Nahib have entered and left the monastery at will. No. This is not a secret passage. I don't believe you. You're stalling again. Come on. But, Mr. Santos, what is this secret passage then? No one knows. I do not know. 
The monks of the monastery do not know. My Anna, he does not know. That is why he is so determined to get your map. Skip and Judith are just below. I caught him with my flash. See? There they are. Dr. English, are you going to allow me to be tied up and humiliated in this manner? I heard the werewolf give you secret orders from the high priest Mayanahi, Mrs. Santos. That can mean only one thing. But if I am not free to act... If you are not free to act, we may yet save the world. And what are you going to do with me? Lock you up in a stone chamber in the monastery. Hey, who is that? No, Skip. It's the doctor and me. Hey, what kept you? I thought you was never coming. Judas okay now. Hey, what took you so long? We caught one of Maya Nahib's agents. Father, who is it? Is it the werewolf? More deadly than the werewolf. Turn on your flash. Look. <gasps> oh, Mrs. Santos, you... It is I, Senorita English. You, and after all the trust we put in you. Come on, let's get out of this place. It's dangerous here. More dangerous than you know, Capitan Friday. Judith, are you able to walk now? Oh, yes, Father. Well, take these steps easily. Here, give me your hand. Yes. Oh, it, it was easier to climb the stairway to the sun than to descend. Oh, this awful dark. Look, look. What's the matter with you? Do you not see her? Did you not see the priestess Tula in the shadow ahead of us? Tula? I never saw her. The green-eyed girl who killed Robert. Here. Here's another chamber off the stairway. Maybe she hid in there. I'm going in. No. Not in there, Captain Friday. Why shouldn't I go in? Look, there's no door. Listen. Do you hear that? That steady drip. Drip. Drip of water. Yeah, I hear it. It ain't surprising to hear water dripping in an underground cavern. Ah, senor, but this is different. That is one of Maya Nahib's many torture chambers. They they kill men in there? You're just inventing excuses to keep us from going in. Trying to let Tula get away. I'm going in. Go in if you like, but do not ask me to go. I'm sorry, but you go wherever I go, Mrs. Santos. Please, do not ask. Muy bien, I will go. I refuse to ask mercy of you, Capitan Friday, while our relations are so strained. Come on. Lead the way. It was here, Capitan Friday, that Roberto Santos, my husband, was tortured before he was killed on the edge of the jungle. Oh, Mrs. Santos, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't see no instruments of torture in this room. No instrument of torture? Oh, what do you want? My flash lights the whole room. There's nothing here but a stone seat. A stone seat with water dripping on it. I understand, Captain. That is the instrument of torture. See, si, Capitan, they shaved my husband's head. They tied him to that stone so that he could not move and let the water drip on his head, drop at a time. Drip, drip, drip for hours and hours. Well, it, is that all? All. Oh, if you but knew. I know. It's the Oriental way of torture. It drives men mad after a little. Insane? They tie you to the seat and leave you here in the dark for hours. Those tiny drops of water grow and grow until it seems as though sledgehammers were beating out your brains. Each drop becomes a great explosion that makes your ears ring and flashes of fire appear before your eyes. And then... And oh, then... Don't, don't say any more. At first you pray for death. Then you beg for it. Finally, you are screaming for it at the top of your voice. When you have screamed one whole night, you are past saving. You are turned loose to wander in these maze of passageways until you have starved to death or else fallen down the stairway and broken yourself on the floor below. Oh, let's, let's go. Let's get away from here. Oh, Mrs. Santos. Are you now satisfied, Captain Friday? But why did they do this to your husband, Mrs. Santos? Because he discovered the secret passage that Dr. English Mapp tells of. And he preferred to die rather than give his secret to the Brotherhood. And was it in this other secret passage that Dr. Santos saw the storehouse full of the gold and jewels of the ancient Jakotas? It was. Yeah, this is enough. We're going back to the safety of the monastery. I am still your prisoner? That's right. We let the monks in the monastery take care of you. Oh, look, Skip. From this balcony, we get a full view of the entire valley below us. I, I didn't realize how high on the mountainside the monastery stood. Yeah, and sniff this fresh air. 
Man, ain't it pure and sweet after all them hours in that underground passage? Oh, boy. Oh, isn't it wonderful to be safe again and... and, uh... And what, Judith? And together, Skip. Hey, Judith. You mean you and me? Shh, here comes Father and Captain Friday. Oh. Well, Judith, I see you've recovered. Your eyes are bright, your cheeks... Yes, I'm making love to her again, Doctor. Oh, well, Captain, I'm needing a son now that Robert... But, Father, what about the monks? Have they changed their mind about Mrs. Santos? They're adamant. Refuse to be moved, despite everything we could tell them concerning Mrs. Santos. They declare that under no circumstances will they believe her an agent of Maya Nahib, and they refuse point blank to keep her a prisoner or allow us to. Oh, I'm glad. Glad? I can't help it, Captain. In spite of everything, Mrs. Santos has been so good to me, so gentle, so understanding. I won't believe her a traitor. But after catching her with a werewolf in the passageway... I don't care. I won't believe it. I won't. I confess I'm amazed at the attitude of the monks. They treat us as though we were children, pay no attention to our advice, but hang on each word Mrs. Santos utters as though she were, well, their high priestess. You know what one of their monks told me? Something for the good of your soul. He said that we were countenanced here in the monastery only as refugees from the wrath of the Brotherhood and not as their saviors. Yes, I was told the same thing. They look upon our visit here not in the light of a rescue party, but as a party of refugees. I was told that all they required of us was my map of the secret passage. Did you give it to them? Hardly. I'm beginning to suspect that this place is just another stronghold of Maya Nahib. Looks to me that we're being treated kindly for just one purpose. To obtain the map. Well, in that case, Doctor, we're in pretty deep. But, but didn't Mrs. Santos predict an attack on the monastery by the Brothers of the Living Dead... Now that the monks know of the passageway leading to the stairway to the sun? Yeah, she's warned the monks. They're taking precautions. What sort of precautions? I don't know. Hey, look, an airplane. Hmm? Oh, look, Father. Oh, it's beautiful. Gosh, it's all black. Look at us shine in the sun. What do you suppose it is, Doc? We're far off the Chilean mail routes. Besides, the plane's headed for the densest part of the jungle. One of Maya Nahib's messengers on his way to the sacred city of the sun. Oh, no. Remember... Maya Nahib has given the civilized world but five days to live. One of them has already passed. That plane symbolizes to me the beginning of the end. I say, Captain. Yes? Our only chance... Shh. Here comes Mrs. Santos. Ah, senorita. Are you feeling yourself again? Yes, Mrs. Santos. Thank you. There's another of those black planes. Mrs. Santos, what does it mean? The second this morning. Look, there is another. And another. They are coming from all directions. What do you suppose that means, Dr. English? It can mean but one thing. The forces of Maya Nahib are gathering in the sacred city for some desperate move. These planes come from every civilized center in the world. Moscow, London, Rome, New York, Paris. And Dr. English, there are only four more days until the Brotherhood strikes. Why do you say that to me? Why do you look accusingly at me, Mrs. Santos? Don't you know? I don't know what you're talking about. The map, Dr. English. The map to the secret passage. If we can but find the secret passage, then we have an unguarded entrance to the sacred city. Then we can strike at the heart of this dread menace. We can strike at Maya Nahib himself. Or else you can tip Maya Nahib off so that the passage will no longer be a danger. Listen, Dr. English. Supposing the priests of the Brotherhood should make a successful attack on the monastery, and you should be carried off or killed, then all hope of ever finding the passage would be gone. Give us the map, Doctor. Please, please do it. It is our only hope. It is what your son Robert intended to do. It was the reason I brought you down here. Everything depends on the map. Everything. If I could only believe... Father, I do believe in her. I do. I know she's right. What do you say, Captain? You know what I think. Skip, what's your opinion? What the boss says goes for me. Oh, Skip. You see, Mrs. Santos, you've broken faith with us so often. In heaven's name, look, look. The plane's falling. Where? Where? See? See right over the tallest peak. Yes, yes. Look how he bounces about in the air like a toy balloon. Oh. That was the strangest exhibition I ever saw. There must be some terrible wind currents up there. Do you see the way that plane was sucked earthward and then tossed high in the air, rolling over and over, like a leaf in the wind? That peak is called the Finger of God by the Chicota Indians. It is so tall that never a day passes by that there is not a terrific rainstorm about its peak. When the sun is shining in the monastery, I have seen torrents descending on that peak, and the lightning playing about it and snapping and cracking like a thousand machine guns. Finger of God. Mrs. Santos, Mrs. Santos, did, did you say a storm every day? Judith. Judith, what are you saying? Si, senorita. That is what I said. Why? Oh, nothing. 
Listen. The werewolf is in the monastery. The enemy's come for us. Captain Friday, Skip, Dr. English, and Judith came safely back to the La Jolla Monastery from the underground passage with Mrs. Santos. They brought her back a prisoner, but the gentle monks refused to hold her. And now the monastery has been invaded. The Brotherhood of the Living Dead have rushed through the secret passage and have taken over the last safe stronghold of Captain Friday and his friends. They've broken into the monastery. That's the werewolf. For God's sakes, now what? The window. The window just above our heads. The werewolf. Yes. You are covered from a window of the monastery. Do not move. Now come in off that balcony, one at a time. You first, senorita. Don't move, Judith. Do as he says, senorita. He means what he says. We cannot defy them here. But, but what are they going to do? I will not speak again. You first, senorita. Go. Go. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Santos. Now you, next. But how did you get in here? I thought the monks were on guard. <laughs> the agents of Maya Nahib always find means, Captain Friday. Dr. English, you come next. Don't go, Doctor. Don't go in there to be trussed up like a chicken. Let's stand and fight it out here. We're armed. The moment you reach for a weapon, you will be shot down. Captain Friday, do as you are told. This is not the time to strike. Nor yet. Not yet. <laughs> Thank you again, Mrs. Santos. Now you, Senor Skip. I'll stick by you both. Shall we fight it out? No, it's useless now, Skip. Better do as Judith and Dr. English have done. Give yourself up. Maybe they'll only lock us up for the present if we don't resist. Okay, let's go then, Captain. Well, here we are. What do we do now? <laughs> Tie their hands behind them. The monastery has a very serviceable dungeon, Captain. It will do very nicely for you three men. But my daughter. What of my daughter? <laughs> ah, your daughter, Dr. English. Your daughter. The high priest awaits the beautiful American girl impatiently. It's a good thing for you you tied my hands. Because if you don't kill me, I promise you I'll strangle you with my two hands if it's the last thing I ever do. <laughs> oh, you will die, senor. Do not make a mistake about that. Put them away. Lock them up. And what is to become of me, werewolf? Maya Nahib himself would attend to you. The high one has his own method attending to your kind of people. Take her into one of the cells and tie her up until our work in the monastery is finished. Un momento. What are you going to do with Senorita English? <laughs> is it for you to ask? Remember this, werewolf. There is a curse as ancient as the world itself, which is kept for the especial use of priests who come too near to young girls. Take her away. And I hear and now pronounce that curse upon you. Stop her! Stop her! Take her out of my sight! Our knowledge of mysticism is small, but it is potent, priest of the brotherhood. <sighs> the curse of a woman cannot touch a priest of the sacred city. Go away. Go away. Don't, don't come near me. <laughs> wow. So this is a dungeon. Black as the ace of spades. Hey! Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor. Didn't mean to step on you. Now, look here, Doctor. You've got to brace oh, up. But my daughter. My daughter. We'll get out of here. You see if we don't. Come on, let's start looking around. Well, that's useless, Skip. I examined this dungeon with my flash the other day when we were searching for the passage. It's about the tightest hole you could imagine. They've taken Judith to the sacred city. No, they haven't. At least not yet. They've got to pass right by here on their way to the stairway to the sun. Yeah, but I don't get all this. What's become of all the monks in the monastery? They seem to have vanished. Huh. Probably all agents of Maya Nahi. Well, they certainly didn't put up any scrap when the invasion began. I don't understand. Simple enough to me. Mrs. Santos lures us down here with a map, pretending the monastery was a place of safety. Actually, it's a stronghold of the Brotherhood. They've got us where they want us now, so they've thrown us all into here and thrown all pretense aside. I suppose we'll all be... Yeah? You suppose what, boss? Captain, why don't you answer me? Captain? Captain Friday? 
Hey, Doctor, something's happened to Camp Friday. We're locked in here. I don't care. He's gone. One moment he's seated here beside me in the dark, and the next minute he's gone. That's nonsense. He must be somewhere here in the cell. But he's not. He's not. Well, come along. Feel along the wall here. You go that way, and I'll go this. There. There. You see, he's not here. He's gone. He just vanished in thin air. Strange. Strange. If this is the mysticism of the ancient Jakotas... Hey, listen. Someone's coming down the corridor. The werewolf said he would come for us when he was ready. Shh, listen. Now listen, Doctor. When they open that door, let's rush them. It's our only chance. Take them by surprise and dash right through. It's desperate. I am desperate. Shh. Stopped outside our cell. Get ready to rush them. Skip. Doctor. It's me. Boss. Boss, how did you get out there? Keep your voice down. Have you out here in a jiffy? These old cells are easily open from the outside. There. Now come with me, quickly. Out of this place. Where to? Down the corridor. We'll hide in one of the cells until we can get our breath and plan something. They haven't taken Judith out of the monastery yet. And they'll do it over my dead body. Now, here. Here, this cell will do. We can talk in here. Now, leave the door open. No one could possibly see us in this black hole. You with us, Doctor? Yes, yes, but... Captain, how did you get out of the dungeon? I don't know. Don't know? No. All I can say is I was seated with my back against the dungeon wall alongside a skip. Suddenly the wall gave way and I was rolling down a short incline. The next thing I knew, a woman was leaning over me. A woman? You could tell in the dark? Her hair swept my face as she bent over to whisper in my ear, and I caught a whiff of an oriental perfume. A woman? Hey, was it Miss Santos? No. No, it wasn't Mrs. Santos' voice, and it wasn't Judith. You say she spoke to you? Yes. She said, your only safety lies in the River of Souls, the clue of which is in Dr. English's map. River of Souls? Yeah, that's what she said. And she arose and was gone. And you're certain it wasn't Mrs. Santos? No, Dr. English. It was not I. Who said that? I. Mrs. Santos said it. But where are you? In this room with you. I'm tied to the bed in this cell. Tied? Tied? Then that proves... Proves what, Dr. Proves English? that you are not one of the agents of Maya Nahim. If you believe that, then perhaps you will free me of my bonds. I'm against it. Still, you think I am full of lies, do you not, Capitan Friday? Perhaps you think I have been thrust up here just to quiet your suspicions. I assure you, it is not so. I'm a prisoner just as were you, until your so fortunate release. Do you know who released me? I think I know, and I pray I'm right. Look here, Captain. I'm going to release Mrs. Santos. Well, as you think best, but it's against my judgment. Nevertheless, I'm going to do it. Here, Skip. Will you help me? Ah, oh, Santa Maria, at last you are beginning to have faith. It isn't that, Mrs. Santos, but I'll not see even an enemy fall into the hands of my Yanahil. They're tortures, they're deviltry. Oh, Dr. English, but that is true. And as I'm showing you mercy now, I pray God you'll show me mercy by using your influence to save Judith, if you have any. Dr. English, you had better leave me tied. Why? What do you mean? I have no influence in the sacred city, none whatever. If you are freeing me with the idea of saving your daughter, then... I do not ask the impossible, Mrs. Santos. There, you're free. Go where you please. Do what you choose. Then for the present, I choose to remain here with you. Hey, listen. That's Judith. Skip, don't move. They are coming with your daughter. They are carrying her to Maya Nahi. They're on the way to the stairway to the sun. Well, they've got to come this way. And they'll never get by this door with her so long as there's a breath in my body. Is there nothing you can do, Mrs. Santos? Is there nothing you can do? What do you expect of me, Dr. English? I told you I had no influence. If we had our revolvers, we'd have some chance. But you turned the werewolf from us once. By a mere sign, you drove him and his pack flying in the cavern beneath the river. If you could do it once, you must be able to do it again. I beg of you. Hold it. They're coming around the corner. I can see those in the lead. They're carrying torches. Yeah. Yeah, there's Judith being carried between two huge Dakota Indians. Oh, you just let me get my hands on them. Just a moment, senor. There's Tula. There's Tula. She's leading with a torch above her head. Look. Look, she's laughing. She... Look, did you ever see anything so beautiful? So devilishly beautiful. Please, Mrs. Santos, please, please. You can stop them. You can. I know you can. Be still, Dr. English. If I save your daughter, Dr. English, then will you believe in me? Will you give me the map? Yes. I promise it. And will you have faith in me, Captain Friday? Will you try to help me or at least stop hindering me? I give you my word. If you can save Judith. And you, Senor Skip. Yes, anything you ask. Anything. Then keep quiet. I will go out alone and face them. If I do not come back, then this is the end. (laughs) 
Now Mrs. Santos will demonstrate once and for all whether she is friend or enemy. If she saves Judith, she regains the confidence of Captain Friday's party. If she does not, then there is no hope. Listen next week to Chapter 7 of The Land of the Living Dead, which is entitled The Terror of the Sacred City. You are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents The Land of the Living Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, Come with me. Judith English, daughter of the archaeologist Dr. Julian English, is in the hands of the werewolf and the other priests of the Brotherhood of the Living Dead. Led by Tula, enemy priestess, who carried a flaming torch above her head, the procession of enemy agents and Indians swept down the underground passage beneath the La Jolla Monastery toward the stairway to the sun. Judith was a captive in their midst, held by two gigantic Chicota Indians, their bronze skin shining in the light of the flares. And in a tiny cell, just ahead of the jubilant, victorious procession, were Captain Friday, Skip Turner, Dr. English, and Mrs. Santos. We had so far escaped the werewolf and his agents. We were on the point of leaping out and defying the whole procession in hopes of saving Judith, but Mrs. Santos urged us to wait. Alone, she stepped into the passageway, hoping to save Judith through the aid of a strange mysticism known only to those familiar with ancient ways and rites of the Chakotas. But as she stepped out, a door suddenly opened, where there had been only the smooth wall of the underground passage, and the procession swept in, and Mrs. Santos disappeared with them. And with them, too, went Judith. All this before our very eyes as we crouched appalled in the darkness of the little cell. We've let him get away. Quick, before the door swings shut. Yeah, too late. Did you see him? Two big Indians was carrying Judith. That Santa's woman has tricked us again. And I believed in her. She made me believe in her. She must be the devil incarnate. We're not finished yet, Doctor. How could I have trusted her to save Judith? Where's my judgment gone? I don't seem to have any reason of my own. It brands her once and for all as an agent of the living dead. But we can't stand here talking. We've got to do something. We've got to save Judith. All right, come on. How many flashlights have we among us? But they got mine when they put us in the dungeon. And mine? Well, I managed to save one. I'll lead the way. But we'll have to travel in darkness most of the way. They didn't even look for us in the dungeon. I wonder why. They're probably too anxious to get to the sacred city with Judith. I wish I knew who released you, Captain. Hey, you suppose we got a secret ally working for us? Maybe some woman hiding in the monastery? Yeah, I've been wondering about that myself. Keep close to me, Skip. Say, Doc, have you stopped to figure out our position? With the monastery in the hands of the Brotherhood, our retreat is cut off. Ahead lies the sacred city, running over with our enemies. We're completely surrounded. Unless... Unless what, Dr. English? Unless we can find the secret passage indicated on the map that Maya Naib is so anxious to get hold of. Hey, you mean the secret passage way into that room full of gold and jewels? Well, that's supposing Mrs. Santos didn't lie to us. Yeah, that's right. That is her story, ain't it? But you do believe in a secret passage, don't you? Yes, I think the doctor's map proves that. Hey, I just thought of something. Hmm? Do you suppose that secret door that the werewolf and his gang disappeared through leads to the passage Miss Santos was talking about? She called it the River of Souls. By Joe. Hey, that's right. Yeah. You remember, she said she thought the priest would carry Judith to the sacred city by way of the River of Souls. Come on, let's turn back and work on that door. Don't be a sap, Skip. That door's two feet of solid stone. We'd all have long beards before we could force that door. No, I'm in favor of pushing ahead, climbing the stairway and heading him off in the sacred city itself. Well, if you think that... Hold it. There's something just ahead. Quiet. Hey, what? Who tripped me up? Was that you, Skip? Me? Of course not. What happened? Uh, I went down like a ton of bricks. I broke my flashlight. Now we are in the dark. <laughs> but... Hey, who done that? Where'd that laugh come from? Don't move, anyone. It's one of the Chakota vampire bats. 
We're trapped, Captain. Trapped. But I ask you, Master, have I not done well? Have I not more than fulfilled your orders? The monastery has fallen to us. I have taken a traitor, and into your hand I can now deliver the widow of Roberto Santos. You are dirt under the feet of his highness, but enough of this. Kill the traitor. Keep Mrs. Santos safe until it is my knife's desire to interview her. Get back to your post. She insists that you see her immediately. Since when has a prisoner... It would be wise to see her. So? Why? Because... Bend your ear closer, Master. Because she has knowledge of the map of the secret passage. Oh! Then, of course, bring her to me. She is just outside the door. Master... This is Roberto Santos. Tell him to loosen my hands. Are they tied? You call yourself a master, and yet you allow me to be dragged before you, bound like a common thief. Release her. Now what do you want? That which I have sought without a moment's rest these past three years. That which you have sought? Pa, is that all you have to say to me? It is everything to me. But the map, the map of the secret passage... The map now in the possession of that imbecile, Dr. English. The map? This werewolf dog said you had information concerning the map. I know nothing of the map. She's lying. I heard Dr. English telling her. Silence. Mrs. Santos, you are lying. You deny me what I ask. Do you think I will tell you anything? Take her to the torture chamber. Shave her head. Tie her to the stone bench. Perhaps when tiny drops of water have beaten down upon a skull for a dozen hours in the darkness, you will talk. My husband died with his lips sealed, master. Take her away. Un momento. Tell me, what is in store for Senorita English? Senorita English? Where is she? Huh. You did not know that she too is prisoner of your fellow agent here? There seems to be a lack of cooperation. Is this true, dog? Have you taken the girl? Si. I have her. Why have you not said so? Tell me. Or by the gods of Maya Nahib, I will have you chained on the stairway to the sun. Since when has a master concerned himself with the fate of a woman? I found her. I captured her. <laughs> she is mine. Miserable fool, do you not know this girl? Do you not know that out of all the world of women, she has been selected by Maya Nahib to sit beside him upon the golden throne. No, no, it cannot be. Maya Nahib has selected this girl? It is so. This very day she shall enter the sacred city by the river of soul. I, I will not give her up. You have lived like a cur. Now you shall die like a cur. Oh, bring me a whip. Uh, no, no. It, it is not much to ask, Master, for all the service I have rendered. I ask for but one girl. It is not much. Hand me the whip. No, 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 no. I, I, I will tell. I will tell. Uh, do not whip my poor body. I, I, I will give her up. Where is she? Uh, in the chamber beneath the stairway to the sun, at the head of the passage to the sacred city. For this rebellion, Maya Nahib himself will name a suitable torture. Now go. Take the woman to the torture. Come. Down the stairway. Go ahead and beware a false step. There is a poison spear against your back. Do not make one false move, Mrs. Santos. Hmm. Misshapen dog, am I? A werewolf. <laughs> I shall have my revenge. The mad dog will turn on his masters. There is a way. There is a way. You may be revenged. <gasps> What, what are you saying? There is a way you may be revenged on your masters. Come, I will show you. But who are you? Who are you and what do you want with me? I am one of the masters from the sacred city of the living dead. I am your friend. But you've kidnapped me. Wait until the monks in the monastery discover that. Oh, the monks have been wiped out, Senorita English. The monastery is in the hands of the Brotherhood of the Living Dead. My father and his friends will hunt you down. Your father and his two friends were taken prisoner, the same as you. 
You saw them. They'll find a way. They won't let anything happen to me. Do not be foolish, child. And Mrs. Santos. Mrs. Santos will help me. Mrs. Santos is this moment in the torture chamber. She's in the hands of the werewolf. <gasps> the werewolf? Oh, no. But, Senorita English, you should not be unhappy. I have news for you. Splendid news. News? What news? What do you mean? Agents from all over the world have been seeking out for the high priest Maya Nahib a suitable empress. A woman worthy to sit upon the golden throne in the sacred city beside him. You have been chosen. What are you saying? It is true. Maya Nahib has looked upon you and finds you pleasing. You are to be empress of the world. No, but there, there must be some mistake. I, I never... I've never seen Maya Nahi, but never. But the high priest has seen you. There is no mistake. You're mad. Insane. You're a murderer. A murderer? All the brothers of the living dead are murderers. You kill, kill. You know nothing else. In three days, you plan to murder the civilization of the world. You're all mad, mad. Mad? Who knows? And who can be certain that, after all, madness may not be superior intelligence? Please. Please let me go. What are you going to do with me? You must be calm, senorita. Hysteria is not for an empress. What are you doing? Don't, don't look at me like that. Don't. Don't. Come now, senorita English. One would think I had come to do you a harm. Instead, I bring you the greatest honor that may befall a woman. I don't want to be an empress. I, I just want to be a girl. You make it very difficult. However, I cannot leave you until you understand certain matters in connection with your marriage with Maya Nahi. No. Your preparation for becoming bride of the sun is going to be very tedious business, I fear. What preparations? Mentally, you are not prepared to enter the sacred city. All this will have to be corrected, changed. I won't change. I don't want to go to your sacred city. I'll kill myself before I marry Maya Nahib. All this has been anticipated. Maya Nahib himself foresaw the impossibility of your ever becoming reconciled to his way of life until, until certain changes have been made in your person. 